Starting in 2018, the United States adopted a new military doctrine announcing that major power confrontation with China would be its dominant focus. Today, we examine China's foreign policy and its evolution since the 1949 revolution brought the Communist Party of China to power. On October 1st, 1949, we listened to the radio. We heard the ceremony of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Chairman Mao proclaimed that the Chinese people had stood up. All of us were overjoyed. We jumped around. We were really proud and happy. Welcome to The Real Story on The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. We're joined by Dr. Ken Hammond. Dr. Hammond is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University. He is a founding director of the Confucius Institute at the New Mexico State University. He is also an organizer and activist with the peace organization, Pivot to Peace. Ken Hammond, welcome back. Glad to be here, Brian. Ken, in our conversation with you a couple of weeks ago, we talked about what to expect with the new Biden administration. Obviously, since 2018, the U.S. military policy has been reoriented. Its foreign policy reoriented the so-called Asia pivot that President Obama announced in Australia 10 years ago. 2011 has manifested itself, evolved or shown itself to be basically a policy of confrontation. An Asia pivot might have meant many different things, but apparently what it means is preparing for World War III with China. And we talked about what U.S. foreign policy is all about regarding China, what drives it. We talked a little bit about how the Chinese are viewing U.S. foreign policy. Today, though, we want to talk about China's foreign policy. And China's foreign policy, meaning the policy of the People's Republic of China since the Communist Party of China took power after a 27-year-long civil war. They took power in September, October 1949. Of course, October 1st, 1949 is the official day. Uh, that's when Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Communist Party, stood before a massive throng of people at Tiananmen Square and announced the Chinese people have stood up. China has stood up. And that began the start of the socialist project in China. Now, that was 1949. If you look at the various stages of China's foreign policy, we can trace it or identify it or label it by sort of looking at decades or stages. There is the period 1949 to 1959. That was the time in which China was a close ally of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union. That was the period of the Sino-Soviet alliance. Then the next phase in China's foreign policy is determined in large measure by the split between the political division between the Soviet Union and China. That would be, say, the period between 1959 and the visit to China by Richard Nixon after Henry Kissinger, who was his national security advisor, had gone there for secret negotiations the year before in 1971. Then there's the period of the 1970s, culminating in the formal normalization of relations between the United States and China, 1972, and culminating in the normalization announcement in 1979. And then there's the several decades afterwards. We're going to march through this history and examine the different stages of China's foreign policy and understand why it changed, what caused it to change, what was China thinking during these different stages, what were its priorities, what were its main challenges. Again, we are socialists. This is the socialist program. We want to come at history and historical developments 
with a partisan point of view. That's what we do. Uh, we are socialists. We are also very sympathetic to the Chinese revolution and all of its strides. But we also want to examine this history with an objective faculty. In other words, to look at history not through a purely ideological lens, certainly not with rose-colored glasses on, but to be able to really understand what was driving not only China, but driving the United States. What were the considerations of the Soviet Union, the other major players in the world? And we have to have a well-rounded whole view of the world situation in order to understand what was making China do what China was doing, what led to its thinking in its different stages. And we want, because you are a scholar, you are an expert on Chinese history, we want to be able to continue this discussion with you and we look forward to it. But let's just start at the beginning. And of course, the beginning isn't really the beginning, but let's start with the victory of the Chinese revolution. Mao and the Communist Party take power. Their main enemy, the nationalists, the Kuomintang, led by Chiang Kai-shek, have fled. They're defeated. They take the island of Taiwan. Part of the agenda of the Chinese is to get that island back under full control. At that time, Mao Zedong goes to Moscow and meets with Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, and China and the Soviet Union forge an alliance. And that has the impact on shaking up the world in a way that was sort of unforeseeable 10 years earlier, certainly, and certainly led to what we now know in popular vernacular as the Cold War. But let's just talk about the significance of China's revolution and then the reorientation of its foreign policy directly and towards the Soviet Union. Sure. It's interesting. The trip to Moscow that Mao Zedong makes in winter of 1949 to 50 is the only time he ever traveled outside of China. So signaling certainly just how important and how fundamental the alliance with the Soviet Union was going to be. The Treaty of Friendship that's signed between the Soviet Union and the New People's Republic of China is the foundation, creates the foundation that allows China to begin its policies, pursue its policies of building socialism through the decade of the 1950s. The Soviets, under the terms of the Treaty of Friendship, extended significant assistance to China. They granted China loans, made some outright grants. They provided equipment and technical assistance including lots of Soviet advisors who came and lived in China and worked alongside Chinese comrades in getting industrialization going in a lot of infrastructure projects, in establishing scientific and technological research institutes. It was a period of very serious and very real and substantial cooperation between the Soviets and the Chinese. It was not a period that was completely free of tensions or of differing perspectives. And indeed, a lot of political developments that follow within China in the later years of this period and on in the following decade or two stem from some deep disagreements, different perspectives on how China should be pursuing its process of economic development. But nonetheless, for that first decade from 49 to 59, uh, the alliance with the Soviet Union was critical for establishing the foundations of socialism and socialist development in China. There are conversations that take place between Stalin and Mao Zedong. And one of the things that's noteworthy, and some of these conversations are now available to the public, the USC, US China Institute has a vast archive. I'm sure you've been there, USC University of Southern California. And, you know, one of the conversations takes place and it's December 16th, 1949. So the revolution happens. Mao is the leader of the new China. He speaks to the people October 1st, 1949. And for the first and only time, he leaves China and he goes to Moscow. And he's there for quite a while. He's there. I mean, how long do you remember? He's there about six months. I mean, that's a long time. I mean, you've just had a revolution and you're there. So you might think, well, conversation between Stalin and Mao must have been complicated, no? <laughs> I'm um, sure it was. They didn't actually meet face to face very often. They did a few on a few occasions. But basically, Mao was there to 
preside over and guide the negotiating team, the Chinese diplomatic team that was there to work out really the nuts and bolts of how these programs of assistance and cooperation would function. The treaty wasn't just a sort of general statement of principles, that would have been easy enough, but they really wanted to have a very concrete document that would structure the relationship and ensure, you know, that it was on the one hand, an expression of a fraternal relationship, but also one which was going to be beneficial to both parties. I mean, the Soviet Union was extending assistance to China as an act of solidarity, but also was, you know, deeply involved at that time in rebuilding its own economy and recuperating from the devastations of the Second World War, the great anti-fascist war. They were interested in a relationship which would be mutually beneficial. So it's not just Mao, it's a whole team who's there. And they're talking about the nuts and bolts of how Soviet aid can benefit China They're also talking about complicated issues relating to disputed territories, Port Arthur, of course, at the treaties and the agreements between the Soviet Union and their wartime allies, the U.S. and Britain, about how to deal with the post-war issues related to disputed territories, especially territories that have been taken by Japan and belonged previously to Russia. I mean, those were part of the discussions too, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a, it's a whole effort to kind of restructure geopolitical relations across Eurasia. Uh, You know, the, the treaty is a treaty between the Soviet Union and China, but the fraternal governments in Eastern Europe were also, you know, drawn into this relationship as well. And economic and technical assistance came into China, not just from the Soviet Union, but from East Germany, from Poland, Hungary, other East Bloc countries as well. So the concept really was, at least in part, to build a socialist bloc, which would involve cooperation between a number of different states with the relationship between the Soviet Union and China as kind of the core structure of that. That's so important to keep in mind, especially for people who are just learning about some of these issues. Before World War II, the Soviet Union was the only socialist country. It was invaded by Nazi Germany. The Soviets had to fight 80% of the German military, the Nazi military. They defeated the Nazi military. They were the ones that were responsible really for the liberation of Eastern and Central Europe and really for breaking the back of Nazism. The Soviets had that alliance with Britain and the United States and a relationship between countries that had antagonistic social systems. I mean, up until that point, the U.S. had always hoped for the overthrow of the Soviet Union. Well, it never stopped hoping for it, (laughs) but they were actively working towards it. And same with Britain. And Winston Churchill, the prime minister of Britain, like a fierce anti-Soviet, anti-communist hawk inside the British establishment, suddenly they were partners because they had a common foe, German imperialism, Nazism, And of course, later, the Soviets also declared war on Japan towards the end of the war in August 1945. But as the war comes to an end, revolutions start to break out. A revolution in Vietnam, a revolution in Korea. Korea and Vietnam are both divided between North and South sectors, partly as arrangements between the victorious allies, Britain and the United States on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other. And then the Chinese Revolution in 1949 becomes victorious, and now you have a huge part of the world living in socialist countries. So as you mentioned, there's now a socialist bloc. Before that, the Soviet Union was isolated, became a point of controversy and debate within the Soviet Communist Party of whether that was the natural way of things. Socialism in one country as a concept or a theory became a debate between Stalin and Trotsky and others. Those were ideological political debates. Well, however one views those debates, by 1949, it's no longer socialism in one country because now there's going to be socialism in not just another country or a few other countries, but the biggest country in the world, China. And thus, the relationship of forces between socialism 
and capitalism or imperialism go through this decisive alteration and suddenly socialism isn't simply an idea or a movement it has state power in a big part of the world yeah, I think that's the context in which we see the Cold War really take shape, that suddenly the prospect of revolution, not just in Eastern Europe, not just in China, Korea, Vietnam, but the idea that there might be a real global surge of revolutionary upheavals, that comes to be the single focus for American foreign policymakers, for American elite politicians, in those years immediately after the Second World War. The divisions in Europe, especially the division of Germany, the division of the city of Berlin, sets up these direct sort of face-to-face -face confrontations between the erstwhile allies, who now once again, having sort of cleared fascism from the political stage, now they find themselves once again in confrontation, in direct confrontation. And under President Truman, the ideas of the Cold War, the doctrines of the Cold War become the primary shaping factor in American policy calculations. And you can see that so clearly, so very clearly in the difference between the way that American foreign policy operates towards the nationalist independence movement in the Dutch East Indies and the independence movement under the leadership of the socialist movement in Indochina. The Americans put pressure on the Dutch to allow Indonesia to become an independent country, which it did in January of 1949, just a few years after the end of the war. Whereas in Indochina, as we know all too well, the Americans first supported the French in fighting against the Viet Minh, and then when the French had had enough and decided to step away, the Americans stepped in to replace them as a neo-colonial power and fought the war on there for another 20 years after that. And the sole basis of that distinction was that American policymakers looked at Sukarno and Hatta in Indonesia and said, well, these guys are just nationalists. That's okay. But in Vietnam, in Indochina, they looked and they saw Ho Chi Minh and they said, oh, this guy's a communist. So that's got to be bad, and we have to stop that at all costs. So the Cold War really became the determining factor in American foreign policy in ways that, you know, obviously were designed to try to promote and preserve American dominance and hegemony, but which didn't necessarily relate to the actual needs and aspirations of people in various countries around the world. When you think about it, Ken, if you roll the video forward by... 25 years and the split starts to happen between the Soviet Union and China or really splits apart and the United States forges a de facto alliance with China, it makes you kind of go back and think about what the other variant possibilities would have been for U.S. imperialism and for the imperialists generally if they had not had such an ideologically restricted view of this global class war that then becomes known as the Cold War. And by that, I mean, there were people in the U.S. State Department who had connections to Mao Zedong, who had connections to the Chinese Revolution, people like Owen Lattimore, for instance, who said, look, yes, the Chinese communists are communists and the Soviets are communists, but they're Chinese and they can be looked at distinctively and differently. And in fact, we could forge an independent relationship with them because the main goal of the Chinese communists is to develop China, to become unified, to become free, to become equal. And just as there were advocates in the U.S. establishment, the imperialist establishment, who thought it was a mistake to treat Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam as just an erstwhile enemy because he too was a communist. And you know, they made the argument that, wait, we don't have to think of all of the communist-led governments in the same way. We can break them apart, actually. We can have friendly relations with some while targeting sort of the main problem, which was the Soviet Union, because it was the biggest, the largest, the most resourced of the socialist bloc countries in the first one. And those people were driven out of the State Department. Owen Lattimore and, and the others, they were accused of having lost China, of having been soft on communism and the Cold War mentality just drove them out. So the U.S. imperialist establishment developed a singular 
approach towards containment of communism and the overthrow of communism. And that also translated into the war against socialism and communism here in the United States, where this kind of ferocious, united anti-communism destroyed what was up until then a robust left inside the United States. It was the dominant ideological strain, and it sort of put outside the acceptable level of conversation any other tactical or political approach by imperialism to deal with the threat of rising communism. Absolutely. I think that the ideological blinders that American policymakers wore in those days, not that they've completely abandoned those ever, but certainly at the height of that, the McCarthy period in the early 1950s, that was the domestic expression of this worldview. And of course, on one level, they were absolutely right in understanding that there's a fundamental contradiction between the socialist perspective, the socialist model of economic development based on serving the interests of working people and the capitalist system that is based on extracting value from the labor of the masses. You know, there is a fundamental contradiction there. So on one level, they weren't wrong about that. But in terms of the sort of practical political relationships between states, the idea of an international order, a system of international law, a system of respect for the sovereignty and integrity of nation states and all that, the conduct of American foreign policy was totally subordinated to these ideological and political economic objectives of American imperialism. Yeah, and if anybody went against the grain even if they were pro-capitalist, even if they were advisors for imperialism, but they went against the grain, they were brought down. I mean, similarly, you know, what we see today, and I don't want to jump ahead, but to this kind of groupthink consensus position where China must be viewed now as the absolute enemy that America has to get ready for World War III, that major power confrontation and conflict are the order of the day. This is all part of that groupthink. But Anyway, think about that as we do this march through history. I want to go back, though, to the initial conversation between Mao Zedong and Stalin, or conversations. And again, I mentioned the University of Southern California, the U.S.-China Institute has archives and many of these documents that weren't available to us way back when, but are now. Here's a conversation, December 16th, 1949, Mao. He says to Stalin, the most important question at the present time is the question of establishing peace. China needs a period of three to five years of peace, which would be used to bring the economy back to pre-war levels and to stabilize the country in general. Decisions on the most important questions in China hinge on the prospects for a peaceful future. With this in mind, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China entrusted me to ascertain from you, Comrade Stalin, in what way and for how long will international peace be preserved? To which Comrade Stalin responds, quote, in China, a war for peace, as it were, is taking place. The question of peace greatly preoccupies the Soviet Union as well, Although we already have had peace for the past four years, again, this is 1949, World War II ended in 1945. With regards to China, there is no immediate threat at the present time. Japan is yet to stand up on its feet and is thus not ready for war. America, though it screams war, is actually afraid of war more than anything. Europe is afraid of war. In essence, there is no one to fight with China, not unless Kim Il-sung decides to invade China. Now, that's Stalin making a joke, of course. Kim Il-sung was the leader of North Korea, who was an ally of China. Again, it's interesting, Ken, and the reason I thought it was significant is this was December 16th, 1949. Six months later, China is at war, and it's at war in Korea not because Kim Il-sung has invaded China, but because the division of Korea, just like the division of Vietnam as part of these post-World War II arrangements, was essentially untenable. The United States had kept 
the Japanese colonial apparatus in place after the surrender of Japan in August 1945, the unconditional surrender to the United States following the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the Americans told the Japanese, don't leave Korea. Don't leave Korea till we get there because they didn't want Korea to be free from an imperialist force for any amount of time because they were fearful that the revolutions that were taking place in Korea, like the ones in Vietnam, like the ones in China, would actually fill the vacuum and take the power. So the Japanese military defeated, stays in place as the colonial overlord of Korea until MacArthur arrives in September 1945, and then the Korean peninsula is divided. There's a Soviet sphere of influence, an American sphere of influence, and there's an agreement between the two that both countries will have their armies, their militaries, leave all of Korea by 1948. And in fact, both sides do leave Korea by 1948. So the big power impact or imposition on the Korean peninsula is removed in 48. And immediately the social conflict over what Korea will be going forward. Will it be a vassal state led by U.S. imperialism using those who would function as Japanese puppets? They were the rulers of South Korea. Or would it be the communists led by Kim Il-sung and the Korean Workers Party who represented the workers and peasants of Korea? So it was a social struggle that led in June 1952, the outbreak of what we now call the Korean War. And within days, the United States organized 26 countries through the United Nations. They invaded Korea. They meant to destroy North Korea. And on the other side of that battle was the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, led by Kim Il-sung. But they had the support of China. They had the support of the Soviet Union. So you could see that the next major war after World War II had now become, in a way, a war between socialism and capitalism. So the Cold War suddenly became very hot. Millions of Koreans died. And it set the stage for the whole next chapter in global politics. And it also began what we now know in the United States as the military-industrial complex, because up until then, after World War II, the U.S. military demobilized, as it had done after earlier wars, but now there was no demobilization. Now this fight against communism becomes the pretext for the creation of a permanent military machine, and that enters into all of the calculations for China, for the Soviet Union, for Vietnam, for Korea, for any country that wanted to be independent and free. So it's just a remarkable, when you think about this history and what Mao told Stalin he wanted in 1949, just three to five years of peace, and Stalin says, nobody's ready for war, but the social conflict in Korea unresolved, the class war in Korea bursts out and all the major players in the world have to take sides. Really a phenomenal moment in world history. Well, you know, Mao's emphasis on the need for peace was really at the heart of Chinese political calculations at this point. Even after the conflict on the Korean Peninsula had broken out in the summer of 1950, China sent diplomatic signals via their embassy in India, via the embassy in New Delhi, to the Americans saying, please don't intervene. Please don't get involved in this. You know, let's let the situation on the peninsula resolve itself because we don't want to be drawn into a conflict. What we need is, you know, peace and stability to go about our business. Obviously, the United States didn't uh, respond to that. And in the end, by November of 1950, China sent the Chinese People's Volunteers, 600,000 troops into Korea to help to defend the Korean people from the American forces. And that, of course, led to the 
stabilization of the peninsula being divided the way it has remained ever since then. But, you know, the idea that somehow the Chinese were behind the outbreak of the Korean War is absolutely not in keeping with what China's real interests and stated positions were at the time. They didn't want intervention. They didn't want to go to war. What they wanted and needed, as Chairman Mao had said to Stalin, was for a period of peace and stability so that they could undertake the tasks of trying to recover their economy and you know, start the process of building socialism. And that's what the Soviets wanted. I mean, you could see, even though Stalin was maybe in that private conversation a bit cavalier about the global situation, the Soviets weren't, in fact, cavalier about the designs of American imperialism. I mean, the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed the Soviets that the U.S. had a weapon that they did not possess, that the U.S. had a monopoly on nuclear weapons. And the entire ferocious anti-communist consensus within the establishment, the imperialist establishment inside the U.S. military, too, was that war with the Soviet Union was more or less inevitable. I mean, we know this from Daniel Ellsberg's book during the time that he was in the Rand Corporation and was part of the nuclear war establishment. They were preparing for nuclear war. And the Soviets were trying to do everything in their power to not poke the bear in a way. In other words, to have peace. In fact, if Stalin had his druthers right after World War II, he would have wanted exactly what Mao wanted in 1949, was a long period where there was no war because 27 million Soviet citizens had died. The Soviet Union became a global power but the suffering of the Soviet people and the dislocation and the harm done to the Soviet economy was almost unimaginable. And yet conflict was coming. I mean, again, these are Soviet or Stalin's calculations in the context of looking for peace. I mean, right after the end of World War II in 1945, when there was dual power inside of China, there was Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist armies, and they were the formally recognized government of China. But then there was tens of millions of people in the countryside fighting with Mao and fighting for the revolution under the leadership of the Communist Party. The Soviets had a very moderate position. They said, don't try to seize power. You should have negotiations. There should be a coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek. And Stalin and the Soviet Union actually recognized Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang as the legitimate representative of the Chinese people. Again, that's not an adventurous policy. That's a very moderate policy. I'm wondering how the Chinese, meaning how would Mao and Zhou Enlai and the other leaders of the communist movement, how did they interpret the Soviet policy during those first years when, again, peace was the priority for the Soviet Union and Stalin feared that any revolution anywhere you know, the Soviets would be held responsible if the communists took power somewhere else. Well, I think that when we think about this decade in the 1950s, the real close period of the Sino-Soviet alliance, we have to understand that right from the start, it was a complicated relationship. There were terrific benefits that flowed to China from this alliance, and certainly the goal of peace, of having some time for stability and recovery and social construction, that perspective was shared on both sides. But right from the start, there were some divergences in the relationship as well. In part, as you just mentioned, Stalin and Soviet policy had been moderate, to say the least, in terms of the political situation within China and support for Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists had persisted all the way down into 1948. Uh, of course, the Soviet Union immediately recognizes the revolutionary government as soon as it comes into control and as soon as the PRC is being established. But but there were differences of perspective, differences of opinion, and the Chinese leadership, not just Chairman Mao, but I think quite broadly amongst the Chinese leadership, there was a concern that they didn't want to simply be kind of the junior partner. They didn't want to be assumed you know, to be a subordinate component 
of a socialist bloc, which was really just going to be an extension of sort of Soviet foreign policy interests. The Chinese get involved very early in the 1950s in what emerges as the non-aligned movement. They take part in the great Bandung conference down in Indonesia in 1955, where they position themselves as part of the sort of newly emerging post-colonial states in Africa and Latin America, or at least the Caribbean and India and places like that, to try to chart a path that goes aside from, sort of leaves aside this great power confrontation of the Cold War. Certainly, the Chinese saw themselves as closely allied and fraternal with the Soviet Union, but they didn't want to just be subordinate, sort of be subsumed under this rivalry between the Soviets and the United States. And that kind of activity, I think, was really critical for them in establishing their position their foreign policy orientation in general. Zhou Enlai, who served both as prime minister and foreign minister, articulated fundamental principles for China that centered around the idea of respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of states, non-intervention in the internal affairs of other states. Obviously, they wanted those policies to be applied to China. They wanted other states to respect China's sovereignty, its territorial integrity, its right to self determination, its ability to choose its own path, its own government. But they were clear that they would in turn respect that in other countries. Obviously, that was a refutation of American interventionism, of imperialist efforts to continue to control other countries, either overtly through colonialism or through less overt neo-colonialist mechanisms. But those principles were established by the Chinese right from the start. And I think their effort to work with the non-aligned movement meant that they wanted to be taken seriously and respected in their own right, as well as being a component, a part of the larger socialist bloc. That would seem to be fundamental and fundamentally important for us, people who want to understand the evolution of China's foreign policy, that the Communist Party of China, Mao, and those who came after him, they're communists. They believe in communist ideas. They're Marxists. At the same time, they're leaders of a state, and the state lives among, as Lenin put it, a system of states. And so one cannot simply look at the world as a forum for revolution. You have to have diplomatic relationships, even with governments that are your enemies in many ways, or governments that persecute communists in their own country. When you think about the Bandung Conference, Of course, some of those independent bourgeois nationalist and anti-imperialist governments say, uh, I'm thinking of Nasser in particular in Egypt, who helped reshape the Middle East and the Arab world and pan-Arabism. At the same time, they were jailing the Communist Party of Egypt. Similarly, this happened even well before the time period we're talking about, even say back in 1920, when the Soviet Union, then really led by Lenin, forged an alliance with the government of Turkey, which had a contradiction with British imperialism, as did the newly formed socialist government in the Soviet Union. But the Turkish government was executing the Communist Party founders of Turkey. And yet the Soviet-led, the communist-led government of the Soviet Union chose to maintain and even deepen the relationship between the Soviet Union and bourgeois-led Turkey because they had a common foe, British imperialism. These kind of arrangements, well, you can't really avoid them when you're living within a system of states. And then there's the third element that you're referring us to, which is how the Chinese view themselves having overcome a century of humiliation by Western powers, foreign powers. If a sister socialist country that's strong acts in a way that appears to be insensitive or chauvinistic, They're not going to say, oh, that's fine. You're communist, so we don't mind. The sensitivities or sensibilities of a people who have suffered so much national oppression has to be also very much a part of political calculations. Absolutely. I think that for the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China in the 1950s and going on from there, their mission Their goal that they were very clear on and very upfront about was to build a better future for the Chinese people. 
Chairman Mao and other Chinese leaders talked all the time about what they called building a new China. The emphasis was on you know, a new age, a new era in Chinese history where the needs of the people, the needs of the working people, whether in the agricultural sector or in the building of a modern industrial economy, were going to be taken as the foundation, were going to be taken as the basis of what the state was all about, and that that process would be guided by the leadership of the party. And that's not the same as sort of nationalist expansionism or something like that, but it's a desire to fulfill the needs and interests of the Chinese people. And so when we look at the course of development in the 1950s, this is where the tensions with the Soviet Union really, really come to a head. They emerge around these issues of how should China go about the process of developing its economy? How should China go about the course of building socialism? And Chairman Mao and others within China, while certainly respecting the achievements of the Soviet Union and the advances that had been made there, felt that they wanted to pursue a developmental path, which was distinct from that of the Soviets, and pursued, for example, the policies of agricultural collectivization in ways that worked very, very differently from the experience of the Soviet Union. They had different ideas about the organization of industrial management in the new factories that were being built, the role of workers in management, as opposed to a sort of expert level management from above kind of model that seemed more characteristic of the Soviet experience. Mao and others you know, developed uh, extensive critiques of Soviet economics, of sort of the political economy of the Soviet Union, not in an anti-communist way way, not in a way that was opposed to the Soviet Union, but trying to learn lessons from their experience, which would make the process of socialist construction in China more effective, more efficient, more beneficial, without some of the contradictions and drawbacks that had occurred. But the Soviet leadership took a view of some of the policies, some of the practices that were emerging in China. They understood that they were diverging from Soviet practice, and they saw that as moving in the wrong direction. They tended to see some of the efforts at mass mobilization, at efforts like the development of the people's communes in the late 1950s, as adventurism, as trying to go too fast, as trying to do too much too quickly. And that difference of opinion led to the rupture between the two parties and the two states that comes out into the open, really, in 1959, and then deepens and broadens through the polemical exchanges of the early 1960s. You know, and again, the relationship that China has, the posture that China has towards the wider world is shaped both by the development of their socialist revolution and their engagement in their perspective on the prospects for socialism in the world, but also through a desire to preserve and protect their own sovereignty and territorial integrity and the system that they wanted to develop in what they saw as the best path forward for the Chinese people. Can the relationship between China and the Soviet Union filled with support and solidarity and also contradictions, as you mentioned, and vital to China, vital to China because China was also not only in a confrontation with U.S. imperialism at that time, the United States refused to acknowledge China at the United Nations. It gave China seat to the rump government of Chiang Kai-shek, even though it was in Taiwan and not in China. It was Chiang Kai-shek that was at the Security Council at the United Nations. And there was constant hostility. In the U.S. media, when we were kids, everybody learned to hate Red China, Red China, Red China. It wasn't the People's Republic of China. It was Red China. And Red China was sort of caricatured in a way that made it look like China was on the march. They're crazy. They're going to war, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have a situation where the Chinese obviously have to have this relationship with the Soviet Union. And they're getting lots of economic and scientific and technological help. They're getting help in terms of developing weapons, including nuclear weapons. But I want to go over a couple things before we wrap up this segment of our sort of review of China's foreign policy. One is that in 1953, Stalin dies. And Stalin is not only really the leader of the Soviet Union, which he clearly is, 
But he's the paramount figure in the world communist movement at that time. Until that time, all the communist parties that were in alliance with the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc, they basically supported the personality of Stalin, the writings of Stalin. They considered Stalin to be the center of the movement. The Soviet Union was the center of the world movement, but Stalin was at the center of the Soviet Union. And so when he dies, it's a very big event. He had been the leader of the Soviet Union for a long time. And in 1956, at the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, in secret, the new government and the new party leadership in the Soviet Union says that Stalin was, in fact, guilty of many, many crimes, violations of socialist democracy, you name it, a Khrushchev secret speech. And there begins what's called de-Stalinization, the process of de-Stalinization. It had profound international impact, not simply on people inside the Soviet Union and politics inside the Soviet Union. I mean, you can just imagine the emotional and psychological impact. You're told for two decades that Stalin is the greatest leader since Lenin, and suddenly the same leaders who were telling you this are now telling you that Stalin was guilty of many criminal acts. It had a destabilizing impact on politics within the socialist movement. And also in the case of Hungary and Poland and Eastern Europe, where governments have become socialist really as a consequence of the post-World War II arrangement where the Soviet Red Army was in those countries. And as a consequence of, and this is a complex story of the confrontation between the United States and Britain on one side and the Soviet Union on the other. Anyway, the de-Stalinization of the Soviet party led to actually counter-revolutionary uprisings in some of these countries, in Poland and Hungary, it gave a great sort of wind in the cells for those who were anti-communist, not to mention the divisions that happened inside those communist parties. Inside this communist party of the United States, a huge part of its membership quit the party. This was right after 1956 and 1957. So Stalin's death and the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Communist Party at the 20th Congress, it, it's an international event. Now, Eventually, when the Sino-Soviet split comes into full bloom, and we'll talk about that later, when we can see the impact of this division between the two great socialist countries, how the Chinese revisit the issue of Stalin and de-Stalinization becomes part of what then turns into an ideological political struggle. But at the time of the 20th Congress and right after the 20th Congress, the Chinese Communist Party was essentially sympathetic to Khrushchev, the leader of the de-Stalinization campaign. Again, this changes a couple of years later when the Soviets and the Chinese break apart, their political alliance breaks into its opposite. But during that time and right afterwards in 1957, the Chinese party issued a pamphlet, and I'm going to read to you from it. It says, since the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union the Soviet people, under the correct leadership of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, headed by Comrade Khrushchev, have achieved a series of great successes in building communism. And then it goes on, the fulfillment of this plan will lay down, the five-year plan, lay down a firm material and spiritual foundation for the transition to communism in the Soviet Union and enrich the treasury of Marxism-Leninism with valuable experience gained in building communism. So at first, the Chinese party welcomes the 20th Congress. And during that same time period, in 1957, a Chinese, I think it's Peking Review, it may be a pamphlet comes out, and the Chinese write, as we have already said, Stalin displayed a certain great nation chauvinist tendency in relation to brother parties and countries the essence of such tendencies lies in being unmindful of the independent and equal status of the communist parties of various lands and that of socialist countries. Now, that's very moderated language, Ken, but clearly, at least at this stage, and sort of acknowledging what you're saying, that the Chinese communists have a perception that they've been treated rudely and badly, at least in some of their still very comradely dealings with the Soviet Communist Party, 
at first they're optimistic about Khrushchev. And the reason I want to bring this out is that later within the communist and socialist movement, there is the assumption that the break between the Chinese Communist Party and the Soviet Communist Party came about as a consequence of the de-Stalinization at the 20th Congress, and that the Chinese were pro-Stalin and Khrushchev and the later leaders of the Soviet Union were anti-Stalin. But in fact, the relationship really only becomes brittly bad or very, very bad, not right after the 20th Congress and not right after de-Stalinization, but when Khrushchev goes and meets with Eisenhower and opens up through this symmetry between the U.S. and Soviet leaders, agreements that the Chinese view to be harmful to China's ability to stand up to imperialist pressure. And the Soviets are meeting with Eisenhower and trying to find a way to end Cold War tensions and come to agreements and begin arms deals and you know the elimination of nuclear tests and other parts of a anti-Cold War or a rapprochement or detente strategy. But China, which is still targeted by American imperialism in such a fierce way, has just fought a war in Korea, views these acts by the Khrushchev leadership to be a betrayal of a sister socialist country and another example of great nation chauvinism of the kind that they sort of moderately attribute to Stalin. But now it becomes a fierce part of the polemical ideological struggle between the two parties, which even then in 1959 is still a comradely struggle. It's not a struggle between states. They're saying, comrade, you should do this. They're not calling each other fascists or imperialists or you know that kind of language. But again, the political struggle breaks out into the open and Khrushchev in retaliation withdraws all the economic advisors and technicians and scientists who have been indispensable for China's economic reconstruction in the 1950s. He retaliates against the Chinese Communist Party because they're upset that he's putting the relationship with American imperialism and the desire to end the Cold War first and foremost and before the comradely relationship with the Chinese. Anyway, that's how I view it. I wondered what your thoughts are. Well, I think that that's exactly right. I think that the rupture between the Soviets and China in 1959, it's the coming together of two zones of concern, two areas of concern that evolve in the course of the 1950s, that what you've just been talking about is one of those, which is the posture of the Soviet Union in terms of global affairs, in terms of the ultimate objective of world revolution. You know, the Chinese certainly were very understanding and very realistic. They conducted their own foreign policy in a way that recognized the existence of a multi-state system and that they had to operate within that. They needed to protect their national interests. They needed to survive as a, a sovereign state. And they understood that about the Soviet Union. There's no question about that. But, you know, as Khrushchev's International orientation became clear by 1958, 1959. You know, it certainly appeared to the Chinese leadership that this was a pretty wholesale abandonment of any idea of global revolution and that the accommodation, the idea of peaceful coexistence with the capitalist system, with the imperialist world, was just going a little bit too far in that direction. It was not accepting the necessity of navigating within a pre-existing global system, but was really sort of embracing that, saying, well, this is just the way it is, and we're just going to have to live with this, which I think was not the long-term perspective of the Chinese leadership in terms of you know, the ultimate objectives of socialist revolution. But that global perspective also dovetails with these divisions that I was talking about earlier of perspective over China's course of development, that you know the Soviet model, the way that certainly Chairman Mao and others in the leadership perceived it was that the Soviet model had evolved in a way that was largely kind of top-down leadership, that the role of the party as the vanguard had been translated from the revolutionary struggle into one of a kind of top-down leadership management model. 
that was inconsistent with what China was trying to do, which was, you know, having built a mass revolutionary movement that overthrew the nationalists and, you know, fought against Japanese imperialism and resisted American imperialism in Korea, that they wanted to build on that foundation. And just the divergence of those perspectives by the end of the 1950s, it shifted from being in philosophical terms from a non-antagonistic to an antagonistic contradiction. And it was the convergence of those two, the global geopolitical perspective of what came to be referred to as Soviet revisionism, and the divergence in developmental models between the Soviet sort of top-down management approach and the Chinese more mobilizational approach to development. Those two things coming together meant that these fraternal parties had to part ways. And as you say, this wasn't a violent outburst. It wasn't the complete rupture of relations. It starts as a fraternal debate the exchange of polemical documents, but ultimately those conflicts, those contradictions proved to be unreconcilable and the Sino-Soviet split becomes the new or at least a new strategic reality going forward through the 1960s and into the 70s. Ken, I thought we would be able to march through 70 years of history, but we only made it through 10. <laughs> So we, we got through the 1950s, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad we spent enough time here to sort of set the stage for the 1960s, because in the 1960s, China, having had this first polemical, ideological, fraternal, and comradely struggle over perspectives on how to fight imperialism and how to build socialism, this struggle no longer is an ideological political struggle, it becomes a state-to-state -state dispute. It becomes fundamental to the politics, internal and external politics for China and for the Soviet Union throughout the 1960s. Of course, the 1960s, you have the U.S. war in Vietnam. Of course, that directly affected and drew in both China and the Soviet Union, put enormous pressure on both countries. Again, the 60s, this tumultuous decade is where we're going to go next. And we'll start by talking about how China moves sharply to the left in terms of its presentation as a political ideological force. And it's really under this shift to the left in the early 1960s that Maoism becomes an international political current because in the divide between the Soviet Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Parties, socialists, communists, Marxists, progressives all around the world in almost every country start to take sides. And so you see the development of competing kinds of socialism within the broad framework of groups that would characterize themselves as Marxists or Leninists or communists writ large. We'll talk about all of that in the next discussion. And of course, the overwhelming sort of dominating context for that debate, those discussions, those struggles, were the operations and plans and machinations of US imperialism as the leader of world imperialism that targeted both China and the Soviet Union. But we'll pick the discussion up again in the 1960s. The entire globe is today the site of a momentous conflict. As each side attempts to prove to the world the superiority of its position, the conflict is fought with the words of diplomats, with gestures of friendship and help to uncommitted countries, even with cultural demonstrations. It is fought indeed on every level of man's experience, for the stakes are high. It is the challenge of ideas. Dr. Hammond, I want to give a brief review and a very brief historical timeline to provide context for this period, 1959 to 1965. Chairman Mao Zedong had visited Moscow right after the Chinese Revolution came to power. That was in 1949. He met with Stalin over several months of discussions between the Soviet Union and China. The two countries forged a friendship treaty, 
The Soviet Union agreed to send thousands of economic advisors to China. It also sent military advisors. It provided economic and military aid to China. This alliance, along with the Alliance of Socialist Governments in Eastern Europe and in North Vietnam and North Korea, constituted what was then called the Socialist Camp. This is a time when socialists came to power, had state power, and held state power in countries that constituted two-fifths of the world's population. The primary foreign policy goal of the United States at that time was to stop the revolutionary tide from spreading. This is what the U.S. called the containment strategy, meaning to contain communism. It was really designed to contain the spread of revolution. Primary to the U.S. strategy during this period was the breakup or the attempted breakup or a wedge that the U.S. tried to create in the alliance between the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. We're going to talk about that in this show. Here are some of the points that we're going to cover. Under intense U.S. pressure from the Cold War, the Soviet Union, under the leadership of Khrushchev, Stalin had died in 1953, began entering into a dialogue and discussion with the United States and other Western governments that made up the NATO military alliance. In 1960, the Soviet leadership prepared for a summit meeting in Paris with President Dwight D. Eisenhower. This was extremely important for the Soviet Union. It would have been the first high-level leadership meeting between the Soviet Union and Western leaders since the end of World War II. We talk about that in this episode and its impact on China. We also discuss the ideological debate that began to develop between China and the Soviet Union. China resurrected the revolutionary teachings of Lenin to openly polemicize against the foreign policy decisions of the Soviet Union. We also examine the war that broke out between the People's Republic of China and India in 1962. We talk in this episode about the 1963 nuclear test ban treaty that was signed between the Soviet Union and the United States and other nuclear powers. I want to say a quick word about that before we get started. While this test ban treaty that prohibited atmospheric testing of nuclear bombs was a major step forward for the global environment, we in this episode will examine how and why it left China feeling even more isolated from the Soviet Union and actually contributed to the final breakup of the alliance between the two socialist giants. Finally, we look at the U.S. invasion of Vietnam in 1964. Of course, Vietnam shares a border with China. When the U.S. had invaded Korea just 14 years earlier, it led to a war between the U.S. and China. And finally, we look at the impact on China's foreign policy of the CIA-organized counter-revolutionary coup in Indonesia and the destruction of the Indonesian government, and of course, the Indonesian Communist Party, the largest communist party at that time outside of the socialist bloc countries, and its impact on China's thinking. Indonesia was at that time China's closest and most important ally in Asia. Ken Hammond, a lot happened in those years, 1959 to 1965. It reshaped China's foreign policy and it reshaped world politics. Let's get your thoughts on this chapter in Chinese foreign policy. Well, I think that the divergence, shall we say, that emerges between the Soviets and the Chinese right at the end of the 50s and then you know, increasingly as we move into the 1960s, it arises both from internal differences, that is to say, different perspectives on the path of economic development, the process of building socialism within the Soviet Union and within the China. There were differences of opinion about that, different perspectives on that. But also, in terms of what we're looking at here, in the relationship of these socialist states to the struggle, the global struggle for revolutionary transformation. And the Soviet Union had, uh, of course, 
come through the World War II, the great anti-fascist struggle, with tremendous losses of life, 27 million people, massive destruction of its economy and infrastructure. And they were intent over the following years on rebuilding that. They were deeply involved in their own domestic circumstances. And they needed a context of global peace to be able to pursue that process, to be able to get their their path of socialist construction back on track. The Chinese, of course, in the 50s were just embarking on the course of socialist development. And they too placed a high priority on the need for peace to avoid the kind of conflict that, of course, they faced immediately in Korea. But after 1953, you know, the hope was certainly that further major power confrontations, major conflicts could be avoided so that the Chinese could pursue their own objectives of socialist development. But there's also the underlying question of the world revolution, of global revolution. The idea of building socialism in one country was a big challenge for the Soviets for a long time. Even after the liberation in China and the establishment of the socialist states in Eastern Europe, this was still, although it encompassed a significant proportion of global population and territory, you know, the socialist camp was still surrounded by the capitalist world. The alliances, which the United States was very proactive in developing, things like NATO in Europe or CETO, the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization in Southeast Asia, these were clear moves by imperialism led by the United States to contain the socialist bloc. They hadn't been able to contain the Soviet Union. They hadn't been able to contain the revolutionary struggles fully. There had been this, you know, the liberation of China and Eastern Europe, but that only intensified American objectives of containing, of stopping it from going any further. So the question then was, you know, well, how do we relate to that? You know, the Soviets, the Chinese, how are they going to deal with this question of world revolution? And the Soviets pretty clearly had decided that while they would support and encourage struggles in different parts of the world, that they weren't going to be really serious active players. Whereas the Chinese saw global revolution, the continuing anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggles across Asia, Africa, and Latin America as sort of components of their own efforts to build socialism within China. And I think that that differential relationship to revolutionary movements in other parts of the world also was a pretty significant factor in this growing differentiation between the Soviet and the Chinese positions. For those who might not know some of this history, for the Soviets, who, as you mentioned, had lost 27 million dead in, in vast parts of their agriculture and industrial infrastructure, the country that had struggled so hard to overcome extreme underdevelopment and poverty in the 1930s through industrialization and collectivization that came at great human cost, uh, but did develop the country, they then are plunged into world war They face 80% of Hitler's army, most of the war fighting for the first years of World War II in Europe were actually on the so-called Eastern Front, which would have been the Soviet Western Front. It was the German invasion. Again, the Soviets lose 27 million. But during those war years, the United States under Roosevelt and later Truman at the tail end and Britain under, at least in the beginning, Winston Churchill are allies with the Soviet Union. So the idea that there would be meetings between Soviet leaders and American leaders or British leaders, in spite of the fact that they had differing social systems, antagonistic social systems, they weren't unusual. In fact, they were sort of a dominant part of the wartime alliance starting in 1943. So there was the Tehran meeting that's in Iran, obviously. Stalin Churchill, Roosevelt meet together. They talk about the war, how it's going. There's actually, in the midst of this alliance, a lot of tension too, because the Soviets are basically demanding from Churchill and Roosevelt, when are you going to open up a Western front? Where's the invasion of continental Europe from the West? Why are we fighting the Germans all by ourselves? There's a lot of pressure, but also at the same time, the Soviets, to the shock of the whole world, have overcome the German invasion, have launched a counteroffensive, the largest 
military counteroffensive in human history and now are pushing the Germans back, back out of the Soviet Union, back into Eastern Europe, back into Central Europe. That's all happening in 1943, the beginning of 44. And then there are two more very, very historically important summits, one at Yalta and the last at Potsdam in Germany. That was at the tail end of the war in 1945. So symmetry between the West and the East, between the Soviets and the Western leaders, that was a thing. But during the Cold War, after the war ended, and as the United States and Britain threatened to annihilate the Soviet Union, which at that time had no nuclear weapons, which was militarily fearing another war, having just come out of the devastation of the last one, all meetings between the leadership ended. And then starting in the late 1950s, really in the mid 50s, the US and the Soviets start to reach back to each other. They start to have discussions with each other. And Eisenhower basically is extending an olive branch to Khrushchev, who's taken over as the Soviet leader following Stalin's death in 1953. And now, for the first time in Paris, a summit meeting is going to be held once again. It hadn't happened for 15 years. So the Soviets are excited because the Soviets think, ah, at last, the Cold War tensions are going to come to an end. We need peace. We need to convert military production to civilian consumer production. We can't do that without a lessening of tensions. This offers a great opportunity, but they don't bring China to the table. And at that time, Ken, China was under fierce assault by the same imperialists that Khrushchev was preparing to go clink champagne glasses with. Absolutely. And of course, although there hadn't been a real summit since the end of the war, there had been the two international Geneva conferences that negotiated an end to the Korean War and negotiated the French withdrawal from Indochina. And China had been included at both of those. So it wasn't as though there was no precedent, there was no experience of having China at the table. So that made it even more of a direct move to exclude China when the 1960 summit was being planned. And absolutely, the Chinese were were in a position at that point. There had been the crises in the Taiwan Strait. And we know in retrospect that in 1958, the Eisenhower administration had even considered the use of nuclear weapons at that point. They chose not to, obviously, and thank goodness. But the American investment in in Taiwan and in maintaining a tense atmosphere on the China coast. They were still running clandestine sabotage operations into Fujian and other parts of southern China. And of course, they had ramped up their support for separatist efforts in Tibet. There was a training camp up in central Colorado where they trained Tibetan agents to be infiltrated from Nepal to carry out sabotage and propaganda activities in Tibet. So China very much felt the pressure of American imperialism, just as Khrushchev was preparing to go and sit down for a chat that they weren't invited to. Not a surprise that they felt a little, shall we say, anxiety about this proposed summit. That might be an understatement, Ken. (laughs) They were alarmed, I think, and worried because Khrushchev had also sort of rewritten some of the basic doctrine that all of the communist parties of the world had adopted after the Russian Revolution, after the formation of the Communist International or the Third International. One precept was that war was inevitable. And during the era of imperialism, that war was sort of a foundational characteristic feature of imperialism. And of course, China was feeling the brunt of that imperialist war drive. But the Soviets were now saying, Khrushchev was now saying, we've entered the era where there can be peaceful coexistence where the existence of nuclear bombs that guaranteed mutually assured destruction for all also means that in a way it becomes a recipe for not going to war, that both sides having nuclear weapons by the late 1950s means that instead of, as Lenin suggested, there would only be war and the outcome of war would be revolution, Khrushchev and the Soviet leadership were saying, no, actually... We can have peaceful coexistence. We're in a new reality because of nuclear weapons and the sheer destructiveness of those weapons, unlike anything known to the human race up to that time. 
and there can be a way so that instead of seeking the revolutionary road, meaning the overturn of the capitalist government, smashing the state, erecting a new socialist power based on a new class arraignment where the poor, the workers, the peasants take power, there can be sort of a period of long-term reconciliation. And so the Chinese are thinking, wait, this is a major shift by the most important country, socialist bloc country, most important in the sense that it was the biggest and most powerful. They're shifting away from a confrontation with imperialism, but imperialism is not shifting away from a confrontation with us. And we're not invited. We're not there at the summit. We're not like at the two Geneva international summits that dealt with the issues of Korea peace or Vietnam decolonization. We're not there. And the only reason we might not be there is the imperialists don't want us there. And the Soviets, Khrushchev is willing to sacrifice his alliance with a sister socialist country to make peace with the imperialists. So they are in a state of complete alarm and they start to, even though it's not a direct attack, they're starting to polemicize within the world communist movement against the Soviet leadership. And in 1960, in the summer of 1960, Ken, Khrushchev gets angry that the Chinese are not accepting the Soviet version of what must happen, which is that the Soviets must relax tensions, must reduce Cold War tensions, must deal with American imperialism on the terms of American imperialism. So Khrushchev is angry at the Chinese who are angry at the Soviets. And in retaliation, Khrushchev withdraws scientific experts and technicians that had been in China for the previous decade, helping China overcome poverty and underdevelopment and all of the legacies of the earlier century of humiliation, that was huge. It was very significant. The impact of that was devastating for many development projects, infrastructure projects. It hurt scientific education and technological research and development. And of course, one of the areas that it had the most direct impact was that Soviet scientists and military technicians had been assisting the Chinese in the pursuit of developing their own atomic weapons capability. And one of the great accomplishments, actually, of the early 60s for China was that even with the withdrawal of Soviet assistance and expertise, they pushed forward and were able to explode their first atomic device at their test grounds out west in October 1964, which by a sort of happy coincidence was also the time that Khrushchev fell from power in the Soviet Union. There was a certain, I'm sure, ironic satisfaction for the Chinese in that. But yes, they felt isolated on the international stage and abandoned in terms of the kind of fraternal solidarity which had been in place in the 50s but was now withdrawn. So the Chinese, I think, very much felt that they were left to their own devices. That had to shape not just their perception of the Soviet Union, but their sense of how they needed to navigate the way forward in the global context. I was reading a document. It's an article, really, from a Soviet highly acknowledged Soviet scientist. His name is Dr. Mikhail Klochko. He was a Soviet chemist and a Stalin prize winner who went to China twice as a member of a Soviet scientific mission. And he wrote this article in 1970, a decade after the withdrawal, the sudden, abrupt, shocking withdrawal of Soviet technicians and scientists and economic experts from China in retaliation for China protesting the rapprochement or detente or reconciliation or peace efforts by Khrushchev at their, as they perceived it at their expense. Here's what he writes. As one of those who was suddenly and surprisingly ordered home in 1960, I can testify that all of the anger at the move was not limited to the Chinese. Without exception, my fellow scientists and other Soviet specialists whom I knew in China were extremely upset at being recalled before the end of our contracts. Like myself, others must have had difficulty hiding their amazement when told by Soviet representatives in Beijing that dissatisfaction with our living and working conditions was an important reason for our recall. <laughs> 
meaning that was a made up reason. In fact, a few of us had never lived better in our whole lives than we did in China. Our Chinese hosts were even more mystified. Again and again, they asked, why are we leaving? And whether anything could be done to prevent our going. The suddenness with which the events developed indicated that the decision was irreversible. And then he goes on. So the Soviet scientists who were there, they weren't just scientists. They weren't just doing a job. They were there in solidarity. They wanted to be there. Not only were they well hosted, but they were forging a solidarity that all of them had been taught for decades before was primary. And suddenly, without explanation and a made up reason that they weren't being treated well, they were angry too. So you had Soviet specialists upset, the Chinese mystified, amazed, and undoubtedly feeling disgusted. And again, when you think about it being China, they're overcoming the century of humiliation. As Mao Zedong said in 1949, China has stood up. And now to be treated sort of like, you know, they're going to be punished because they didn't go along with a country that was more economically developed, even though the Soviet Union was a sister socialist country, the Chinese must have felt a sense of national chauvinism an attitude, maybe not colonialism in the old sense, but kind of a colonial type attitude that they could be mistreated. How important from a psychological point of view would that have been as a factor? Oh, I think that was a vital factor. You know, 20 years later, in the early 80s, I was living in Beijing in 82 and for a few years after that and met many people who had studied Russian when they were in the university. That was their first second language. And there were still on some of the campuses in Beijing, there were still buildings and signs in Russian because that had been, you know, the presence had been so thorough. So the Russians were just a part of that first decade of the People's Republic in a way that it's hard for us to, I think, maybe to understand. And they were they were there to help. And there were so many close personal bonds that formed. So I think that the withdrawal, especially such an abrupt, just, you know, one day the word came down and people had to pack up and leave. It was a tremendous psychological rupture. And you mentioned the idea that China was coming out of the century of humiliation. That was a century in which China had repeatedly been defeated militarily and exploited economically and oppressed politically by the Western powers. I'm sure that for many people, this kind of move by the Soviets felt like yet another humiliation, and this time not at the hands of Western imperialist aggression, but at the hands of people who, you know, what was supposed to be a fraternal socialist ally. I think that obviously the political impact was significant, as was the economic, but I think you're quite right. The the psychological dimension of this, both at the level of ordinary people, but particularly at the level of the leadership, must have been frankly pretty devastating. And in the bigger picture, Ken, it shows that imperialism was also consciously using divide and conquer tactics. I mean, we know that colonialism and imperialism used divide and conquer tactics. They developed it as an art form. Look what happened in India, the division of India at the time of independence to a Muslim majority state or a Hindu majority state. The British did that. The creation of Pakistan and India, the division of India, that was colonial divide and conquer tactics. The U.S. was also well aware that as the Soviets were so preoccupied with having peace, which is understandable because of what happened to the Soviet Union. I mean, if you're the Soviets, you're thinking like, wait a second, we lost 27 million. Wait a second, we have to develop. We need peace. The U.S. will blame us for any confrontation anywhere. And as a consequence, we're going to do everything to sort of keep our powder dry. And you, you Chinese or you Vietnamese or Koreans or whoever, you should be aware that our destiny impacts your destiny. So be sensitive to us. And so the Soviets feel righteous. They feel they're doing the right thing. They're preserving peace. The Chinese feel wait, we're being left in the dark and you're making a deal with imperialism for your peace, but we're not at peace. And so imperialism is, and the U.S. imperialist ruling class as a highly class conscious global power is well aware that these 
divergent interests between the Chinese and the Soviets can be stoked by putting pressure at one time on one and then pressure at the other time on the other, again, pitting both against each other. Well, yes, these divide and conquer strategies, this was such a fundamental component of American policy conduct in all around the world. As countries emerged from European colonial rule, you know, a lot of the countries that wound up coming out the other side of colonialism had not been integrated states prior to colonial rule. And I'm thinking here particularly of a country like Indonesia. Indonesia, you know, is an aggregation of some 13,000 islands, many, many different languages. A majority of people are Muslim, but there are other kinds of communities, religious and spiritual communities, and a lot of ethnic diversity across those many islands. They forged a national unity in the anti-colonial struggle, and Indonesia emerged from that in 1949. The United States even though it had put pressure on the Dutch to let go and to acknowledge Indonesia's independence, the United States all through the 50s and 60s and on into the 70s provided clandestine support to separatist movements in many different parts of Indonesia. Not enough that they would actually be able to achieve independence, but just enough to keep those forces alive as a balance, as a way of manipulating the politics of Indonesia, of saying you know, to the government in Jakarta that you need to ally yourselves with us because we can provide the kind of security, the kind of assistance that will benefit your country. And we see similar things going on today, for example, in Myanmar, where you have you know an ethnic majority that dominates the government, but more than 20 different ethnicities that are in states of rebellion around the frontier. And again, the United States provides clandestine assistance in a kind of a trickle to those rebel groups just to keep pressure on the government in Myanmar. And we see right now that that's a very problematic situation over there. But these kinds of campaigns of attrition, of not really wanting to have independence, it's like we play with the Kurds as well enough assistance so that they remain a problem for other governments, but only so that they will weaken and undermine the stability of those surrounding states. It's a very, very cynical manipulation of people and their hopes and political aspirations, simply designed to maximize American influence and perpetuate American domination. Perhaps one of the best examples of the same phenomenon, and we could actually spend a good deal of time talking about the different examples, and actually it's important to do so, is, you know, Iran had a revolution in 1979, toppled the Shah of Iran, who had been placed on the throne in 1953 after the Mozak Day government, a popularly elected government in Iran, nationalized the Anglo-Iranian oil company AIOC, now known as BP, later became British Petroleum, now it's BP. The government dared to nationalize the British oil company, so Britain and the United States imposed crippling economic sanctions on Iran, and then organized through CIA and British intelligence a coup d'etat. They put the old government out, 20,000 Iranians were killed, the Shah came to power, he ruled the country with an iron hand for 26 years, he denationalized the oil so American and British oil companies could take it back and make profits from it while Iranians remain poor. Then the people rise up in 1979, they have a revolution, the Shah flees, and the next year, the United States says to Iraq, to the Saddam Hussein government, why don't you go you know, capture that oil-rich Arab-speaking part of Iran in Abadan? We'll support you. We'll give you weapons. We'll give you even chemical weapons. Saddam does this, launches an invasion of Iran in 1980. And then the Iran-Iraq war lasts the next 10 years. Both sides take hundreds of thousands of casualties. And as we learned from the Iran-Contra scandal, Ken, the U.S. was giving arms to Iran too. In other words, as Henry Kissinger said in the 1980s, we want both sides to kill each other. So, yeah, you can't get more cynical, but that's a dominant part of U.S. foreign policy. 
Absolutely. You know, these days, I know we want to get back to talking about the 60s, but these days, a lot of people will ask us, I'm sure you've had this experience as well, when we talk about China, we talk about what the realities of China are, what's really happening over there. Uh, People will say, oh, but, you know, I see all these stories in the media about how bad things are and what bad things are going on. And, you know, you say, well, there's ways to, to critique that. There's ways to understand that those things aren't true. But people, don't often realize the degree of cynicism, the degree of willful, intentional lying and manipulation that is carried on by the so-called intelligence community and the sort of foreign policy establishment. I think that it is good to look back and think about these myriad examples of the most direct kinds of interventions and activities carried on, you know, in the dark, in the clandestine realm, but the willful behavior of the American government. Because to understand what's happening today, these kinds of historical examples are very, very illuminating. Indeed. And again, we'll come back as we go forward in this series. I mean, the American people who didn't know anything about Uyghurs are taught to love Uyghurs and care about Uyghurs, just as Americans didn't know anything about Kurds until they were told that they had to support Kurds because they were an oppressed Muslim minority in a Muslim-majority country, Iraq, because the U.S., was finding rationales and pretexts to invade Iraq, or the way Americans were told to care about Kosovo Albanians in Yugoslavia. You know, Americans didn't know anything about that, but suddenly the U.S. was bombing socialist Yugoslavia with 28,000 bombs and missiles in the name of defending Muslims in a predominantly majority Albanian-speaking part of Yugoslavia. Again, the cynical manipulation And in each and every time, because the media functions as an echo chamber and tells all these sob stories, people really feel if you care about human rights, you have to be on the side of American imperialism, which is defending in the noblest possible way the human rights of, quote, minority peoples. Meanwhile, the United States has you know, carried out two genocides at home against the indigenous population, against the enslaved, kidnapped African populations that came to the United States. Anyway, it's very important for, as we discuss China, Soviet, and international relations, to keep these things sort of at the front of our thinking because they're constantly a determinant in terms of how foreign policy plays out. Let's go back, though, and we're going to not spend too much more time in this segment, Ken. We're going to do multiple discussions with you so that we can march through the history since 1949, looking at China's foreign policy and its evolution. But I want to go back to the early 1960s. I think we framed that situation pretty well. In 1962, there is a conflict between China and India and a brief war. But during that time, the Soviets, who had strong diplomatic relations with India, which was a capitalist government, actually didn't stand with China So from the Chinese point of view, this was a border dispute. I want you to help the audience understand it. But from a Chinese point of view, it's like now the Soviets are negotiating behind our back with Western imperialism and then a regional conflict between us and a capitalist government, India. The Soviets are neutral at best. Anyway, what was the impact there on China? Well, the 1962 border war was itself, of course, a legacy of Western imperialism. The British, who had established themselves as the colonial rulers across much of South Asia, it's not just what is today India, but Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, all of these areas were part of British India. And in that context, of course, the British had ambitions further over the Himalayas. They sent in 1904 the Young Husband mission to invade Tibet and occupy Lhasa, the capital, for a while, even while that was still part of the Qing dynasty, the Qing Empire, which didn't fall until 1912. So the British talk about pursuing a goal of separatism, the idea of trying to split off a part of the Qing Empire. Of course, that was being done also by the Tsarist state up in the Northeast. But the result of some of that adventurism was that they negotiated agreements defining the frontier, the border between British India and the Qing Empire, the Qing state. 
And a lot of that was negotiated and lines were drawn on maps. And then, you know, that was sort of set aside for a while. After the collapse of the Qing dynasty, China wasn't considered to be much of a strategic concern anymore by the British. And, you know, they maintained a diplomatic presence in Tibet, in Lhasa. But the McMahon line, as it came to be known, that was drawn in these negotiations in the first decade of the 20th century, clearly defined territorial division between China and India. Well, after independence, after India became independent, they didn't fully accept the agreements that had been made by the British. And of course, in some ways, that's understandable. But after liberation, after the establishment of the People's Republic in 1949, China was very concerned about, as they say, uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity are foundational concepts of Chinese foreign policy. And they wanted to make sure that all the territories which had been under the control of the previous governments, whether it was the Republic from 1912 to 1949 or the Empire before 1912, that those territories, which were part of China, were recognized and secured. And that involved these stretches on the border between post-colonial India and post-liberation China. And there's two different segments. There's a segment in the east around the borders of Bhutan, and then there's a segment in the west in an area that's called the Aksai Chin, which is up on the mountains separating India and China. And we should remember, too, that the Indians during this period had already made two major seizures of territory. They took over what had been a separate Tibetan kingdom called Ladakh, in the West. And in 1961 or 62, they moved militarily into the tiny principality of Sikkim, which was located in between Nepal and Bhutan. And they annexed those territories to India. So India was clearly pursuing its own territorial ambitions in terms of extending its power. Now, taking over Ladakh and Sikkim, these were tiny states that had no defensive capability. But the Chinese saw this as an indication of India's expansionist intentions, and they wanted to make sure that the territory that had been defined as Chinese remained under their control. And that led to encounters between Chinese and Indian forces. And the Chinese at a certain point simply moved their forces into the territories that were demarcated along the McMahon line, occupied those territories and said, look, this is as far as we're going to go. They weren't trying to take over India. They weren't invading India. They were simply establishing on a factual basis on the ground their control of those territories. Now, interestingly, after the fighting was ended, after that brief military campaign was concluded, the Chinese actually withdrew from some of the territory that they had occupied. They didn't abandon their claims to that territory, but they wanted the resolution of this conflict to be carried out diplomatically, to be carried out in a more fraternal way between the governments of India and China. Obviously, some of that has been resolved over the years, but other areas haven't. There's been fighting up in the area around Ladakh as recently as last summer. So these are ongoing tensions. But the fact that the Soviet Union refused to support China, refused to legitimate China's position, and took what was publicly a neutral stance, but effectively amounted to support for India. This, again, was a sign of, of this shifting of priorities away from socialist solidarity and support for revolutionary struggles to one of kind of great power you know, status and taking a kind of lofty view and trying to build this alliance or this relationship with the capitalist state in India. I think that it was you know, these things come one after another after another. And for the Chinese, it's just an accumulation of grievances that led them to have this very, very skeptical attitude towards the Soviet leadership. So we can see the dispute between China and the Soviet Union gaining steam, as you put it, one event after another after another. So the China-India War 1962, the Soviets have neutrality, but neutrality really is perceived to be opposing China. So in 1963, the nuclear test ban treaty is signed. Again, perception is so important here for people, especially people in the United States or people in the American peace movement, to see how 
one perception in the United States or in the Soviet Union might be very different from a perception inside China because the Chinese don't have nuclear weapons or insufficient numbers of nuclear weapons. You can clarify which it is, but they feel under attack by the United States. They're kept out of the United Nations by the United States. There's constant provocations against China. The U.S. is carrying out covert operations against China. You know, we're always in the U.S. media talking about red China and the threat of China as if Mao Zedong is a madman. And the Soviets signed the nuclear test ban treaty with other countries. And what that treaty does is it bans atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons. Now, that's tremendously important because exploding atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere, which was going on by the Soviets and by the United States and Britain, France. I mean, it's a huge contamination of the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, it's terrible. And both sides were doing it. And the only way it could stop is if both sides came to a mutual agreement. So the Soviets are like, yes, this is something that's a real step forward. We're strong enough now that the imperialists have to negotiate with us. They know they can't really fight and win a nuclear war anymore. We can get rid of atmospheric testing. That's a just a big plus for humanity and not just to mention the Soviet Union. But again, from the Chinese point of view, it's the Soviets making arms agreements with the imperialists who are at the same moment attacking China, threatening China, hoping to you know, destroy China. And so the test ban treaty is considered another betrayal. Absolutely. And you know, if we take the test ban treaty, the timing of that is really critical. The test ban treaty is signed in 1963. It's not until October of 1964 that the Chinese are ready to carry out their first atomic bomb test. So had the terms of the test ban treaty, the 63 treaty, you know, been applied to China, it would have halted their development of an atomic bomb. And the Soviets knew that. And the Soviets had, of course, as we talked about earlier, withdrawn their technical assistance. The Chinese perceived the test ban treaty as at least in part specifically aimed at them. And of course, later in the 60s, when the non-proliferation treaty is signed, basically both the test ban treaty and the non proliferation treaty were designed to sort of lock the door on the club of nuclear powers, you know, so that Britain and France, the United States and the Soviet Union could go about their business. They had nuclear weapons and that put them in a position to sort of dictate to the rest of the world. You know, if a country like China was to get nuclear weapons, that would be seen by them, by the pre-existing nuclear powers as disrupting, you know, international order. And indeed, that's exactly how it was portrayed when China did successfully set off its first atomic device. So, you know, the Chinese see the Russians, see the Soviets as being increasingly cozy with the leading capitalist powers. And in something like the test ban treaty, basically forming a block of solidarity with the Western atomic powers to say, you know, we have these and we want to maintain a monopoly on these. And that we was was very important because that was one we that didn't include China. And the Chinese certainly perceived that as the further capitulation of the Soviets to an international order, which was shaped by the interests of the Western imperialists. So during this period from 1959 to 1963, as the Soviet Union is making new arms agreements with the West, test ban treaty, other agreements, peaceful coexistence or an equilibrium between the socialist bloc led by the Soviet Union and the United States and its NATO allies on the other China is feeling, one, additionally isolated, but China's politics went sharply to the left. They resurrected the basic writings of Lenin and said that the Soviet policy is a revision of Marxism. They called the Soviet leadership revisionists and reformists. And in the departure from the orthodoxy whereby all the communist parties in the world were supposed to basically say the same thing. Now you had this ideological political split represented by China, and that generates a leftist development within the socialist movement in every country. Maoist parties form around the world. Young people especially are attracted to Maoism. 
Maoism is put up on a pedestal as the alternative center for socialism and communism. So there now becomes, in a way, two communisms on the global arena. And during that entire period, China is articulating basic core concepts from Marxism and Leninism, the pamphlet, The Differences Between Comrade Togliatti and Us, and then a follow-up pamphlet, more on the differences between Comrade Togliatti and us. Comrade Togliatti was the leader of the Italian Communist Party. They were attacking the Italian Communist Party, which was an ally of Khrushchev, rather than attacking Khrushchev directly. So it wasn't a direct attack on Khrushchev, but everyone understood that this was a political ideological struggle, that it went from the expression of grievances to an open ideological political struggle. Ultimately, Ken, this takes another turn where it devolves from an ideological struggle between, quote, comrades to a struggle between states where both sides uh, China and the Soviet Union start to share accusations that the other side perhaps is even worse than the imperialists. So it, the degeneration of the split takes place over the course of the 1960s. And ultimately, in this irony of ironies, China opens the door to Kissinger and Nixon. But we're jumping ahead. I just want to frame it that this is a dynamic process and it's all compressed within a few years, the 1960s. And while China's feeling isolated, two other major events are happening, Ken. And I want to just sort of close out this segment, sort of acknowledging these two developments. One is the U.S. has now fully invaded Vietnam by 1964. The U.S. is carpet bombing Vietnam. Vietnam shares a border with China. The United States had fought a war with Korea between 1950 and 53, and ultimately China intervened in that war with hundreds of thousands or perhaps a million volunteers. So there was a direct military clash between China and America. Now, here you have the Vietnam War going on at the same time. That's 1963, 64, 65. And the other major event on the international scale is what happens in Indonesia. You mentioned Indonesia before, the centrality of Indonesia. In 1965, there is a counter-revolution staged by the CIA and the Indonesian generals against the progressive government, against the Communist Party of Indonesia, which is massive, huge, millions of members, and which looked to China. China looked to Indonesia as a way out of its isolation. So, so suddenly, Indonesia is gone. You have the Vietnam War on its border. You have the loss of Indonesia as an ally in this bloodbath. A million Indonesians died in this ruthless CIA, Pentagon-led coup d'etat in 1965. A hidden massacre, by the way, from the point of view of the West. People in the U.S. only learned a little bit about Indonesia in 1965 when Hollywood made a movie about it. And that was sort of a fictional account. But anyway, let's talk about these two events and how they're impacting China's world outlook. Well, the impact couldn't have been stronger. China, you know, in the early 60s is losing its fraternal relationship with the Soviets that had been truly beneficial in the first decade of socialist construction. China's feeling isolated now from the Soviets. The Soviets are conducting themselves in ways that are excluding and marginalizing, refusing to back up China. And then right in the middle of the decade, you have first the escalation in Vietnam, and then the horrors of October 1965 in Indonesia. For the Chinese, the Chinese had sat at the negotiating table in Geneva in 1954 when agreements were hammered out to end the French colonial era in Vietnam and a temporary separation of control between the northern and the southern parts of Vietnam was agreed to only for the purposes of preparing for elections, which were to be held throughout Vietnam. But those elections were canceled by the agency of the United States. The United States set up a puppet government in the South. The U.S. didn't want to have those elections because they openly admitted that Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh would win. They were wildly popular throughout the country. And then under the Kennedy administration, the U.S. began to put in more and more so-called military advisors, 50,000 
thousand and more. And then, of course, in August of 1964, there was this trumped up pseudo incident in the Tonkin Gulf that President Johnson used basically to get Congress to give him a blank check to go to war in Vietnam. And so there was this steady ratcheting up of imperialist aggression right there on the threshold of China that went totally against the agreements that had been reached in Geneva that China had been a part of. So, you know, uh, certainly what, what were the Chinese supposed to think? And then at the same time, down in Southeast Asia, down in Indonesia, what had been the largest communist party outside of the socialist bloc itself, the Indonesian Communist Party, which had been working very very steadily to build itself up. The independence movement in Indonesia, the leaders, Sukarno and Hatta, had been obviously nationalist leaders, and they hadn't emphasized in the independence struggle, they hadn't emphasized a particular vision for a post-colonial Indonesia. But in the course of the 50s and the early 60s, Sukarno increasingly came to promote a progressive social and socialist program in China, I'm sorry, in Indonesia. But that that was increasingly seen by the Americans as threatening the stability, as they would put it, the openness of Indonesia to Western capitalist exploitation is really what they were concerned about. Oil, tin, hardwoods, teak, things like that coming out of Indonesia as exports. There was a lot of concern about this. And finally, in the fall of 65, the CIA and the American political elites decided that Sukarno had to go. And the way to do that was not to directly intervene and overthrow him, but was to destroy the Indonesian Communist Party. And in a horrific massacre, as you said, a million Indonesians were killed. People were killed simply for being a member of the Communist Party or for being suspected of being a member of the Communist Party. And it was the American embassy, it was staff at the American embassy who drew up those lists of people who were to be executed. You know, the United States has always maintained that it had a hands-off attitude to this, but it's clearly documented, and these are in publications from the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Cornell University. This isn't some you know, left-wing propaganda, but that American agents helped to draw up these lists that were then used by the Indonesian military to go out and round up people and kill them. So that too, that was a devastating blow and further isolated China so that you know the relationship with the Soviet Union continued continued to be, at that point, sort of collateral damage from all of this. China was increasingly isolated, increasingly frustrated with its position in the international world. Jim and Mao long ago pointed out that the class struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and the struggle between the roads of socialism and capitalism exist throughout the historical period of socialism. The great upheavals of the past few years in the world show that the days of imperialism headed by the United States, modern revisionism and all reaction are numbered. We're going to pick up where we left off, but Ken, let me begin first by noting that you have a new article that just was published by Monthly Review it's about the origins of capitalism in China. Now, we're talking about what's happening in the 1960s, but your article is about what was happening in the 10th century or thereabouts. Anyway, just real quick for the audience, what's the name of the article and what's your focus there? Well, the article is called Beyond the Sprouts of Capitalism, and it's an effort to re-examine Chinese economic history, basically for the last thousand years. It's, you know, just a modest undertaking. But I think that the point that I'm trying to make in the article is that when we look at the realities of Chinese history, we look at the realities of the Chinese economy, beginning about the 10th century, that it has all the characteristics, all the attributes that we associate with capitalism when we talk about European economic history. But because of the sort of ideological constraints that have plagued a lot of Marxist discourse since the 1920s and 30s, the influence of 
certain orthodoxies out of the Soviet Union, you know, there's been this concept of a series of stages that all societies had to pass through from slave society to feudalism to capitalism and on. And that model just doesn't fit the realities of Chinese history. So it's just an attempt to kind of relook at what's well established. It's not a particularly controversial set of data, but I want to cast it in the light of seeing China as having had its own particular trajectory of early commercial capitalist development that was distinct from what takes place that we're all familiar with in European history a few centuries later. I'm also interested in how that sets the stage in some ways for understanding China today. You know, there's so much controversy about the nature of China today. Is it capitalist? Is it market socialism? You know, what kind of system is it? And I think that while that's certainly a matter for ongoing debate and discussion, that having a better understanding of the long history of the Chinese economy gives us a little more perspective on putting the present into that context. And one other important point, again, for people who are just joining a discussion about China, Chinese history, China's foreign policy, we're focusing on the modern era, the foreign policy of the People's Republic of China since 1949, when the Communist Party came to power. But many people will think, look, Western Europe and America, these were advanced industrial capitalist countries. And... China is part of the third world. China is part of the developing world. And in one way, the People's Republic of China embraced that at Bandung at the Conference of the Non-Aligned. But one thing that people might not know is how far advanced China's economy was and what a major factor it was in the global economy, far, far, far beyond that of Europe, even not so long ago. That's right. I mean, down till the end of the 18th century, China was the most sophisticated and advanced economy in the world. It had very elaborate productive technologies. It had very sophisticated banking and finance systems. Its capitalism had evolved over hundreds of years and had produced, you know, an economy that was attractive to people from all over the world. That's why Europeans go out to explore and begin the era of European expansionism. They're not just out there, on, you know, for their health. They're looking for the wealth that was in Asia, primarily in China. And it's only with the Industrial Revolution and the impact of Western imperialism that China is, as many other parts of the world, China is sort of devolved and integrated into a Eurocentric global division of labor that really neutralized a lot of the dynamism that had existed there for many centuries. So, you know, China's rise today isn't just something that, as you say, is coming from a country that was, oh, just backward and underdeveloped. It's really a return to a multi-centric global economic order after a long period of Euro-American domination. So important. You know, when you think about Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, that whole concept that Africa, which was also in many ways very advanced societies, had become underdeveloped as a consequence of Western imperialist, Western colonial intervention. Something that, again, the Eurocentric or Western-centric view of history doesn't take into account. Absolutely. You know, we talk about the rise of European capitalism, and then it sort of, you know, seamlessly segues into the Industrial Revolution and the creation of the global imperialist system. Often it's treated as if that's the only narrative of capitalist development. And I think that a lot of scholarship in the last 20 or 30 years has really helped us recover a much more nuanced sense of just how dynamic places like China, but also places like Egypt and Bengal and India and Tokugawa, Japan, had these very dynamic early modern commercial capitalist economies that get overwritten by the impact of Western imperialism and in some ways kind of disappear from the historical record. So this particular article is just an effort to kind of reclaim that knowledge, reclaim that historical trajectory and bring it back into our understanding. With that said, let's jump into the mid-1960s. 
We talked again about the counter-revolution in Indonesia, 1965, a big blow to China. China's relations with the Soviet Union are deteriorating. The United States is intervened full-scale in Vietnam, bordering China when the United States intervened in Korea 15 years earlier. That drew China into the Korean War. Hundreds of thousands, maybe as many as a million Chinese people fought in the Korean War. A lot of pressures on China. So deterioration in the relations with the Soviet Union, the loss of Indonesia as an ally, the U.S. war in Southeast Asia. Then in 1966, an internal struggle within the Communist Party of China leads to, culminates in the launching of the great proletarian cultural revolution. That had a very profound impact on Chinese politics and Chinese society. You know, we don't have time to go into all of that history right now. That's very, very important history. But as we go forward now, Ken, into the what happens in the late 1960s, I want to start again for our audience, just to reframe this. In the 1950s, after the Chinese Revolution is victorious, Mao Zedong goes to Moscow. He spends six months there. He meets with Stalin. They form a Soviet-China friendship alliance. Soviet economic advisors and technicians come. Huge amounts of Soviet aid is brought to China. There's an economic model developed with Soviet assistance. So the decade of the 1950s is China as a part of the socialist bloc, the second big power after the Soviet Union, the most populous country in the world. But now in the 1960s, tensions between China and the Soviet Union basically over how to contend with the pressure from the Cold War, the pressure from U.S. and Western imperialism starts to create divisions. The Soviets are trying to lessen tensions with the United States. They're trying to have diplomacy, rapprochement, detente, normalization of relations, arms agreements. And the Chinese are fearing that the Soviets are selling them out, basically. They're putting Soviet-U.S. friendship ahead of Soviet-China friendship. And that tension is growing. And the struggle between them is a political struggle. It's an ideological struggle. It's like, comrades, you are not fighting imperialism properly on the part of the Chinese. You're not steadfast enough. And we remind you of what Lenin wrote. And from the Soviet point of view, they take other Lenin quotes about peaceful coexistence and say, comrades, don't act in such an ultra left provocative manner. But it's a discussion or a debate between comrades. By the mid-1960s, and especially in 1967-68, this struggle, political ideological struggle, devolves into a struggle not between parties, not between comrades, but between states. In other words, these socialist states are almost at war with each other, and they're no longer calling each other comrades and demanding that they return to the correct revolutionary path, they're now calling each other the greatest threat to peace. In the case of China, they no longer call the Soviet leadership revisionists. They start to use the language that it's social imperialist. It's another imperialist country. And I want to talk about a particular incident where they even start to invoke the language that the Soviet leadership is fascist. And Khrushchev and then Brezhnev, for his part, especially, start to make it clear when they're visiting Western capitals like London that there's a struggle against the Mao leadership in China, and they support that struggle to oust Mao. So the struggle devolves into a state-to-state dispute. I want to go, as we talk about that, over some of the markers, and that would be another nuclear arms agreement, the events in Czechoslovakia. Anyway, but let's get started. Your take. Well, I think you've laid the groundwork there pretty clearly. The contradictions that are evolving between China and the Soviet Union, in part, have to do, as we've talked about before, with with different models of economic development. And again, the Soviets see the Chinese as being adventurous, being sort of ultra-leftist, pushing, you know, sort of the mass mobilization line and things like that. And they make it pretty clear that they side with a more 
well, basically bureaucratic or pragmatic approach that relies more on technical expertise and things like that. But that's a matter, you know, of debate within China itself. So there's some differences of policy and orientation in terms of development. But all of that is framed within this context of the global sort of geopolitical situation, which, as you say, is sees the Soviet Union pursuing a program of peaceful coexistence, saying in a sense that in the long run, it will be the superiority of the Soviet socialist system, which will kind of win over the hearts and minds of people around the world. And the exploitation and crises that are inevitable within capitalism will ultimately lead to its destruction. And so in a sense, the Soviet policy is kind of, well, you know, we're just going to ride this out. We're just going to wait and see because we know that ultimately, eventually, we will triumph. And the Chinese, by contrast, having fought and won a very long and arduous revolutionary struggle, having had to defend themselves against the United States in Korea, with the war in Vietnam ramping up on their southern flank, with active covert operations being conducted by the CIA on the China coast and in Tibet, the Chinese are taking a little more a view of things that says that, you know, we really need to maintain and pursue the revolutionary struggle. We need to support revolutionary movements around the world. We need to see American imperialism as a serious challenge. They see the behavior of the Soviets as kind of not exactly giving in to American imperialism, but being willing to tolerate it, being willing to sort of go along and get along for the time being in ways which are frankly inimical to China's interests. And as we talked about last time, the destruction of the Indonesian Communist Party, yet another indication of just how real for the Chinese, just how real that struggle was. It wasn't something that was just uh, you know, a sort of abstract theoretical model. But it was a concrete struggle that was costing millions of lives and threatened the future of China itself. Again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, Ken, but let's also, because we're in the late 60s, talk about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty signing by the Soviet Union and the United States and other signatories. Now, the quid pro quo of the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which ultimately becomes an international treaty in 1969. But the quid pro quo was that the nuclear powers will start to and slowly, gradually, incrementally get rid of their nuclear weapons. And in exchange, the non-nuclear countries won't get nuclear weapons. It's going to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Of course, the nuclear powers actually never do get rid of their nuclear weapons, but it puts extreme pressure on non-nuclear powers so as to not acquire nuclear weapons. Many people in the peace movement and people who care about the environment, people who fear nuclear war, in other words, people who have some degree of right thinking, looked at the NPT and thought, hey, that's great. We're starting to finally bring this unmanaged, uncontrolled nuclear arms race into some sort of managed rivalry that may save the human race from actual destruction in a thermonuclear conflict. But from China's point of view, they're looking at it as basically a sellout on the part of the Soviet Union. Talk about that. Sure. And it's not just from China's point of view. Many of the non-aligned nations saw this, saw the non-proliferation agreement, the earlier test ban agreement, as kind of the existing nuclear powers, the great powers, kind of circling the wagons and saying, you know, uh, things are just fine. We have our nuclear weapons, we have our power, and we don't want anybody else getting that. And countries, certainly China, but countries like India as well, and indeed others, had ambitions of their own to develop nuclear weapons, atomic weapons, in their own self-defense, in their own security. And the idea that the great powers, which of course just happened to be the victorious powers from World War II, with the exception of China, but you know, the United States, France, Britain, and the Soviet Union, these were the big nuclear powers, and they were sort of happy to be a club all by themselves and exclude everybody else from this process. So China saw that again as kind of 
the great power is sort of, you know, getting getting comfortable with each other, working together, trying to chart the future of the world in a way that was now de-escalating, yes, de-escalating the risk of nuclear war, de-escalating the confrontation between the Soviet Union and the United States, but also in that very process, kind of abandoning the cause of revolutionary struggle and the long-term goals of social justice and economic transformation. And for the Chinese, they saw that as a fundamental betrayal of the historical mission of the working class, of the revolution all around the planet. You mentioned earlier, of course, events like the Prague Spring and the intervention by the Soviets in Czechoslovakia in 1968. In that same context, of a kind of working out a spheres of influence agreement, the kind of great power cooperation and collaboration that was inimical to real revolutionary struggle. You know, there was a sort of an agreement that, oh, well, Czechoslovakia is in the Soviet uh, sphere of influence. So pretty much whatever they want to do there is fine with the United States. And the United States would, you know, exercise its power in the areas where it was dominant and everybody could uh, sort of get along with each other. And the Chinese just didn't see that as an acceptable strategy. That's why they characterized the Soviet Union, you know, as a uh, socialist in form, but imperialist in practice, imperialist in action, social imperialism. Yeah, this is an important topic. In 1956, the Soviets also intervened in Hungary, in Eastern Europe. Now, Hungary had been a very fascist country before and during World War II. The Soviet Red Army liberated Hungary And during the 1945-48 period, I think Stalin and the Soviet leadership expected that or hoped that Eastern Europe would be basically neutral countries the way Austria had achieved a certain degree of neutrality. But because of the vicious character of the Cold War, there was no way to actually maintain these neutral countries. The U.S. was, you know, desperate to roll back communism, roll back or contain the Soviet Union. So, the Soviet Union facilitated the communist parties in those countries of Eastern and Central Europe to come to power. Now, it didn't need to do that in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia had an organic revolutionary outcome as a consequence of the leadership of the partisans in World War II. But Hungary had strong support for the Communist Party, but it was still a a very right-wing country. So the idea of having a socialist government sort of imposed from the top led to a lot of cleavages in society and a lot of unexpressed opposition to socialism and communism. And after Khrushchev's 20th Congress in 1956 and the de-Stalinization, there were a series of rebellions in Hungary, in Poland, and other Eastern European countries, anti-communist rebellions. I mean, they were mixed. There were some socialists and communists in them, but the basic leadership was led by counter-revolutionaries. And the United States vigorously supported the Hungarian counter-revolution, and the Soviets and the Warsaw Pact finally moved in and they suppressed the counter-revolution. You know, it was a bad day for socialism to see Soviet troops in a neighboring socialist country. On the other hand, the argument was made that if the counter-revolution had succeeded, it would have brought a hard right semi-fascist regime inside what was then the socialist bloc, and that might have led to other, like a chain of events, similar to what ultimately happened in 1987, 88, 89. So the Soviets intervened in Hungary and China supported the Soviets going into Hungary. And it wasn't really that different from the Soviets going into Czechoslovakia. As a matter of fact, Zhou Enlai, who was the premier of China at that time said, And this is the contradictoriness, I would say, of this Chinese foreign policy at this time. He says, the aim of the Soviet revisionist leading clique in brazenly invading and occupying Czechoslovakia is to prevent the Czechoslovak revisionist clique from directly hiring itself out to Western capitalists headed by U.S. imperialism and to prevent this state of affairs from giving rise to an uncontrollable chain reaction along the lines of what I said, a counter-revolution in Czechoslovakia spreading to Hungary, spreading, you know, to East Germany. So in 56, the Chinese, again, yes, they didn't support spheres of influence per se, 
but they did support the Soviet intervention. They were still part of the socialist camp. I mean, for me at least, Ken, it seems to me that sociologically, it's basically the same series of events in 1968. But now the breakup of the socialist camp, the loss of trust, the fear, apprehension, and the devolution of an ideological political struggle into a state-to-state dispute meant that the Chinese party, unlike Hungary, doesn't support the Soviet Union. And Zhou Enlai is saying the Soviets are trying to prevent counter-revolution. And at the same time, they say by intervening against the counter-revolution, it demonstrates that the Soviets are, quote, social imperialist, which from my point of view is a big political mistake and accelerates the devolution in China's political outlook towards a state-to-state characterization of the dispute rather than an ideological dispute, such that it opens the door finally to Western imperialism, seeing that these comrades are not fighting as comrades, they're fighting as hostile adversary states, and that provides an opening. Anyway, that's my thought. Yeah, I think that what we see in that shift from 1956 to 1968, that's part of a very complicated kind of tortuous route that Chinese foreign policy takes during this period. And I think that it relates to the efforts that Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai and others are trying to make to assess what the state of play is in the global arena. You know, that China's feeling very isolated, China's feeling threatened, the Vietnam War is still escalating into the South, and they're trying to determine, you know, in a sort of theoretical way, you know, what's the primary contradiction? I mean, for all the previous period of the PRC, it was pretty obvious that the primary contradiction in the world was the contradiction between socialism and capitalism, between the socialist bloc and the capitalist world led by American imperialism. But now they're questioning that. And I think that that's not a clear course of development. I don't think it's a clearly resolved set of issues. And I think that the statement that you read there from Zhou Enlai is a perfect expression of that, because both the Soviets and the Czechs are being characterized as revisionists. The Soviets are being labeled as this sort of social imperialism. And I think that Zhou Enlai in that statement is kind of trying to have it both ways. And that certainly is an indication of the unresolved thinking on the part of the Chinese leadership, which, of course, is itself at this period in the midst of the Cultural Revolution, trying to sort out profound questions within the Communist Party, within the developmental itinerary of China, that it's not a great moment to be struggling with these issues. And we see that the relationship with the Soviet Union, you know, is about to deteriorate even further to the point where there's open military conflict on the border in a couple of sectors up in Heilongjiang and out in Xinjiang, where there's actual military conflict in the early months of 1969, in the wake of these events in 1968. So it's a time of flux, and I think, frankly, a time of confusion on the part of the Chinese leadership that results in these kinds of jumbled up messages that statement by Zhou Enlai is a good example of. Right, because the Soviet Union, its sociological character, its class character, its social being is the same in 1968 or 1962 or 1958 or 1956 during the events in Hungary. It's the same. It's the same Communist Party. It's got public property. It's not driven by capitalist corporations. It's the same, whatever you want to call it. I would call it a socialist government in the sense that it aspired towards socialism. It had a planned economy. It had the monopoly on foreign trade. It had public ownership of the means of production. It was not motivated or driven by the capitalist profit system. It was the same entity. So the characterization by the Chinese of social imperialism, which means that in the Leninist sense, in the Marxist sense, imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism. It's capitalism in its monopoly epic. And the Soviet Union was not that. So they took up a polemical, I mean, Lenin called the Social Democrats in 1914, the Social Democrats in Germany, Kautsky and the others who didn't 
oppose their own capitalist government's entrance into World War I. That's where the formulation social imperialist comes from. Lenin said, these people are socialists in words, Kautsky meaning, and the others, most of the socialist leaders who capitulated to the war drive, they're socialists in words, but they're imperialists in deeds, meaning they're not willing to stand up and fight back against their own imperialist government when it's going to war, when the war hysteria is so great. Okay, that's a polemical sort of sally, so to speak, on Lenin's part against Kautsky. But what China was doing by adopting the same language was actually not only characterizing the political formation of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union, but actually applying a false sociological analysis of a worker state, of a socialist government, and now saying the socialist government isn't just revisionist, it's not just opportunist, it's actually on the other side. And once you make that ideological presentation that the Soviets, in fact, are not just bad comrades or opportunist comrades, but they're actually the enemy, then the whole sort of range of options in terms of what's acceptable in terms of a foreign policy orientation shifts. And indeed, as we can see, and as we will see as we continue this march through history, China is sort of exiting the socialist camp altogether. And Nixon and Kissinger being astute imperialist politicians, and especially at the time of the 1969 border clashes that you mentioned, where Soviet troops and Chinese troops are now shooting each other. They're shooting each other. And it's not out of control skirmishes, but they're real battles. And that's when Nixon and Kissinger craft an orientation that says, look, now we can play both of these socialist giants off of each other. It's this like the ultimate cynicism. The U.S. was scaring China by asserting its rapprochement and normalization with the Soviet Union. And then as China becomes more and more frightened that there's a Soviet U.S. axis against China, China starts to characterize the Soviets as part of the imperialist game. And then the imperialists come back and say, oh, why don't we start to talk? Yeah, I think that there's one other factor that plays into that sort of ongoing calculus of power there, which is the turning of the tide in a sense, or at least the sort of visible transformation that takes place in the American position in Vietnam. The Tet Offensive in February of 1968 breaks the mythology of the American military elite of saying, you know, we're winning the hearts and minds, we're going to, you know, we're going to prevail, we're controlling more and more territory, all this. The Tet Offensive puts paid to that rhetoric. And in part, that contributes, I think, to a further shift in perspective on the part of the Chinese leadership who now, to a certain degree, begin to view American imperialism perhaps as a bit of a spent force, that American imperialism is now in a period of decline. American imperialism is going to lose the war in Vietnam, which of course it does. And American imperialism is now maybe even going on the defensive as the tide of national liberation struggles and the tide of revolutionary movements around the world may be on the rise. And so there's a shift in the thinking that now the contradiction with the United States, the contradiction with American imperialism, while it certainly hasn't gone away, is no longer being viewed by the Chinese leadership as the primary focus, you know, the thing to which other things have to be subordinated. But instead, they come up with this idea that using this rhetoric of the Soviet Union as social imperialism, that now the contradiction with the Soviet Union has become the primary contradiction, has become the overriding determiner in their geopolitical calculations. And so the overture to the United States that starts with the ping pong diplomacy in Japan and then leads to Kissinger's secret visit in the fall of 71, and finally, of course, to Nixon's open visit in February of 72. That stuff flows out of this shift in the sense of what the real primary issue is. And for at least a period of time, and I don't think this lasts, but for a period of time, the Chinese leadership makes the determination and acts on that determination that they're going to play the American card 
against the Soviets. So, you know, it's a complex triangular relationship in which, you know, what had been this close fraternal alliance of the Soviets and the Chinese back in the 50s has now been transformed into a situation where, you know, Richard Nixon, the sort of poster boy for American imperialism, you know, is welcomed in Beijing, shaking hands with Zhou Enlai as he gets off the airplane in a very symbolic gesture that completely turns the geopolitical tables and puts the Soviet Union as China's principal antagonist. And of course, as you were just saying, that the Americans are playing this in the most cynical possible way, as imperialism does. But it's a dramatic shift that causes deep contradictions, causes deep frictions within the Chinese leadership itself. Let's really just take a minor detour and talk about that, because you're referring to Lin Biao. Well, you know, Lin Biao, the whole story of Lin Biao's career, his rise in the military, his replacement of Peng Dehuai as defense minister back in the summer of 1959, a lot of that had been based upon his approach to military theory, the theory of people's war, the idea of the People's Liberation Army as a people's army, as a force that was integrated with the masses. That had been central to his rise and to his position within the Chinese leadership. And of course, to see the military as a political force itself, the whole development of the Red Book, the sayings of Chairman Mao, the quotations from Chairman Mao, you know, was part of the political education that was originally produced by the political department of the PLA, and then, of course, became much more widespread in the course of the Cultural Revolution. And part of that had been a tension, the tension between Lin Biao and Peng Dehuai as military leaders, because Peng Dehuai had been associated with a more Soviet style professionalization model of the People's Liberation Army. And that had been part of those internal divisions within the Chinese leadership back in the 50s and the early 60s. But Lin Biao, apparently, and we don't know a lot of the details of this, but certainly one reasonably coherent interpretation of these events was that Lin Biao saw this shift of Chinese policy, of the Chinese position away from viewing the Soviets as a fraternal ally, or at least a fraternal partner, to a more antagonistic position, and the shift, the idea of some sort of reconciliation or playing the American card with Western imperialism, that he saw this as unacceptable. And he felt that the Chinese leadership, and Chairman Mao in particular, was making a very serious miscalculation, a very serious political error. And that's what may have triggered whatever it is that specifically happened in the break between Mao and Lin Biao in 1970 that results in Lin Biao dying in an airplane crash in Mongolia, apparently trying to make his way to the Soviet Union. So, you know, as I said, we don't know all the ins and outs of the details of this, but clearly there were deep disagreements and deep contradictions within the leadership. And again, all of this in the context of the Cultural Revolution and the turmoil associated with that. So I think that understanding that this reorientation in Chinese foreign policy, the opening to the United States, the deep rupture with the Soviets, that particular moment at the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s was one that was fraught with its own internal contradictions. Indeed. And just for those who may be less familiar with this topic, Lin Biao was actually named. He was identified in legal documents as the heir successor to Mao Zedong. So he wasn't just another important person. He was named during the Cultural Revolution that should Mao be incapacitated or die, that he would assume the leadership of the party. So this break in 1969, 1970, as Nixon and the American imperialists are starting to reach out vis-a-vis -vis diplomatic connections with Pakistan. We'll maybe be able to go into some of that. But the opening, the thaw between the U.S. and China, the early stages are happening. Lin Biao clearly, or again, a lot of it is obscured because of the way the Chinese presented it. He apparently, as one of the left-wing forces in the Chinese Communist Party, objects there's a falling out, there's a defection or a leaving, he dies in a plane crash along with his wife. Mao actually, in the discussions that come later with 
Nixon in 1972, he alludes to your intelligence, meaning U.S. and British intelligence was correct, he says, or more or less correct, that there was people who opposed our policy, he's talking about, meaning the opening to Nixon, opposed our policy, and they tried to fly somewhere, and the Soviet Union dug up their corpses in Mongolia, but didn't make any public comment on it. So Mao is sort of alluding to it. And again, you can't really know, but the fact that he's alluding to it in his discussions, now declassified discussions with Nixon, seems to verify that. So there's a split or a struggle inside of China. Numerous political divisions are taking place. There was the great proletarian cultural revolution that starts in 1966. Mao, along with Lin Biao and the People's Liberation Army being part of that sort of leftist push during 1966 that really came to an end. Well, it doesn't formally come to an end for a decade, but the the height of it certainly was ended by 1969. And China is making this reorientation slowly at first, quietly behind the scenes. But then, as you say, Ken, and this is where I want to sort of conclude, it leads to Kissinger coming to China secretly and meeting repeatedly in secret with the Chinese to set the stage for Richard Nixon to come to China in 1972. Now, I want to also explain, and you can, because you were at Kent State, you had been indicted for anti-war activities after the massacre at Kent State. So you were part and parcel of, as a key organizer in the anti-Vietnam War protest movement, I'll tell you what I thought at the time, how I felt as an organizer. I was very young, of course, and politically young and politically immature. But nonetheless, when Nixon, who we considered to be the worst war criminal in the world, the second one being Henry Kissinger, arrive in China and are clinking champagne glasses with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai, and the Chinese are playing turkey in the straw, And at the same time, the U.S. was carpet bombing Vietnam because the Vietnamese during that period in the winter and spring of 72 were carrying out what they hoped would be the final offensive, the National Liberation Front in the North Vietnamese Army and guerrillas, the final offensive to evict American imperialism from Vietnam. The idea that Nixon would be there and being toasted as a kind of a wonderful, peaceful person, I have to say it was shocking. It was shocking for those of us who had read the Little Red Book or Lin Piao's Long Live the Victory of People's War. You know, American leftists all over the world were studying those tracks, those documents. We felt we were part of a global current that was in some ways anchored in China. And so it was discordant. But of course, we were politically immature. We didn't, I mean, we couldn't have even contemplated it before it happened. Anyway, it was a big political shock. Absolutely. I mean, the images, the pictures on television of the president's motorcade going from the airport down into the city of Beijing and all those uh, images of banquets and toasting and everything, it was psychologically very difficult because the war, of course, in Vietnam was still going on. We were still marching in the streets, the huge mobilization demonstrations in Washington, D.C., half a million people and more, you know, demanding an end to the war and the horrible cynicism of American negotiations in Paris with the Vietnamese where they just protracted the war on and on. And, and of course, the Christmas bombing, December of 1972, after Nixon had been to China, all of it, it was pretty horrifying. And I think that for those of us who thought of ourselves, you know, as revolutionaries, as socialists, trying to be part of this, what we had felt was a global movement, it required a lot of stamina, I think, to to sort of come through that period. You know, I think in some ways, one might hope at the time that what it represented was the strength of China, the strength of the revolutionary movement that here, you know, even as America was being defeated in Vietnam, here was Nixon going to China. And that gesture when he gets off the airplane and shakes Zhou Enlai's hand, you know, that was a very deliberate symbolic act because back in 1954 in Geneva, when the Chinese were part of the negotiations to end the French war in Vietnam, 
the American Secretary of State at the time had refused to shake Zhou Enlai's hand. And this was a big snub that was noted in the press at the time. So Nixon, you know, bounces off the stairs there from his airplane and steps right up and shakes Zhou Enlai's hand. It was possible to try to spin that as, you know, here's the Americans as the supplicants coming to China. But that was pretty illusory and certainly not something that could be maintained very long. It did, on the other hand, you know, this did allow China eventually to take its seat at the United Nations. It shifted eventually by the end of the 70s with the full diplomatic recognition of China. It did create a more justifiable position for China in the international order. But it certainly was a psychologically contradictory experience to go through from the late 60s to the early 70s and to have Richard Nixon being feted in the great hall of the people just seemed remarkably unreal or surreal in so many ways. Yeah, it was jarring. And, you know, I had at that time, 1972, I... You know, there was so much interest in socialism and anti-imperialism and Marxism at the time. All of us who were very, very, very young people, teenagers really, were, you know, always in the middle of this or that political argument or polemic. But I can remember that those who were in the Maoist movement and defending this were making the argument that Nixon was coming to Beijing on his knees that the imperialists had not wanted to recognize China. They had deprived China of its seat at the UN. You know, everything the U.S. had said and done about China to put China in a corner was being undone. So I understood the validity of it, but I felt at that time that what was really happening was that Nixon was playing the Soviets and the Chinese off of each other. The U.S. was desperate because not only could they not win in Vietnam, they were going to be militarily defeated. And the only way the Americans could sort of have peace with honor, as Nixon always said, which is a complete oxymoron in terms of when you think about how the war was conducted, carpet bombing endlessly the people of Vietnam. But really what was happening was the Vietnamese weren't ready to negotiate anything other than their complete and absolute victory with reuniting Vietnam. But as you can see, and as we can see from these documents, these now declassified documents, And people can see them for themselves at the University of Southern California, U.S. China Institute. There's a whole collection of Mao Zedong, Richard Nixon, Zhou Enlai, Henry Kissinger documents that the whole thinking, the calculation of Nixon and Kissinger was that the Soviets would be afraid of a U.S.-China relationship. The Chinese were afraid, always afraid, and had been afraid through the whole last 15 years of a U.S. Soviet alliance against China, and that by pitting them now in full struggle against each other, and of course, the U.S. didn't stop reaching out to the Soviet Union, the so-called period of detente increased, that the U.S. could convince both China and the Soviets to put pressure on the Vietnamese to sign the deal, sign the Paris peace treaty that Kissinger had negotiated, that the Vietnamese knew in the long run If we don't sign it, we will win. They didn't want to have what happened to Korea, where there was the partition of the country permanently, which is partly how the Korean War ended. The Vietnamese were prepared to fight and fight and fight until final victory, but they needed the support. I mean, you can't shoot down B-52 bombers flying at 30,000 feet above North Vietnam with bows and arrows. You need surface-to-air missiles. They came from the Soviet Union. The military aid from the Soviet Union and China was decisive. And you can see that the imperialists really did then put this China-US-Soviet triangular competition as to put pressure onto the Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese, in fact, signed the treaty. But it turned out, as history would have it, that as soon as the treaty was signed and the US left, the US troops left in 1973, and Nixon came down and was you know, forced to resign rather than be impeached in 74. The Vietnamese just went for it anyway. And in fact, finally and ultimately liberated all of Vietnam and the U.S. military, the remnants of it and their Saigon puppets were routed in the most ignominious ways. So, you know, history was on the side of Vietnam. But again, for our listener today, this is a context that was very 
very disappointing, really, for those around the world who had mobilized with complete solidarity with the cause of the Vietnamese people to reclaim their own country. Yes, it was a dispiriting time. I remember feeling very excited and very pleased, of course, with the eventual liberation of southern Vietnam and the victory of the Vietnamese people. And I felt that, you know, the American anti-war movement had at least to some degree contributed to that. And that felt like a great outcome, a great victory. But the course of events with China was just so so difficult to make sense of. And as you say, I mean, the Americans went along playing both sides, playing with the Soviets, playing now with the Chinese. And really, the Americans came out of that in the best shape. American imperialism was not, as Chairman Mao perhaps had thought for a while, a spent force. It was certainly in difficulties. And Nixon apparently was able to have this idea, have this conception that by opening to China, he would, even though I think they already knew that they were going to lose in Vietnam, that they would salvage their international position in a way that certainly proved to be true. Even as he went down, personally, his political fortunes collapsed. But American imperialism struggled on and recovered. And of course, in the Reagan years, went on to achieve its final destruction of the Soviet socialist system. And Premier Zhou Enlai moves forward to greet the first American president to set foot on Chinese soil. The handshake bridges 16,000 miles and 22 years of hostility. There are no welcoming speeches, no formal ceremonies, just a receiving line made up of Communist Party officials and the military band playing the Star-Spangled Banner. In summary, again, we have the period of the 1950s where China is part of a central part of the second most important part of the socialist bloc that was led by the Soviet Union and anchored by the Soviet Union, but included the governments of Eastern Europe the Central and Eastern European Socialist Governments, also the government of North Korea, the government of North Vietnam. China is part and parcel of the socialist camp. In the 1960s, there is the Sino-Soviet dispute that begins as an ideological battle between comrades over how to deal with the problems posed by U.S. imperialist pressure on both China and the Soviet Union. And that ideological struggle gives way by the late 1960s to a struggle not between comrades, but a struggle between states, states that have armies. And in fact, there's even military clashes along the Soviet-Chinese border in 1969. And then we have begun our examination of China's foreign policy in the 1970s, Richard Nixon watching and exploiting the division between the Soviet Union and China opens the door to China, or China opens the door to the United States. But U.S. policy changes. The U.S. recognizes that Taiwan is part of China. The United States supports the eviction of the rump government led by Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan from the Security Council. Thus, the People's Republic of China takes its rightful seat at the United Nations in the Security Council. And where we left off, Ken, in the mid-1970s, the Chinese are no longer really, this is again under the leadership of Mao, Mao was still alive in 1975. The Chinese clearly by an examination of the conversations between Mao and Henry Kissinger and Mao and Gerald Ford, they become skeptical. They believe the US is playing the China card against the Soviet Union and the Soviet card against China. They no longer really believe that the United States will live up to what it said earlier in their earlier discussions that the United States would actually be a true ally of China. But nonetheless, we're in the mid-1970s. Mao Zedong dies in 1976. Zhou Enlai, the other formidable you know, leader of China and Chinese foreign policy died the year earlier. And there's a power struggle in China. The so-called Gang of Four, the Maoists, including Mao's wife, are imprisoned. They're put on trial. And China resumes an effort to explore 
better relations with the United States. Now, China is an ally of Cambodia, or what was at that time called Kampuchea, led by the government led by Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Vietnam, which is the most powerful part of the Laotian, Cambodian, Vietnamese, that Southeast Asian or Indo-Chinese communist movement, they are aligned with the Soviet Union. And there's also a struggle between Pol Pot and the Cambodians or the Kampuchean government and Vietnam, border clashes, shooting starts, and this conflict, which in some ways becomes a proxy for the Soviet-Chinese conflict, erupts into military clashes. And then Vietnam makes this decisive move in December 1978 and invades Cambodia. And being more powerful than the Cambodians or the Kampucheans is able to oust the Pol Pot government and create a new Vietnamese-friendly government. And again, that was a big shock to people who had supported Vietnam and, of course, Cambodia. But it showed that the struggle between the socialist countries had degenerated even further. And of course, it makes a big, big impact on Chinese foreign policy. In many ways, China considers the invasion of Cambodia by Vietnam to be a direct confrontation with China itself. Anyway, let's pick up from there. Do you agree, first of all, with my framing of this question? Oh, I think so. Just to start from the point where you were getting to, you know, the United States had been defeated by the Vietnamese and had to withdraw from Southeast Asia, or not all of Southeast Asia, but certainly from the theater of war. And Vietnam was, you know, pursuing its course of reunification after 1975. But just across the border in Cambodia, and of course, Cambodia had also been devastated by American imperialism, not just since the invasion in 1970, but even before that. But the alignments of Vietnam and Cambodia, as you say, had taken on a place within this larger division within the socialist world that Vietnam had certainly during the war had tried to maintain good relations with both Soviet Union and China, but clearly was more closely affiliated with the Soviets. Cambodia, well before the Pol Pot regime under King Sihanouk and under the earlier governments before Pol Pot, before the Khmer Rouge, had long had a close affiliation with China. So the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia on one level certainly was an expression of these divisions that had emerged within the socialist camp. It was also, of course, it reminds us that there continue to be what I suppose we might think of as nationalist or even ethnic divisions that inflect the politics of the socialist world as well. One of the reasons that Vietnam gave for its invasion of Cambodia was the moves that the Khmer Rouge government had been taking against ethnic Vietnamese living in Cambodia. So Vietnam sort of made this a protective gesture. They intervened in order to protect their own people, even though they were Cambodian citizens, but they were ethnically Vietnamese. So it's a complex mix of motivations. But all of that reflects, as you say, the sort of deterioration or erosion of solidarity, which had been characteristic of the socialist bloc prior to this. And I think that in some ways, that's an outgrowth of what proved to be a somewhat transient perception of you know, the decline of American imperialism. The American defeat in Vietnam certainly made it appear that American imperialism was a kind of a spent force, was no longer going to be quite so much of a challenge. And perhaps that took some of the pressure off the socialist camp and allowed some of these internal divisions to intensify and become certainly more visible, but also more active. I mean, for Vietnam to invade Cambodia, and then in 1979, China invades Vietnam, all of these confrontations are emerging at a point where, at least for a while, there was this sense of the fading away of the American threat. Now, that proves to be illusory. That proves to be a misreading of that immediate situation. American imperialism certainly had been defeated, but it regroups and certainly does not abandon its efforts to maintain its position as a global hegemon. 
But I think that we can see some of these divisions, this intensification of these divisions in the socialist camp within that context of a temporary sort of dip in the menace of American imperialism. But I also think that what you said early on is really critical, which is that China by this time was looking at the actualities of American conduct through the 70s. And at the beginning in 71, 72, when those negotiations took place that culminated in Nixon's visit, China I think uh, the Chinese leadership really thought that the United States would become more closely affiliated with China and take a more a more stringently hostile attitude towards the Soviet Union. But that's not at all what happened. The U.S. continued to negotiate with the Soviets and really tried to, in a sense, increase the alienation between the Chinese and the Soviets in their own interest, in the interest of American imperialism. And the Chinese were able to read that and perceive that. But of course, as the whole strategic environment shifted and the Soviet Union faced its own challenges, that it all became much more complicated and much more disrupted as we get down to the end of the 70s. And this entire decade is filled with so many ironies, and I would say bitter ironies for people on the left as well. One of them is that under Nixon's leadership, and to some extent, Gerald Ford, who took his place after he resigned rather than be impeached, part of the policy as the United States was playing the Soviet Union against China and China against the Soviet Union, in other words, classic divide and conquer, The U.S. had relaxed its relationship with the Soviet Union. There was what was called at that time the era of detente. So Nixon has like an accommodation with China, but at the same time pursuing detente, meaning a relaxation of tensions. Seems to the Soviet leadership, the Cold War was ending. As a matter of fact, at that time, or not a little bit afterwards, I was in a discussion with the Soviet, I believe it was the Soviet ambassador to the United Nations. And I said, what was the best period? This was in 1976 or 77. I said, what was the best period for U.S.-Soviet relations? And he said, oh, that would be 1972. And I'm thinking to myself as a young radical person, how could that be a period of normalization and peace when the U.S. is bombing the hell out of Vietnam? How could that be the best period? But for the Soviets who were pursuing a policy of peaceful coexistence. Yes, they supported Vietnam. Yes, they supported the ANC in South Africa. Yes, they supported Cuba against the blockade. They did these things to challenge imperialism, but they were really, really looking for better relations or a relaxation of tensions with the U.S. And so that's the policy that Nixon and Kissinger were playing. That was their orientation. The Soviets needed wheat. The American farmers were allowed to sell wheat. But then in 1974, after Nixon is gone, there's a big right-wing backlash in America to any relations with the Soviet Union. That's when the Jackson-Varnick Amendment is passed. Let's just talk about how this the irony of ironies, the bitter ironies, is that because Nixon, as an imperialist tactic to divide the two socialist countries, relaxes tensions with both, and that stirs this right-wing anti-Soviet wave that actually overcame the period of detente. And by the time Jimmy Carter becomes president in 1977, the period of detente is largely over, although not fully over. Right. The end of the 70s, of course, sees a re-engagement of the Americans with China. The final recognition of China in January of 1979 under President Carter launches a new phase. And of course, by that time, there have been significant changes in the Chinese leadership itself. You know, it's never been clear to me to what extent American policymakers really appreciated what was happening in Beijing between 1976 and 1978 while those final negotiations were going on. But in retrospect, you know, we certainly see that China was poised on the verge of a major reorientation or reconfiguration of its developmental policies. And of course, that will lead in the 80s 
to a new phase of relations between China and the United States. But in the late 70s, yeah, as American attitudes towards the Soviet Union once again begin to shift, not as dramatically as they will under Reagan after the 1980 election, but that's the threshold, I suppose, of entering into yet another phase of these long and kind of triangular relationships. I want to spend one more moment on the bitter ironies of that period. As Mao dies, or shortly thereafter, or really even before Mao's death, as the Chinese now view what they call Soviet social imperialism as the main danger, before they said the Soviet Union was capitulating to imperialism, it was soft on imperialism, now the position is the Soviet Union itself is an imperialist country, and all, all the Maoists are trying to write these ridiculous books about why capitalism had actually been restored in the Soviet unions, why it was scientifically correct to describe the Soviet Union as an imperialist and thus a capitalist country. All of these extended and I'd say fairly ridiculous polemics. When I say Maoists, I don't mean people in China. I'm talking about you know all the Maoist parties, including those in the United States. They wrote books and said, ah, yes, the Soviet Union is imperialist and it's imperialist because Capitalism has been restored in the Soviet Union, even though that was complete and utter nonsense. <laughs> but when you look at that period, the U.S., and this goes back also partly to what you were saying about the perception that American imperialism is a spent force. The U.S. loses in Vietnam. It's lost in Cambodia. It loses in Laos. In 1974, there's an uprising of the workers in Portugal and the pro well, not pro, the fascist government in Portugal is toppled and the weakness in Portugal is largely stimulated by the national liberation movements in Portuguese colonies in Africa, that meaning Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau. So there's a revolution in Portugal and then the national liberation movements actually, now that there's been a revolution, an anti-fascist revolution in Portugal, they go for it. They're going to reclaim their countries to be independent. And many of them are led by Marxists like the MPLA in Angola or Samora Michel in Mozambique. And in the other Portuguese colony, Amalcar Cabral is leading the struggle in Guinea-Bissau. So there are Marxist movements in Africa struggling to take power. Now, there are other really important developments that happened in 1977, communists take power in Ethiopia. In 1978, the Afghan government is transformed by a socialist takeover of power, and it aligns with the Soviet Union. In February 1978, the American dictator puppet Shah of Iran is toppled by a people's revolution. In July 1979, the Sandinistas overthrow a U.S. puppet dictator Somoza, and take power. When you look at that period, 73 to 79, it looks like American imperialism is really in decline, that it really might be a spent force. But the irony, the bitter irony, is that as the Chinese adopt this position that the Soviet Union is an imperialist country and the main enemy, Chinese foreign policy starts to take the side of U.S. imperialism and its allies in the struggle against the MPLA in Angola, in Mozambique, a dramatic reorientation. And for those of us who had always supported China and Vietnam and the socialist bloc, and of course, the national liberation movements in Africa and Latin America and elsewhere, it was a shock to see China basically on the other side. Well, and I think, you know, that goes all the way back, I recall, all the way back to the 1973 coup in Chile, when China gave diplomatic recognition to the military regime. You know, I remember being very upset by that, very shocked by that. But certainly those late 70s decisions that the Chinese made, the situation in Angola, and of course, the Cubans had sent tremendous assistance to the liberation struggle in Angola. And to have China kind of come down on what very much felt like the wrong side. It was pretty disheartening, to say the least. And just as the Chinese had said wrongly that the Soviet Union was an imperialist capitalist power because it became an overdrawn ideological struggle, the people who were aligned with the Soviet Union or with these national liberation movements who were 
basically shocked and certainly very, very upset by China's change in foreign policy. They then extended their characterization of China as being also a capitalist country, also a country that was working with imperialism, meaning part of the enemy. So the sociological estimate of what the People's Republic of China was basically altered because people were upset with the political turn of China. But in fact, the Chinese social system was the same social system. It's just that the policy, not the system, but the policy had changed. And as we go through the different stages and phases of China's foreign policy, I think this is extremely important to remember because if you conflate your sociological estimate, that is the political and class character of a government because you don't like a particular policy, you end up by mischaracterizing a bad policy from a socialist government with the social system itself, you end up becoming one, an enemy of the social system, and two, that allows those who take that position to end up in the wrong side when imperialism turns. You know, as we can see later, when imperialism turns decisively against China, a great number of people in the US left said, oh, China, there's nothing left to support. These are two enemy countries, two equally oppressive countries. Again, it's a reminder of how important it is to have an independent class analysis of a country that allows you to support the social system, even while you retain an independent and perhaps at times critical attitude towards its policies, not the system itself. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important perspective to keep in mind because, you know, the late 70s, of course, is a period in China when there's a transformation in leadership because of the death of Zhou Enlai and Chairman Mao, and then the arrest of the Gang of Four. And then after a couple of years of internal maneuvering, the reemergence of Deng Xiaoping, and then the enunciation of what become the policies of reform and opening to the outside. You know, that is also bound up with this same period where we see these foreign policy decisions being made by the Chinese leadership. And I think, yes, that many people, many comrades, you know, who had long been supporters of China and advocates of China sort of throw up their hands and say, oh, well, China has capitulated to capitalism and now we're going to have to condemn them in the same way that we would condemn the Soviet Union. And so, you know, it goes from a situation where there had been all of this solidarity between the Chinese and the Soviets back in the 50s. Now, by the time you get down to the end of the 70s, and especially in the 1980s, for many on the Western left, there comes to be kind of a new conflation of China and the Soviet Union as both having taken the capitalist road. And I think that, as you say, it very much affects the posture that people take towards China. And again, as you say, it's a reading down from the policy level to the level of what's the actual organization of the society and the state and the economy, that it's an idealist, it's almost a Hegelian inversion of what the realities of the Chinese system were and remain. So before we leave the 70s, I want to go back to what you mentioned earlier and what I had alluded to. In January 1979, Deng Xiaoping comes to the United States. He lands in Atlanta. Of course, Jimmy Carter's from Georgia. He meets with Jimmy Carter in the White House and a few weeks later invades Vietnam. Now, I can't, again, for our audience that is from the left, that who are socialists, I can't overstate how depressing this was, that Deng Xiaoping is being embraced by Jimmy Carter. And at the same time, he undoubtedly consulted or informed, I think there's clear historical evidence of this, conferred with Carter, letting him know that the Chinese were about to invade Vietnam. The purpose of the invasion of Vietnam was to force Vietnam to leave Cambodia or to make some new arrangement so that China's allies in Cambodia would return to power. It was payback for the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in 1978, the removal of the Pol Pot government. It was a short war. If China, which is such a larger country than Vietnam, thought they would succeed quickly, they didn't. The Vietnamese, who had been fighting for 40 years, fought very tenaciously and 
it was a short-lived war. But it was, I felt, Ken, at the time, I have to say, saying this in the context of being supporters of the socialist project in China, as well as the Soviet Union, as well as Cambodia, as well as Vietnam, this was a dark moment. This was a gloomy outcome that after American imperialism appeared to be defeated in Southeast Asia and revolutions were taking place all over the world to have the great People's Republic of China send its military into Vietnam just after Vietnam had reunited as an independent socialist country, it seemed like, well, it seemed like such a betrayal, no other way to put it. Anyway, you were politically active at that time. You were involved in politics as well as education. What was your reaction? Well, as you say, I mean, after 1975, we were jubilant that those of us who had, you know, fought in the anti-war movement and supported the liberation struggle of the Vietnamese people for years, to have that struggle come to victory, have the country be reunified, this was a glorious sort of outcome. And we were feeling very positive about that. And then just a few years later, of course, the death of Chairman Mao had been a blow in some ways. And just a few years later, to have China, which we had also supported and been very engaged with and seen as a beacon of hope, you know, to have China and Vietnam be at war with one another, it was really kind of incomprehensible. It was disoriented. It was disheartening. It was the sort of thing that, you know, you just you just didn't want to try to have a conversation with people about because, you know, one was at a loss as to how you could explain something like this. How did you make sense of something like this? It was indeed, as you say, it was a very dark moment. In fact, in New York City, there were very large demonstrations by progressive leftists who supported Vietnam and who had previously been supporting China. There were big demonstrations at the Chinese embassy at the United Nations in support of Vietnam and to condemn this invasion by China into Vietnam. The war ends after about 18 days. Many thousands of people had died nonetheless, though. It ends in a stalemate. China clearly wasn't intending to invade and overturn Vietnam. It was, again, trying to use military power as leverage against the Vietnamese. That didn't really work. But I want to also mention that, you know, as China's foreign policy is going through these very dynamic shifts and changes, so too is a struggle inside the American imperialist establishment to try to overcome what appears to be the real decline of the standing and status of American imperialism. And we've talked about that. So in 1979, the right wing, the military industrial complex, big oil, they started mounting a massive campaign to stop the communist winning streak, as General Al Haig put it, and to overcome through the remilitarization of America and taking a very hard line against the Soviet Union to reverse what seemed to be the devolving status of American imperialism and the dynamically developing prospects for the Soviet Union and world socialism. And so in 1979, this lobby in Washington and around the country demanded that the Carter administration stop any new arms agreements with the Soviet Union and instead remilitarize and plan for war. Right before Deng Xiaoping comes to Washington and meets with Jimmy Carter, a full page ad appeared in the New York Times by something called the Committee on the Present Danger. And this is really the military and the military industrial complex. It was a letter signed by 170 retired generals and admirals. Again, it appeared as a full page ad on January 21st, 1979. And it basically is demanding that Carter change course. It's a hostile letter to Carter, even though it's addressed to dear Mr. President. But in the letter, which demands that the U.S. take a hard line against the Soviet Union, against socialism, and to remilitarize, rearm America, and of course, Reagan comes in the next year and does just that with the support of this military. He doubles the U.S. military budget, becomes highly aggressive towards the Soviet Union, places tactical nuclear weapons all over Europe with a flight time of six minutes to their target in the Soviet Union. And that is what in turn created the anti-nuclear movement, a global anti-nuclear movement, but one that was very, very strong in the 80s in Europe because it looked like the U.S. 
was getting ready for nuclear war. Detente was giving way to the next Cold War. Well, in this letter, the 170 admirals and generals say, I want to read one sentence from the letter to Carter. Quote, Soviet imperial objectives appear to include the neutralization of Western Europe in part by denying it access to critical raw materials, the encirclement of China, and the isolation of the United States. So here's the right wing, the military industrial complex, clearly signaling the Chinese government, we consider you to be right at the center of the new constellation of forces. It's Western Europe, meaning NATO. It's the United States, meaning, of course, the United States as the anchor of world imperialism. And you, China, we are all the victims of Soviet expansionism and Soviet imperialism. And you, Jimmy Carter, have to stop being so soft and weak and get to it and start the process of remilitarization. From the point of view of the Chinese leadership, when they read all this, and they're obviously paying close attention to every detail in American policy change, they might be thinking, well, this is good. This means that we're going to be really integrated into the world economy. The West is going to really open up to us. The West considers us a real ally. The defense of China is even identified by these 170 right-wing you know, militarists, generals and admirals that they want to defend us against the Soviet Union. This means that our path to development is opening up because under these circumstances, we might be able to, instead of being sanctioned and boycotted and excluded from the world economy, integrated into the world economy. And it's precisely at that time and under these political circumstances that the Chinese government starts the process of what becomes the opening up of China. Let's just talk again about the intersection here of what appears to be a changed global political environment and also how it sort of dovetails with or intersects with China's real goal in all of this, which is to overcome economic underdevelopment. Well, I think, you know, that letter and this initiative by these right-wing militarists, as you say, it's a perfect sort of threshold moment positioning things right before the election of 1980, which brings in Ronald Reagan as the new president and launches this era of the rise of neoliberalism as the new dominant sort of political culture in the Western imperialist world. And of course, you know, the Thatcher administration was a sort of mini rehearsal for this across the Atlantic, but it's the rise of the Reaganistas and their neoliberal ideology that transforms what's going on within the United States. It transforms American political culture in ways that have stayed with us ever since. It moves the entire political conversation in the United States to the right. And it's at that point that this idea of seeing China as a sort of outlying component of America's new position, really, this is what animates a lot of what happens in the 1980s. And it dovetails perfectly with what's going on in China with their desire to open up to the global system a bit in order to draw in investment, in order to draw in new productive technologies, in order to, as the Chinese say, in order to use the mechanisms of the market to develop their productive economy as a way of building the foundation, of further building the foundation for entry into you know, the transition to socialism. It's a moment of convenience. It's very ironic because it's a moment of convenience when emergent right-wing neoliberal forces in the West, especially in America, find a community of interest with the changing strategies of socialist development on the part of the Chinese leadership. As I say, the 80s is this weird sort of honeymoon period. You have visits by Chinese leaders to America and by American politicians to China. You have a whole sort of cultural wave of China-friendly gestures. I remember department stores in New York, you know, running big ad campaigns about products coming from China and using sort of oriental imagery as part of their consumer promotions. It was a very strange period. 
And, you know, the neoliberals set out to reconfigure the American economy to claw back the gains that had been made by the working class going all the way back to the 1930s, you know, to move against unions, to move against government regulation, all this stuff to reconfigure the American domestic economy and America's role within the capitalist world. But They also saw China as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, and this is the period where what I sometimes think of as the great self-deception by Western bourgeois politicians really kicks in, which was that their faith was because they had this neoliberal passion for, you know, supposed free trade, open market economics, they thought, and I think many of them sincerely believed, that by engaging with China, that by investing in China, that by supporting this marketization in China, that that would lead China down the capitalist road, that that would make China convert from a socialist country with a communist party in the leading role and trying to build a modern, you know, prosperous economy that could be the foundation for socialist transformation. They thought that they were going to play China, they were going to play these neoliberal policies as a way of transforming China and making that connection between the United States and China into a substantive reality. Now, and that was a fundamental misreading on the part of the American elites of what was actually happening in China. But it did launch this basically 10-year period all through the 1980s when it's not like the United States and China were the best buddies in the world, but it was a period where there was a belief in American political elites that some process of convergence was taking place that was going to draw China into the capitalist world. And that dictated a lot of the foreign policy moves and activities that went on through that decade. Of course, that runs into a brick wall in 1989. But for a while, that was certainly the dream that animated American policymakers towards China. It seems to me, Ken, that what was happening, and I'm agreeing with you, but I want to just sort of spin it out a little bit more, is that there are two elements. American capitalist corporations who were allowed to now come into China and set up shop and build factories and who could pay Chinese workers and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of poor people from Chinese villages in the countryside, peasants, came in to the cities And as they came into the cities, they were employed by Western capitalist corporations, and those corporations were making super profits. American workers were being, you know, just devastated as the process of offshoring, not just in China, but also in Mexico and many, many other countries, developing countries, when the nature of modern technology made it possible for an American manufacturer to make shirts for instance, in China or in Bangladesh or someplace 7,000 miles away, it was still cheaper to make them there and bring them back or electronic products that were designed in the West but assembled in China and then bring them back. In other words, export them from China. These corporations could make super profits. So on one element, there's just greed. There's just the normal capitalist greed and American workers are devastated by this neoliberal offshoring of production to China and elsewhere, but especially China. And then on the same time, there's the political calculations, which is what you're also talking about, where American policymakers who actually know so little about the world, but think because they have so much power that they know everything about the world, they just assumed, look, if China is integrated into the world economy, if China essentially becomes sort of a place of assembly, if it in fact looks like a neo-colony, like the way other neo-colonies look, it will be a neo-colony and the rule of the Communist Party will be so corrupted by its integration into the world economy at this low level of the food chain of production as an assembler of products, we can bribe them, we can you know, pay them off, we can, you know, do what you do with elites and neo colonies, which is to basically make them be comprador extensions of the imperialist system. So they were sure that this would happen. And that's why, if we speed ahead, and I don't want to speed ahead too much because I want to stay in this era, but when you hear Pompeo, for instance, or Anthony Blinken, his successor, 
or Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor, they said the biggest mistake America ever made was to integrate China into the world economy because we believe that this would make China, quote, liberal, which actually translated means make China a neo-colonial servant of American imperialism. That's what that actually means. And we were wrong because the Chinese had no intention of becoming a neo-colonial servant of American imperialism. They used us instead of us using them. Well, in fact, both sides were using each other, but the desired outcome 40 years later isn't to have China in the clutches of American imperialism. But on the contrary, China was able to take advantage of the technology that was brought to China from Western corporations. It learned the technology. It made agreements with the Western corporations, the quid pro quo being, look, You can invest, you can pay low wages, you can make super profits, but one will be getting more income than we would if our people were stuck in remote villages. Secondly, we're also going to make you partner with Chinese companies so that the licensing of technologies was such that at some point they would be accessible for China's indigenous industry. And China basically was able to use the size of its market the great wealth that would come from this huge, vast market, both a market to sell, but also a labor market, to leverage in the negotiations with Western corporations so that China benefited by acquiring technology. Now, the American politicians like Pompeo or Blinken say this was kind of hostage taking where China somehow forced American companies to come and do business and share technology, or as they put it, steal American technology. But that was the deal. But again, American elites had both a political and an economic calculation here. The economic calculation was correct. The American companies did make super profits. The political calculation went off the cliff. Exactly. Exactly. Again, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but I think that that's what feeds a lot of the super hostile antagonism towards China today, is that the American capitalist elites believed that China would be seduced and transformed into as they call it, liberalization, both economically and politically, that it would become a sort of open market capitalist system and a new bourgeoisie would take power and there would be some sort of political transformation. And then that would be vulnerable to the the same kinds of manipulations that American imperialism exercises everywhere else. And that, of course, hasn't happened. And I think that the realization of that, which really you can see very clearly all the way back in the Obama administration and, and even before, the realization that China wasn't going to become, as you say, a subordinate component of a new era global division of labor, but was actually going to develop its own economy, raise the standards of its own people, and take a place on its own two feet rather than being you know, on its knees to American imperialism that kind of drives them crazy. You know, that's not what they wanted. That's not what they thought they were going to do. And that's not what they thought was happening. So to be confronted by that alternative reality now, it drives them kind of crazy. Ken, I want to, I think, finish this segment by talking about the last irony of ironies. And again, the entire decade is marked by such remarkable ironies. And you might call it an irony. You might just call it the dialectic but certainly a period of contradictions, and the contradictions are within the existing phenomena themselves, but they lead to outcomes that were not completely foreseeable. And I'm thinking about what the impact was on the Soviet leadership of China's integration into the world economy in the early 1980s. Now, just for everyone to kind of get this, the Soviet economy also, like the Chinese economy recently, had grown exponentially starting in 1930 with the beginning of the five-year plans. So even during the Great Depression of the 1930s, the Soviet Union was going way forward. It didn't have any depression at all. It seemed to prove the rightness and correctness of Soviet socialism, public ownership, a planned economy, the monopoly on foreign trade, because the Soviets had these exponential increases in growth and didn't experience any recession. The only time there was a real economic contraction was during the Nazi invasion. But unlike the Western capitalist countries that go through a boom-bust cycle, the Soviets had just gone straight up. 
And the living standard of the Soviet peoples, both in Russia and the other republics, was going up steadily. But in the 1980s, coinciding with the integration of China into the world market and where the Soviets perceived China now as an ally of American imperialism, there was economic stagnation in the Soviet Union. Things started to slow down. America would not sell the Soviets even at one computer. The jackson Varnick Amendment, which I mentioned earlier, which sort of ended detente in 1974-75, it precluded any economic interaction with the Soviets. At the same time, the remilitarization of America, the placement of tactical nuclear weapons all over Europe and circling the Soviet Union, again, with flight times of six minutes to their Soviet targets. And at the same time, coinciding with all this, the Soviet leadership was very old. And so Leonid Brezhnev, who had been the leader since the mid-60s, he was very sick. He died. He was replaced by Yuri Andropov, also very old. Within about a year, he died. Then he was replaced by another old member of the Politburo, Chernyenko. He died right away. So the Soviet leadership looked senile. It looked old. It looked decrepit. I'm talking about up to 1984. And the Soviets were being threatened by U.S. imperialism, the rearmed imperialism. And at the same time, they looked enviously at China's integration into the world economy and arriving on the scene in the Soviet Union was a new leadership who was not old. He was young. That was Mikhail Gorbachev. And he immediately announces, look, we have to overcome stagnation. We have to find a way to make peace with the United States. He says, let's have, instead of class struggle, a policy announcing that there are universal human values, universal human rights. And suddenly Ronald Reagan, the anti-communist and Margaret Thatcher think, oh, here's a guy we can work with. As a matter of fact, those were Margaret Thatcher's exact words. And Gorbachev became flattered. I mean, when he came to Washington or New York, big crowds came out to greet him. There was a Mikhail Gorbachev fad. And the Soviets were sort of embraced by the United States in the mid 80s. And Gorbachev started a process called perestroika and glasnost, meaning opening up politically and decentralizing and in part privatizing the Soviet economy. I think trying in some ways to do what China did and to win the favor of the United States. But instead, what happened is that the sort of diminution of a Soviet position against imperialism, opening up the decentralization led to the movements of counter-revolutionary anti-communists in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe had always been a vulnerable place because there was never, except in Yugoslavia, a genuine revolution from the ground up. Those socialist governments were created by the victory of the Red Army over the Nazis and the liberation of those countries by the Soviet Red Army. During the early years of the Cold War, Stalin hoped they would be neutral countries. But when American imperialism intensified its aggression in 1947-48, the CP and the government in the Soviet Union facilitated the takeover of those governments in Eastern Europe by communists. So they had communist governments, communist party governments, but their origin was not in a people's revolution. It wasn't like China or the Soviet Union or Vietnam or Korea or Cuba. It was kind of revolution from above. And under the conditions of Gorbachev's perestroika and glasnost and the stagnation economically in the socialist camp, there was a counter-revolutionary uprising and instead of fighting it, Gorbachev said, let it go. Let's give Eastern Europe back to imperialism, to Western imperialism. And then we, like China, will be integrated into the world economy. But what that did was stimulate anti-communist uprisings, not just in Eastern and Central Europe, but also in the Soviet Union and inside the Soviet Communist Party. And Gorbachev, who was in one way trying to make friends again with China after that long dispute. He visits China, but it's in May 1989, and the same circumstance of what's happening in Eastern Europe is happening in the People's Republic of China, and we know it in the West as the Tiananmen student protest that lasted seven weeks that ended not with the victory of the anti-government forces, but their suppression. Again, the irony or the contradictoriness or the dialectic of all of these events, even though China had become hostile 
to the socialist bloc or to the Soviet Union, what happened inside the Soviet Union or what happened inside the socialist bloc, like the Eastern and Central European governments, had a very, very significant political impact still on what was going on inside China. Let's talk about that. Well, there's a lot there. You've touched on some really, really critical developments. And one thing, of course, that goes on through the 80s and You know, so much of this involves American imperialism saying one thing and doing another, which is certainly not an unfamiliar phenomenon. When Reagan comes in and launches his neoliberal offensive against the American working class and his efforts to rebuild the position of American imperialism within the global arena, it's actually a point where he refocuses American foreign policy in an increasingly anti-Soviet way. But at the same time, it you know assumes a public posture which appears to be sort of reconciliationist and you know let's find a way forward and of course when gorbachev comes along he's kind of the perfect foil for reagan because he's presented as you say as this youngster he's a reformer he wants to find you know common ground and all this and reagan you know publicly certainly appears to embrace that he meets with gorbachev a number of times there's lots of lovely photos photo ops. But at the same time, as you mentioned, you know, the United States is ramping up its military spending. It's ramping up its positioning of aggressive weapon systems and troop concentrations in different parts of the world. And Reagan basically embarks on kind of a great gamble, which is to challenge the Soviets to a kind of new arms race, a high-tech, intense reconfiguration, the whole Star Wars undertaking, this idea that missile defenses were going to be reconfigured in different ways. And his bet, Reagan's bet, was that although this was going to cost the United States a lot of money, and indeed in the Reagan years, the U.S. goes from being the largest creditor country in the world to being the biggest debtor country in the world. We went from having more people owe us money than anybody else to owing more people money than anybody else. His bet was, though, that we could outlast the Soviets. We could go deep and deep and deep into debt But we would force them to do the same thing. We would force them to divert resources from their domestic economy, from their civilian economy into these unproductive expenditures on military systems. The Soviets, of course, had gone into Afghanistan to try to support the progressive socialist government there. And the U.S. throughout the 80s fueled anti-government insurrections there. Of course, that was going to come back as a problematic development in later times for the United States itself. But, you know, we forced them to waste more resources there. And Reagan's calculation in the end proved to be significantly correct, a significant component of the stagnation of the Soviet economy, the frustration of Soviet people, which made them vulnerable to the manipulations of these anti-communist forces, which, of course, we also clandestinely aided in Eastern Europe and even within the Soviet Union. So that whole dynamic between the United States and the Soviet Union in the 80s was kind of a smile on the face, but also slipping the dagger in between the ribs. And that contributed, that was one of the main factors driving the ultimate breakup of the socialist governments in Eastern Europe and the collapse of the Soviet Union. But at the same time, as you say, you know, Gorbachev's visit to China in May of 1989 came in the midst of demonstrations which had gotten underway after the death of Hu Yaobang, who was a sort of very reformist political leader. He had been one of the two top leaders in the party, and he had been removed from his leadership position. He was still on the political bureau, but he, along with Zhao Ziyang, had been the biggest advocates of really a fairly radical free market sort of orientation in the reform program. And he had died of a heart attack at a political bureau meeting on April 15th of 1989. 
demonstrations had begun by young people, college students, young professionals. It's a very complex political landscape that these emerge from. A lot of frustrations with the effects of the reform policies, concerns about corruption in government and the party and things like that. There were certainly some legitimate grounds for people to express their opinions, but it becomes transformed over the weeks of late April and May into a direct and very, very clear challenge to the legitimacy of the People's Republic and to the leadership of the Communist Party. And it's, you know, manipulated and not very subtly by American imperialism and outside forces. You know, Western journalists show up in Beijing in huge numbers to cover Gorbachev's visit, which turns into kind of a sideshow as these Western journalists ramp up a cheerleader squad calling for the overthrow of the Chinese government, calling for, you know, portraying these students, portraying these demonstrators, which was true for some of them, as dedicated to, you know, converting China into a Western-style bourgeois democracy. And of course, that leads to the final confrontation after Gorbachev's visit comes and goes. That leads to a final decision by the leadership of the government and the party to try to restore order, to try to reclaim the center of the city, the center of the capital of the People's Republic that brings in the People's Liberation Army. And of course, nobody thinks that it was a great event to have fighting in the streets of China's capital, to have the People's Liberation Army have to be engaged in armed conflict with violent insurrectionists in the street. But that was what happened. That was what was necessary to restore order and bring this movement that had paralyzed the city for weeks to an end. That, of course, was a tremendous frustration and disappointment to the forces in the West, to the American bourgeois elite and Western imperialism in general, who really had their hopes up, who really thought this was going to be the kind of color revolution, as they came to be called, that was going to lead to regime change and the end of the Communist Party and the real throwing open of China to the unrestricted penetration and domination of Western capital. Obviously, that wasn't what was going to happen. The Chinese never had any intention of allowing that to happen. And I think that the years since then have certainly demonstrated the ultimate correctness of the choices that were made at that time. Yeah, these are important events. And it's hard to overstate the level of hysteria that was generated in the Western media against the Chinese government when it finally, after seven weeks, cleared the, as you said, Tiananmen Square is the center of the Chinese government. It had been occupied for seven weeks. The Chinese leadership had met with the leaders of the protests on national public television. They were just treated with absolute disrespect on national television. And then the way it was portrayed in the United States and other places is that People's Liberation Army came in and massacred these peaceful protesters who had erected a statue that looked just like the Statue of Liberty in the middle of Tiananmen Square. And Ken, we're going to end on this part, but again, it's hard to overstate. I went around the country at that time debating people who were condemning China, including people who were well-known authors and supporters of China earlier and had been supporting the Cultural Revolution and supporting Chairman Mao. And they were all like, no, this is a kind of fascism. And these peaceful, wonderful demonstrators were you know, gunned down. Well, None of the people who were killed were actually killed in the square. The military moved into the square finally on June 4th, and the students were actually allowed to leave. There was street fighting in the areas around the square. But I want to read, too, as we finish out, a little bit of press reporting at the time that got almost no coverage, almost no coverage, but it shows a little bit of a different picture than the accepted narrative by Western media that... These wonderful, idealist, peaceful student protesters were gunned down. Here's the Washington Post, June 12th, 1989, an article that didn't get much attention. On one avenue in western Beijing, demonstrators torched an entire military convoy of more than 100 trucks and armored vehicles. Aerial pictures of conflagration and columns of smoke have powerfully bolstered the Chinese government's arguments that the troops were victims, not executioners. Other scenes showed soldiers' corpses and demonstrators stripping automatic rifles off unresisting soldiers. 
Again, everybody, that's the Washington Post, June 12, 1989, eight days later, an account that was more or less buried. Here's what the Wall Street Journal said. And of course, the Wall Street Journal is you know a leading voice of anti-communism. It says, right after June 4th, one of the stories acknowledged that, quote, radicalized protesters, some now armed with guns and vehicles, commandeered in clashes with the military, were preparing for larger armed struggles. Quote, this is the Wall Street Journal. As columns of tanks and tens of thousands of soldiers approached Tiananmen, many troops were set on fire by angry mobs. Dozens of soldiers were pulled from trucks, severely beaten, and left for dead. At an intersection west of the square, the body of a young soldier who had been beaten to death was stripped naked and hung from the side of a bus. Another soldier's corpse was strung at the intersection east of the square. Now, that's, I mean, can you imagine, dear audience, if there were massive protests in Washington, D.C. that had occupied and stopped the government from functioning for seven weeks, and then the protesters emptied arsenals from police stations and took up guns and started beating or lynching police officers or National Guardsmen, how those demonstrators might be presented. And yet this is actually what happened. Ken, we're going to come back and use the post Tiananmen Square as the starting point for our next look at Chinese foreign policy. This will be the look at the 1990s and the entrance of China into the World Trade Organization. And again, also a little bit about China in the war that NATO waged against Yugoslavia in 1999. I'll give you the last word on Tiananmen Square. Well, you know, at the time, I was actually working with an American study abroad program in Beijing. And we had evacuated our students towards the end of May because it was clear that the situation was, you know, very dangerous and likely to get out of control. So I was not in Beijing at the time of June 4th, but I went back in. I was recalled into Beijing a little bit later in June. When I got there, the central city was still under martial law. You could still hear gunshots at night. There were roadblocks in different parts of the city because there were still people who were trying to carry on a kind of almost a guerrilla campaign fighting against the police and the units of the PLA that had been brought in to restore order. And I talked to a lot of people. I knew a lot of young people. I knew other people from my generation who were teachers or professors at educational institutions. And even their accounts were pretty much as the ones that you read from the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. The neighborhood I lived in happened to be near the Naval Hospital, which was the biggest hospital that took casualties from that night. It's over on the west side. It's just north of an intersection called Mushidi, which is the one that you were referring to where some of the heaviest fighting took place. And their count, what they told me by the end of June was that the best figures that they had from that night was that between six and 800 people had been killed. And about a third of those were military personnel. So the idea that, as you say, that this was a sort of unprovoked massacre of innocent bystanders is not a correct, not an accurate historical perspective. You're also quite right that nobody was killed in the square. The soldiers got down there about 2.30 in the morning, and they gave the few people who were still there the option of leaving, which most of them did. A handful of people stayed to be arrested, and they were arrested. They weren't harmed in any way. But this mythology about Tiananmen, of course, has become – everybody knows that picture of the fellow with the shopping bag standing in front of a tank, which is actually several days after the events of June 4th. And that fellow himself was not harmed. He wasn't arrested. He stood there for a while and went about his business. But that mythology, that sort of imagery of a sort of brutal crackdown on helpless bystanders, it's just not historically correct. By the time I got there, there were many trucks and buses barricading what's what's virtually a four-lane highway. And across the buses, people had put out uh, posters saying, Hang Li Peng, the premier. And they were yelling, uh, there were speeches uh, going on, people were listening to each other, talking, uh, they were trying to uh, 
rally up some support for armed resistance. One young man who was a student said, the people want arms, the people want weapons, they want to fight the military out of their city. They fought, however, very bravely. setting military vehicles afire where they could. At the moment that China suppresses, and we talked about how the suppression was largely misrepresented in the Western media, but it certainly brought to an end these big protests that were taking place in Tiananmen Square, what Western media called the Tiananmen Square massacre. But during that event, especially in the last couple of weeks. If anyone was watching American TV, and I certainly was, I was here, I know you were in China at the time, CNN in particular, but the other news networks, they were cheering on what they hoped would be a counter-revolution, meaning a toppling of the Chinese government, a toppling of the Chinese Communist Party. It was vivid that CNN seemed to be actually trying to foment a military uprising from different military divisions at that moment on June 3rd and 4th and 5th, 1989. And clearly it showed that even though the U.S. had acted like it was a friend of China in the 1980s, all of the U.S. media, the U.S. government, and all of its allies from the other major capitalist or imperialist countries in Western Europe and in Japan, they all had the same position. They were all on the side of those who wanted to topple the Chinese government. And it reflected what the real nature of the relationship was still, in spite of the professed friendship between China and the West or China and the United States. When push came to shove, it wasn't very friendly. No, indeed. I think the attitude that was adopted, especially here in the United States, was that, you know, the United States was very happy that China had opened its doors and embarked upon this decade of reform and allowing direct foreign investment and things like that. The United States was certainly pleased with that as a set of developments. But the prospect of actually seeing the kind of regime change in Beijing that was, as you just mentioned, was unfolding in Eastern Europe and was about to see the final collapse of the Soviet Union, that would have created a much more favorable environment for integrating China into the global capitalist system. So the glee, the eagerness with which the Western media attempted to sort of fan the flames there in 1989, was premised on that sort of hopeful scenario that this might mean the end of even the facade, as they thought of it, of a socialist government and some sort of transformation that would allow Western capital to just operate at will within China might be in the offing. That, of course, is not what actually transpired. As you noted, the events of June 3rd, June 4th saw the suppression of those demonstrations and the reassertion of central government control within the capital, that itself triggered a very strong reaction on the part of the Western powers, on the part of the United States in particular, in that there was just a massive condemnation of China, boycotts against Chinese activities, Chinese businesses. There was talk in political circles of trying to expel China from certain international organizations. There was a very hostile reaction to the suppression of those demonstrations. And it really hurt for the rest of 1989 into 1990, 91. It isolated China and it was a very severe challenge to the ongoing reform program. And I think that that experience, of course, shaped the perspective of the Chinese leadership. There were some changes in that leadership in the wake of all that, but it certainly sent a message to China that the hand of friendship, which had supposedly been extended in the 1980s, was also capable of a pretty firm crackdown, a pretty firm opposition to China and especially to the continuing leadership of the government and the Communist Party. It reveals in a particular kind of way what the actual political and class character is of the People's Republic of China. Yes, China had adopted some capitalist style economic reforms. Yes, it had privatized some industry. Yes, it had dissolved the peasant communes. Yes, it was inviting Western capitalist corporations to come in and to set up shop 
to, you know, essentially exploit Chinese labor and all of those kind of things. But when push came to shove, when it looked like there might be a civil war, the United States was for the civil war and for the civil war and supporting the people who wanted to topple the government. And when you think about a similar type scenario playing out, say, in the capital city of England, say, if it was in London or if it was in Paris, if it was in the capital of Germany, if it was in Rome, if it was in Tokyo, if there was a huge, massive movement that stopped the government from functioning, that you know was taking arms from the police and the military, that was organizing essentially an insurrection, and its goal was to topple the government, under no circumstance would the United States support such a rebellion in London, in Paris, in Rome, in Tokyo, in Germany. And yet when it happened in China, it wasn't like there was a little bit of support for the counter-revolution. There was uniform across the board support. And it makes me believe, and this is my position, it reveals the class nature of what's going on in China because the American capitalist establishment, like the one in Germany, France, Japan, Italy, highly class conscious, highly class conscious. And they do not support, quote, color type revolutions against their allies. Clearly, China's in a different camp. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think that what we saw in 1989 and what we have seen in other instances, and I think what's animating American policy towards China today is that the Western powers, the United States perhaps most of all, have maintained a sort of attitude of wishful thinking towards China, that they believed that economic reform, that you know the utilization of market mechanisms for the process of economic development would inevitably lead to the kind of political liberalization in the sense of a restructuring of the Chinese state in a way that would introduce mechanisms, multi-party elections perhaps, things like that, which would be much more amenable to the manipulations of capital as of course they are in our own country. And the United States elites have repeatedly convinced themselves that China was going to follow the path which they think is what happened with the Soviet Union or the governments in Eastern Europe of reaching this kind of terminal systemic crisis. And then that would sort of inevitably give rise to a political situation which would be much more favorable, much more open to the penetration and the dominance of Western capital. But as you say, the class nature of the situation in China was very clearly demonstrated. And so that sort of frustrated and enraged the Western powers and led to this period of a couple of years of real diplomatic isolation for China. Now, of course, that didn't mean in practice that American corporations shut down their operations in China or that they ceased to pursue opportunities for investment in China because capital, of course, always goes where it can find the greatest returns on its investment. So the economic relationship persisted, but the political relationship was severely disrupted. And that was a challenge that the Chinese had to face. So after Tiananmen, after a couple of years of isolation, or at least a semi-isolation, it's clear that the Chinese government is not going to be overthrown, that the Tiananmen Square uprising you know, had been suppressed and that China had managed to sort of get through the crisis. It did not happen to China what happened to the Soviet Union or what happened to the countries of Eastern and Central Europe, the so-called socialist governments. I say so-called because... They had the perspective of socialism, but they were still in a very, very early stage of socialism and had, you know, in the case of Poland, partly socialist and partly capitalist, at least in the countryside. But it was clear that China wasn't going the way of the West. And so the dominant element of the dichotomy in Western orientation towards China, one, looking at China as a place where great profits can be made, where a great huge market became available to sell things, and a great huge labor market where you could produce things at low cost and then ship them overseas. In other words, exported from China, but really where China was basically a last 
step assembly spot, that sort of perspective on China, how to make maximum and super profits, that really kind of won out over the, like, we must carry out the complete isolation of China, destroy China, and have a counter-revolution in China. Since it didn't look feasible, it didn't seem like a viable political alternative the U.S. basically went back to business after a little while with China. Yeah. And China's goal then is to try to sort of soft sell any oppositional position to the United States, thinking mm, the U.S. may, in fact, still allow us to integrate into the world economy to continue to do this. China's priorities in its foreign policies really correspond completely to its own internal economic objectives. Exactly. I think that one of the critical turning points after 1989 was what's called the Southern Journey, the Nanshun in Chinese, that Deng Xiaoping makes in 1992. And it's both a turning point or a reaffirmation within China of the commitment to the reform program. But it's also a signal. It's also a message to the global community. Deng Xiaoping goes south, visits Shenzhen and some of the other special economic zones, and really, you know, reaffirms his commitment and the commitment of the party and the commitment of the government to the ongoing pursuit of the policies of reform and opening. And I think that just as you just indicated, that the message that that sends to the global capitalist community is that despite the hostility, despite the antagonism that had been manifested over the previous couple of years by outside governments, that China was more or less open for business, was prepared to continue this kind of relationship in which foreign enterprises could come into China, they could pursue their profitable operations, they could repatriate at least a portion of the profits they were generating, and that China was going to carry that on. And the underlying message of that is just, as you were just suggesting, is this very pragmatic approach of saying, look, these are the policies which we believe we need to develop our economy. We believe we need to improve the livelihood of our people, to enhance the material circumstances of people's lives. And so we're ready to keep going on that path. And the international community, you know, the capitalist world, if you will, of course, they were eager to avail themselves of the reservoir of highly qualified but lowly compensated labor that was available in China. And they were very happy to sort of reinvigorate or revive that economic relationship. And by that point, by 1992, I think, of course, there's political changes taking place in the United States. We have the Clinton administration about to take office, the era of sort of neoliberal dominance under Reagan and the first Bush is not coming to an end, certainly. It had reshaped America's political economic perspective. But this was a good moment. The Clinton administration could take a somewhat gentler approach towards China. So I think that ushers in this period through the 90s and into the first decade of the present century of a you know non-ideological approach a pragmatic approach of saying well china may not be reforming its political system as quickly as we would like but we have faith that in the long run if we just stay engaged and we just keep encouraging reform 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 that that will lead to a sort of political convergence so even though that had clearly been not what happened in 1989. The attractions of economic integration with China were sufficiently powerful to redirect American policy, American foreign policy to this era, a second era sort of of engagement with China over the following couple of decades. I want to draw an analogy, a comparable strategy that was employed by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union by the Bolsheviks under the leadership of Lenin, and that was in the year 1921. The Soviet Union had just emerged from three years of civil war. 14 imperialist armies had invaded the country. The German government, before it finally you know, lost World War I, invaded Russia after the sort of procrastination on the signing of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, such that about a quarter of Russia was taken by Germany. And in spite of all of these imperialist threats and machinations and desire to overthrow the Bolsheviks, 
Lenin turns in 1921 and introduces something called the New Economic Policy, where he invites the same imperialists who just invaded the country to come and set up shop in the new socialist Russia, the new socialist Soviet Union, and says to them, look, we're willing to give you lots of concessions. You can make lots of money. You can employ Russian workers and other nationalities who are within the new Russian Socialist Federation. You can make lots and lots of money. And in exchange, we will have some more economic activity and economic development to overcome the tremendous devastation that the country was experiencing as a consequence of earlier underdevelopment economically because of World War I, the loss of 3 million people, another 3 million killed during the Civil War in the imperialist invasion of Russia following the Russian Revolution. We invite you to come in and we will grow. And Lenin called this the new economic policy. And he also described it to the comrades. He said, look, we're letting the wolf in the door. These people are hostile to us. All they want to do is overthrow us, but they also want to make profit. So we're going to let them make profit and we're going to use them the way they're using us and we need to do it. But let's face it, when you let the imperialist capitalist wolf in the door, he becomes more dangerous. So we are going to engage in an economic retreat, a retreat towards capitalism, but it's so that we can hold on to power and develop the country. Now, the Chinese in 1991, 92, They've just gone through a terrible attack after Tiananmen Square, isolation from the Western imperialist countries. They're doing the same thing. Deng Xiaoping's Southern Tour is basically sending the same message that Lenin sent. The differences, though, are important. One is when Lenin invited the imperialists to come into Russia, almost none of them did because they decided, even though they could make super profits, it was going to help the Bolsheviks too much. And secondly, Lenin said this is a retreat away from socialism, but a necessary retreat so that we can survive because of the emergency exigencies and poverty that's been imposed upon us. Now, the Chinese, their offer to the Western capitalists was embraced. Western capitalists did invest. And the Chinese didn't say this is a retreat away from socialism. They said this is something different. They said this is socialism but with Chinese characteristics. In other words, not a retreat imposed on the party by economic exigency and emergency, but really the path forward. Anyway, what do you think about the analogy? Oh, I think the analogy with the NEP works very well. And the key to it is the political nature, as you say, the class nature of the state which is acting as the host. The Soviet Union in the early 20s was obviously in very dire circumstances economically. And Lenin saw that by embarking on the new economic policies, this was a possible way of sort of jumpstarting the economy that could then be directed into the path of socialist transformation. And I think the parallel with that is that the Chinese, and they've been very clear about this from the beginning of the reform era, their objective is to utilize market mechanisms as a way of developing the economy. Go back and you read the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels are very clear that the development of the bourgeois economy driven by the marketization of the European economies was a tremendously creative period. And that, you know, there's this sort of rising era where marketization drives innovation and creativity within the economy. And that's what the Chinese are hoping to achieve. And obviously, they have had great success with that program over the last 40 years. But the key is that it's not the operation of markets in an unrestricted, unregulated environment. It's not just you know handing the keys over to the bourgeoisie and saying, here, take it for a spin. It's inviting capital to come into the Chinese economic space, engage in activities there in partnership with the Chinese side that are going to yield beneficial results in terms of economic development, in terms of the acquisition of modern productive technologies, in terms of management, organizational things like that, uh, but under the leadership and the guidance 
of the Communist Party and the government of the People's Republic. So it's not just throwing the gates open. It's a managed process that is going to bring China to the level of material prosperity necessary to reach a sort of threshold stage where you can really talk about beginning to develop socialist relationships, where you can really talk about distribution based on a more equitable basis. So I think that the parallel with the new economic policies in the Soviet Union is very good in terms of what the intent was. Obviously, the way that that worked out for the Soviets was not that great. And then, you know, other developments took place later in the 1920s that set the sort of socialism in one country agenda for a long time. But China has done an excellent job of retaining the leadership of the party and having the party play that kind of role of oversight. Certainly, the use of markets has yielded tremendous contradictions within China, but so long as there's a strong and clear leadership guiding that process, I think that it's been a remarkably successful endeavor. It has, of course, further encouraged these ideas, these anticipations in the West, that economic change would inevitably lead to political transformation. And that has not happened. And the Chinese have also been very clear that that's not going to happen. That's not what they want. They're aware that that's a danger and they're doing what they have to do to guard against the emergence, the consolidation of a bourgeois class, of a bourgeois political force within the country. That has governed China's foreign policy orientation ever since the early 90s. That idea of a practical engagement, China's entry into the World Trade Organization as a sort of case example of China's orientation towards the global system. You know, when Zhu Wenji asked me, do you believe that we can have a deal with the Americans? I answered, yes, I believe without any hesitation. That make uh, Prime Minister Zhu Yongji came all the way to the negotiation table and they got the deal. So until today, I, I'm still very proud of my political courage and a sense of responsibility for the country. This deal will not change China or our relationship with China overnight. Bringing China into the WTO is a win-win decision. It will protect our prosperity, and it will promote the right kind of change in China. It is good for our farmers, for our manufacturers, and for our investors. Now we're entering into the mid-1990s, and there's two important events that happen. One is there is a major economic financial crash called the Asian Financial Crisis which sweeps the Asian countries and has a big impact on the global economy. And at the same time, Hong Kong is returned from the British to the People's Republic of China in 1997. First, let's frame it, though. The goal, the priority of the Chinese government after Tiananmen Square, unlike, say, the 1950s or the 60s, which was to promote and support world revolution, be part of the socialist camp, wanting that socialist camp to expand. Now China's goals, its objectives, its priorities are its own economic development almost exclusively. And they have a plan. They have a model. They have the opening up, the new reforms. And those include allowing foreign direct investment into the country, all kinds of economic arrangements with Western capitalist corporations and Japanese companies and the integration of China into the world economy. The goal of China in the 1990s is to have peaceful coexistence with imperialism and finally find a way to have China be fully accepted into the world economy. We're going to talk about that with China's admission to the World Trade Organization in 2001. Nowadays, in 2020, 2021, American officials say That was America's biggest mistake, was to allow China to join the WTO. Anyway, let's start with the mid-1990s. Let's start with Hong Kong. Again, Hong Kong is big in the news. People don't, maybe, well, of course, people who are Chinese or people who are from Hong Kong will know. But for those who aren't from China, not from Hong Kong, but interested in this topic, let's just frame 
the significance of Hong Kong to China and the significance of its return in 1997. Well, that's a really, really important moment. It's hard to overestimate how significant that was for China's emergence into the global system, into the world order, because it's a recognition on the part of the British, but of the international community more broadly, of China's legitimacy, the legitimacy of the People's Republic, and the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty to recognize its position as an integral part of the People's Republic was a very significant gesture, a very significant turning point, a marker of China's position. The island of Hong Kong had been seized by the British all the way back in 1842. The opposite shore, the area called Kowloon, was taken over by the British not too long after that. And then the further interior, what are called the New Territories, were ceded in 1897 on a 100-year lease. And it was the expiration of that 100-year lease that became the sort of temporal threshold for the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty. Hong Kong had been a British colony. It had been operated as the rest of the colonial system had been, as a subordinate component of a British-centered global division of labor. It had become a center for not just the transit trade into and out of China, but of local manufacturing, light industrial manufacturing. And eventually it had emerged after World War II and through the 1950s and 60s as a major financial center for East Asia and beyond. So, you know, Hong Kong had been developed by the British for their own purposes and their own interest. It had been ruled by British appointed governors. There was never any pretense of democracy. There was no participation for even for local elites, particularly, let alone for ordinary citizens and workers within Hong Kong. And as it became clear that China was going to seek the reintegration of Hong Kong to the People's Republic when the lease on the new territories expired, the British, in a period where relations between the West and China were a little more positive, the British, I think, wanted to carry through this return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty as a gesture, as a way of acknowledging and recognizing China's emergence into and integration into the existing global order. So they pulled some shenanigans along the way. They tried to set up, they kind of laid some mines for the future in trying to transform the political situation within Hong Kong in the last few years before 1997. But basically, China and Britain agreed to a return of sovereignty, and they agreed that after that return, China would preserve for Hong Kong a special status. It is a special administrative region within the People's Republic. And it is governed under something called the Basic Law, which is a separate quasi-constitutional order, separate from the Constitution of the People's Republic, although as an integral part of the People's Republic, it remains subordinate to that larger constitutional framework. But the Basic Law has been acknowledged by both sides of the original agreement and has been maintained in its essential features, as was agreed upon at the time, that it would be maintained for the next 50 years uh, until 2047. And here we are well over half the way down that process. And although there's been some fairly minor tinkering with it, the, the basic realities are that Hong Kong still preserves its own distinctive political system. It has a multi-party electoral system. It's a complex one, but not dissimilar from other Asian countries, such as Indonesia, for example. And Hong Kong has been effectively brought back into the administration of the People's Republic. Recent events there, which we can talk about perhaps in our next session, have been a little challenging. But 1997, the return of Hong Kong to Chinese sovereignty, an important moment signifying both China's reemergence into the global system and the recognition and acknowledgement of that by the Western powers, most particularly, of course, by Britain itself. At the time of the victory of the Chinese Revolution in 1949, the communist led revolutionary army could have easily taken Hong Kong. The British were in no position to fight. In fact, the British were preparing to flee if the Mao-led 
communist revolution decided to seize it. Why do you think that it was not a priority for Mao and the Maoist leadership in the beginning? Well, I think, you know, the same could be said about the Portuguese enclave over at Macau, just across the Pearl River estuary. Portugal had established its position there all the way back in the 16th century. And that would have been even easier for the Chinese to reabsorb in 1949. And of course, again, in the late 1960s, during the Cultural Revolution, there was significant political turmoil in Hong Kong. The PLA could easily have rolled in. The fresh water supplies that Hong Kong depends upon are actually pumped in from the rest of China. And simply turning off the taps would have brought Hong Kong to a standstill, which would easily have led to it being reincorporated. But I think from 1949 on down through the 50s and the 60s and all the way till the 90s, really the 80s when the negotiations began, that the PRC understood that there were features of the particular situation of Hong Kong, which could be of value, of use for the government of the People's Republic as a financial center, as a sort of window to the larger global system, trade going through Hong Kong, Chinese goods that could be exported to Hong Kong and then re-exported from there, goods coming into China via Hong Kong, financial arrangements that could be carried on via Hong Kong. These all had a utility function for the Chinese, which made the inconvenience, I suppose you would say, of militarily retaking the colony, you know, not necessary. It was easier and more useful more functional to preserve Hong Kong as the kind of enclave that it was at that moment. The difference by the time we get down to the 1980s and the 1990s, of course, is that having embarked upon the program of reform and opening, China was no longer so reliant upon Hong Kong as an interface with the larger global system. China was entering into that system itself, being accepted into that system, using its entry into that system as part of the overall program of reform, this idea of developing China's domestic economy, its productive economy by using market mechanisms, including the welcoming of foreign direct investment and the appropriation, the absorption of technologies of production from the outside world. Hong Kong no longer played that sort of pivotal role. Shanghai was emerging as the new trade center and the new financial center. And so China didn't have to pursue the military reacquisition of Hong Kong because it was sort of in everybody's interest, or at least in what they felt to be their interest at the time, for Hong Kong to be successfully reintegrated with China. And of course, Macau returns to Chinese sovereignty just two years later in 1999 as well. So those last vestiges of European colonialism, imperialist, actual control of Chinese territories were both dispensed with at the very end of the 1990s, just as China is emerging into this global economic and political order. So Hong Kong returns to China in 1997 after having been stolen as a part of the Opium Wars in, well, in 1839, 1842. We talked about it earlier, but let's just remind the audience, for those listening to this segment, the sheer magnitude of the violence employed by the British, by Queen Victoria and the British monarchy against China and why China was being punished back in that time period and punished by means of having Hong Kong taken over, stolen by the British? Well, of course, the British acquisition of Hong Kong is an integral part of the Opium War, the first Opium War from 1839 to 42. Uh, The British had been trading with China for centuries, as other Westerners had, but had been dependent upon their supply of silver to purchase Chinese commodities. China was producing the most sophisticated, the most desirable commodities in the world, porcelain, silk textiles, some cotton textiles, other kinds of manufactured goods, tea, 
other agricultural products. And the Chinese were happy to sell these in the global economy. They had been doing this also for centuries. But the foreigners, the Westerners, didn't really have any goods, any products of their own that they could trade with China. So they'd had to be bringing silver to China. Fortunately, they'd had a long and steady supply of silver from the mines of the Spanish New World. But by the 18th century, those resources were diminishing and the British were feeling a little desperate to come up with some way to enhance their trading position with China. They were taking over India at that time. India had the most sophisticated cotton textile industry in the world. The British, who were also ambitious to develop their own cotton textile industry, systematically destroyed the Bengali looms and, and textile production facilities, forced thousands and thousands of Indian farmers out of growing cotton. The British could buy cotton from the slave plantations of the American South, so they disrupted the cotton growing economy of India. But those farmers had to grow something, so the British had them grow opium. And they harvested that opium, processed that into a drug suitable for recreational consumption, found that they could market that in China. And in the early decades of the 19th century, the opium trade grew by leaps and bounds, but it was illegal. It was recognized as a problematic import that the Chinese wanted to regulate and control. The British chose to interpret this as a free trade issue, the ideology of free trade, which was being embraced as industrial development made British commodities more globally competitive, now was utilized as a rationalization for forcing the Chinese to open their ports to British merchants beyond just the single port of Guangzhou or Canton, as the Westerners called it. So the British Navy was sent. They sailed up and down the South China coast for three years, going into harbors, firing their guns at the ports, killing thousands and tens of thousands of Chinese people, all in order to intimidate the Qing dynasty into agreeing to open their ports, which they finally did with the Treaty of Nanjing, the first of the unequal treaties signed in 1842 that opened five additional ports, allowed the British to trade whatever they wanted with whomever they wanted, the flood of goods that poured into China dramatically disrupted China's domestic economy, which had been one of the most sophisticated early capitalist commercial economies in the world. It now collapsed as British goods and other Western goods flooded in. So the events that lead to the acquisition of Hong Kong by the British are part of this larger imperialist imposition that fundamentally changes the geopolitical relationships, not just between Britain and China, but of course, between the European industrial countries and the rest of the world. And it's that legacy, that hangover of classic 19th century British imperialism that finally is brought to an end with the return of Hong Kong in 1997. And again, for our, especially for our U.S. audience, the psychological impact or the impact on the thinking of Chinese people about their place in the world and their place in relationship to Western powers. This is what is called the beginning of the century of humiliation, the seizure of Hong Kong, the importation of opium. And again, a lot of people who are not Chinese or outside of China might not fully recognize the significance of this as a factor in terms of Chinese public opinion. And the reason I mentioned public opinion is that people talk a lot of times about the government or what the government says, but the government, and this goes true for any government, it can't be completely independent from how the masses of people feel, especially if they feel strongly about something. How significant is this development in Hong Kong in terms of Chinese political thinking? Well, it's immensely influential. You know, you mentioned the century of humiliation, which is basically the century from the 1840s to the 1940s, ending, of course, with liberation in 1949 and the establishment of the People's Republic, when, as Mao Zedong says at Tiananmen, the Chinese people have stood up. They've stood up because for a century they had been oppressed. They had been beaten down repeatedly, not just by the British, all the other Western powers, 
pile on the United States, which also was selling opium in China in, in this same period. They were buying their opium from the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean, but the great New England clipper ships were also part of the opium trade. And the French and the others all piled on as well, all signing unequal treaties with China that subjected China to all kinds of humiliations in the course of the 19th and the early 20th century. China lost control over its borders. It lost control over its international revenues first. The unequal treaties gave the foreigners the power to set the tariffs on their own imports. And of course, they set them very, very low. Eventually, even the inland revenue system System within China was taken over and operated by the foreign powers as more and more so-called treaty ports were opened in the interior of China. In 1860-61, there was another opium war as a result of which British and French troops occupied Beijing. They looted, they burned down the Summer Palace, this beautiful complex of buildings northwest of Beijing, and took home to Britain and France art treasures worth probably billions of dollars today that are still, you know, proudly displayed in museums and country houses and chateaux and things like that, just as a straightforward looting of the wealth of imperial China. So these kinds of repeated humiliations, this isn't something that's just sort of, oh, they kind of got the short end of the stick for a while. This was a concerted effort by the Western powers to break China, which had been, as I've said before, had been the most sophisticated, the most prosperous country around. During the Enlightenment in Europe, China had been admired as almost the platonic ideal of good government. But in the 19th century, it became politically necessary and militarily possible to humiliate China. And going from this position of global leadership and respect to one of subordination and oppression becoming a component part of Western imperialist division of labor in the world it had a huge psychological impact on Chinese people. Nowadays, if you read Western bourgeois media about the China relationship and the situation in China, references to the century of humiliation are generally treated as, oh, just get over it, you know, that the Chinese continue to invoke the century of humiliation as if somehow that's not a legitimate historical consciousness or a legitimate position. But, you know, in fact, the legacy of this persists. China, even after liberation in 1949, had to make tremendous efforts to overcome the economic and human deficits which had been created by the systematic exploitation of China, by this whole conjury of Western powers that went on, you know, for over 100 years. So, you know, to be dismissive of that now simply reflects Western attitudes of, in some ways, wishing they could get back to the good old days. There's a lot of sort of romanticization you see in popular media and books and things of the glory days of the treaty ports and what a great time Westerners had in China back in the good old days. And those days are gone and hopefully will never, ever return, not only in China, but anywhere else. And the Chinese people don't forget that. They remember that. It's a living legacy that parents and grandparents pass on to their children, and it shapes the way that China sees itself being treated by other powers in the world today. And I think that it's vital to recognize that. And that's why something like the return of Hong Kong in 1997 was so important. It was celebrated all over China. It wasn't just a ceremony down on the docks in Hong Kong. This was a day of national celebration because the last territories that had been ripped away from China by the brute force of Western guns were coming back into the national embrace. And I think that the continuing awareness of that, the continuing consciousness of that, when the Chinese say, you know, that Western meddling in Hong Kong is interfering in the internal affairs of the country, that's not just political rhetoric. That's a deeply felt sense of sovereignty and the violation of that sovereignty. Quite something that here we are in 2021 and the Western governments, the British, the U.S. government, the U.S. Congress, filled with tender concern about the democratic rights of people in Hong Kong. And during this entire colonial period where this part of China that was seized, 
and was held by the British, there was no democracy, no self-government. The leadership in Hong Kong was appointed not from Beijing. It was appointed in London. Yes. I mean, it's a stunning level of double standard hypocrisy. And yet there's no one, I believe, in the U.S. Congress. And this is a consequence of the complete imperialist demonization of China and the imperialist witch hunt against anyone who retains even an objective faculty about China-US or China-British relations. No one in Congress says, well, wait a second. We didn't stomp our feet and pound our chest and demand sanctions against the British when they were denying people in Hong Kong any even pretend democracy when, in fact, this territory was a colonial subject under the government of London. Right. I mean, the reality is that Hong Kong today is more democratic, if that's how we want to characterize it, than it has ever been, than it was under the British ever. And it is more democratic than it was at the time of its return to Chinese sovereignty. There's been a slow but steady expansion of the franchise. It's structured in particular ways, which are somewhat at variance. It's certainly not a basic two-party, let's trade control back and forth system the way that the United States has. It's not a system that's exactly the same as, say, England itself or Germany. It's closer to other modern post-colonial Asian democracies. I mentioned Indonesia before. Malaysia is another example. But it is a functioning democracy. There are multiple political parties. Elections take place on a regular basis. And that's a significant advance, I suppose one would say, from certainly what the top-down white person from London telling everybody what to do model that was in place you know, for 150 years. The other part, of course, is the idea that the United States Congress or American political figures have any business commenting on and legislating on the internal political arrangements of China, of the People's Republic, of which Hong Kong is an integral part. On what basis do they do that? You know, should China be passing legislation to talk about the situation of native Hawaiians? Should China be imposing sanctions on the United States because of the treatment of African Americans? The hypocrisy of the American Congress is just stunning as they flagrantly, repeatedly, and delightedly intervene, interfere in the internal governance of these territories. When, of course, a city comparable to Hong Kong, the District of Columbia, has no democratic representation in Congress itself. You know, again, the hypocrisy of worrying about the internal affairs of China while completely denying democratic rights to the people of the district, to the people of Puerto Rico, to the people of Guam, you know, the hypocrisy is just amazing. Let's go back to the economic issues, because, of course, that is the priority for China and China's own economic development, the alleviation of widespread and dire poverty in the country. Again, a consequence of the diminution or the devolution of the Chinese economy as a consequence of foreign intervention, as a consequence of the century of humiliation, China's leadership. Well, let's just say this. Since 1949, whether it was the Mao Zedong grouping, which was in leadership, or Deng Xiaoping, or Liu Xiaoqi, or whoever in the Chinese Communist Party, the goal, the top goal, the top priority was always the economic development of China. There's no question about that. What they had differences over was the application of methods, tactical methods, but there was no disagreement that that was the top priority. So here we are in the mid-1990s. China's been integrated to some extent into the world economy. It's not yet in the World Trade Organization. The U.S. hasn't now yet let China, in spite of the fact that it's a very, very, very big country, still has not gained admission. And in 1997, there's a huge financial meltdown in East Asia and in Southeast Asia. And China sort of demonstrates through its own model, which is, again, it's a government led by the Communist Party. It says its perspective is socialist, but it's using a variety of methods, including the market mechanism and private property and capitalist property relations. 
alongside and in parallel with state-owned enterprises and state-owned banks to develop the country, what is called socialism with Chinese characteristics. But the financial crisis sweeps Asia, and it looks like it might be a huge global meltdown And China's economy fares quite well in relationship to others. Let's just talk quickly about the impact of that. And then I want to move to the pivotal year of 2001, which has both the integration of China in December 2001 into the World Trade Organization, but a couple months prior to that, the terrorist attacks on September 11th in New York and Washington, which also impacts China-U.S. relations. But let's start with the mid-90s, 1997 Asian financial crisis. Sure. The financial crisis of 97 was largely a monetary crisis. It was a crisis caused by exchange rate speculators in the global economy. One of the functions of a global capitalist economy gives rise to the ability to buy and sell currencies, different currencies from different countries, in order to try to extract some profit from those exchanges, from those transactions. And speculators in the monetary markets will look for currencies which they feel are either slightly overvalued or slightly undervalued so that they can purchase or sell them and manipulate the markets in ways that will allow them to maximize their profits. And in 97, speculators targeted the currency of Thailand, the baht, as vulnerable went into the Bangkok financial markets and went after the bot in global markets in a way that caused a dramatic collapse in the value of that currency, which had a very negative effect on the Thai economy. But these markets are so integrated and different financial institutions and corporations have holdings in different currencies in ways that mean that a downturn in the value of one currency can have a ripple effect in other areas. And very quickly, this spread through Southeast Asia, in particular in Indonesia, the ringgit, the currency there, came into a serious crisis. It was seen as vulnerable. The Philippines were targeted by monetary speculators, and it began to spread Throughout Southeast Asia, the South Korean currency, the yuan, had a lot of vulnerability and South Korean economy was damaged by this. The other big currency in the region, not so much the renminbi, the currency within China, but the Hong Kong dollar was an obvious target. The Hong Kong dollar famously has historically been incredibly stable. It's been kind of the linchpin of a lot of the monetary markets around Southeast Asia. And so the speculators were hopeful of being able to disrupt that, which would have thrown the system into even greater chaos. But the People's Republic, into which, of course, Hong Kong was just being reintegrated, Uh, The central bank, the People's Bank of China and the central financial authorities moved decisively using the advantages of a socialist economy, the ability of a strong socialist state led by the Communist Party to intervene. They backed the Hong Kong currency. They poured huge amounts of foreign exchange holdings, which they had. China had been accumulating foreign exchange you know, for quite a few years by this point, and they had deep pockets. And they were able to go in, shore up the Hong Kong dollar so that it remained stable which meant that the Hong Kong economy was not disrupted. China's domestic economy was not disrupted. And indeed, these interventions by China served not only to protect Hong Kong and China itself, but became a factor for restabilizing the Southeast Asian monetary system in the later months of 97 and on down through 98 and 99. So it really was a remarkable demonstration of the superiority of a system with a strong central planning authority, an effective economic role for the party and the state, not just the banks and the corporations, but ordinary people whose savings would be denominated in these local currencies. They were the people who would really suffer in these kinds of economic collapses of monetary crises. The banks and the financial operators and the corporations, they would have some trouble, but they would probably be able to weather the storm. But ordinary people are the real vulnerable population in those kind of circumstances. And the actions of China were decisive in keeping China and Hong Kong stable and in helping the rest of the Southeast and East Asian economies to sort of weather the storm better than would have been the case had they been left to the vagaries of the marketplace itself. So 
now let's look at this period. So the financial crisis, Asian financial crisis, a monetary crisis, as you label it in 1997, spills into 1998. I'm reading media reports about how it impacted China because China's goal at that time is also to really fully integrate into the capitalist, imperialist dominated world economy vis-a-vis its admission to the World Trade Organization, the WTO. And again, that finally takes place in December 2001. I want to read to you this one report and ask your opinion about it. After the 1997 Asian financial crisis, China sold off or merged many unprofitable state-owned enterprises. In 1998, China reformed the state council to greatly reduce the mandate of the state planning commission and increase the mandate of the state economic and trade commission. The shift also corresponded to the change in premiership from Li Peng to Zhu Rangji, the latter of whom strongly believed that China needed deeper economic restructuring. This restructuring, which had been happening since the 80s, included many different elements. But again, this was obviously a discussion, a debate, a struggle going on inside of China, but also the sort of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow would be if China's finally admitted into the WTO. But the US and the Western powers say, well, look, there's a price to be paid. The price to be paid to for admission is you have to do other economic reforms that are really not so much about whether they accelerate or decelerate the restoration of capitalist property relations, but whether or not they're beneficial to Western economies. And again, China-U.S. trade had been deeply impacted by the Jackson-Vanik Amendment of 1974 that made it illegal for U.S. technology companies or U.S. companies in general to share or trade in technology either with the Soviet Union or with China. But that sort of prohibitive trade law, the Jackson-Vanik Amendment of 1974, would not apply to a member nation of the WTO. So obviously, China, which was desperately, urgently trying to introduce new and higher technologies into its economy, needed to be able to fully and freely trade in order to have access. So let's just sort of untangle some of this again for our audience. Well, I think that we need to consider this period as an integral part of the overall thrust of Chinese policy over the last 40 plus years, which has been, as you've noted, to try to use these market mechanisms as a way of developing China's economy, of developing the productive economy. China had achieved great things in the first 30 years after liberation, annual economic growth of over 3%, a tremendous enhancement of public health, of life expectancy, reduction of infant mortality, provision of educational services, upgrading of housing, building the economy, employment, lots of great things had gone on. And yet, by 1979, China still faced a kind of egalitarianism of poverty. It was a society that had achieved significant stability and significant progress, but the material conditions of livelihood for the vast majority of people were still rather slim. And the leadership at that point decided that you know, what they really wanted to do was try to move in the direction of the kind of material prosperity and even eventually abundance that would allow for a true socialism, a true socialism in which the fruits of social labor would be socially distributed. But there had to be fruits of that social labor. There had to be, you know, not just the distribution of scarce resources, but the pursuit of that kind of abundance that would allow true socialism to begin to emerge. And they decided, they chose a path which would utilize markets and utilize the integration with the embrace of the existing global economic order in order to advance that project. Marx talks about how people make their own history, but they don't do so in circumstances of their own choosing. You know, they have to work with the conditions that they find themselves in. And China found itself in a global system dominated by American imperialism, dominated by global capital. And what they have tried to do 
is to make the best use of that that they could. And they recognize the kinds of realities that you were just talking about, that in order to be able to access the best productive technologies, to be able to begin to develop their own research and development capabilities, they needed to be a part of that global system. And joining the WTO was going to be a significant threshold towards the attainment of that kind of access. So in a sense, they embarked upon a path, which we have to recognize is a risky endeavor. It's not a guaranteed outcome. Engaging with these market mechanisms, allowing foreign direct investment, allowing the growth of a domestic capital sector, this carries risks. It carries challenges. And the ability of the party to maintain its leading position, to maintain its dedication to the social project. This is obviously going to be vulnerable to certain contradictions. How that will turn out in the end, of course, remains very much a work in progress. But that is the enterprise. That is the project that the party embarked upon and to which they rededicated themselves in the early 90s. And so that pursuit of membership in the WTO a fundamental component, being able to turn that policy, turn that aspiration into a substantive reality to be able to grow the economy. And of course, we know that the reality is that in the first decade plus of the 21st century, the Chinese economy grew at unprecedented rates. The material standards of living of the Chinese people were dramatically enhanced. Hundreds of millions of people could be lifted out of dire poverty. So many of the objectives, many of the ideals that were encompassed in this project were realized. Other contradictory aspects, inequality, environmental stress, things like that came along as well. And those are still in the process of being addressed. But gaining access to the WTO was a critical moment in trying to make that aspiration into a reality. Ken. China is finally admitted into the World Trade Organization in December 2001. Two months before that, the World Trade Center was destroyed, both of the Twin Towers with planes that struck them. We all know that story. Al-Qaeda claimed credit for it or took responsibility for it. And the U.S. embarked on the worldwide war against terrorism, as it was called. I mean, quickly that morphed into just a pretext for imperialist intervention against countries that had nothing to do with September 11th, including the invasion of Iraq in 2003. But during that time period, the U.S. was working with the Chinese government on the issue of terrorism and, in fact, was working with the Chinese government and supporting the Chinese government in anti-terrorist efforts in the western area of Xinjiang, where the Uyghurs are and other non-Han people. Let's talk about what happened right then. It is, I think, very revealing. Right now, the United States poses the question of China's policy in Xinjiang as simply a matter of the violation of human rights, or even a genocide, which is a charge, an allegation for which there is actually no evidence whatsoever. But let's go back. In 2001, the Bush administration and Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, working with and developing a level of relationship or cooperation with China. Let's talk about that. Well, I think it's a very contradictory period in some ways. We should remember, too, that just a couple of years before this, there had been the incident where American warplanes bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade during the NATO interventions into the wars in the former Yugoslavia. There had been tensions in the air over the South China Sea around Hainan Island between American aircraft and Chinese PLA aircraft that were defending China's airspace. So there'd been frictions, certainly, in the late 90s and right around the turn of in, into the 21st century. But with the events of 9-11, the Bush administration certainly uh, strikes out in a pretty single-minded direction of the so-called war on terror which, as you know, quickly morphs beyond that and becomes a pretext for the invasion of Iraq and other kinds of imperialist adventures, many of which continue on down to the present day. But it does lead to a, I suppose we might almost call it a marriage of convenience, at least for a while, 
between the United States and China over these issues of Islamic fundamentalism, the efforts by some elements within the Islamic world, and we want to be clear that this is a particular subset, a particular grouping, set of groupings within the much broader Islamic community, who have the ambition of creating these Islamic states, these religious states, which would impose their own rules and regulations, Sharia law, and other kinds of governance on populations. And China was facing some elements of this in the far west, in Xinjiang. There had been in Xinjiang all the way back in the 1930s, a breakaway so-called Republic of East Turkestan, which had tried to, at that time, establish an Islamic state, denying things like education to women and other kinds of more modernist policies that had been in place under the Republic in China. But now, at this time, the United States and China could cooperate. They could find some common interests, some mutual interest in trying to push back against this tide of Islamic fundamentalism. Fighters from Xinjiang, Uyghurs and Tajiks and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz and people like this, who were attracted to the fundamentalist program, were being trained in Afghanistan, were being trained in camps elsewhere, were taking part in terrorist activities, both within China and being deployed in other parts of the world as well. And so for a while, there was a convergence of interest in which American and Chinese intelligence communities collaborated on measures designed to fight back against these threats. We should remember that there were a number of Uyghur fighters who had been captured in Afghanistan who wound up being interned at Guantanamo. And while we are resolutely opposed to the maintenance of Guantanamo as this renegade international prison, it's also worth taking note that these Uyghur fighters were part of this broad fundamentalist coalition, not just something confined to Afghanistan or a particular country, but something that was truly international in its own way. And that threat has persisted. When we consider the situation in Xinjiang over the last 20 plus years, you know, it has involved ongoing terrorist activities, again, not just in Xinjiang, in other parts of China, including all the way up to the national capital in Beijing, where bombings and other attacks have been carried out. So this is an ongoing problem. Now, of course, as the interests of American capital and the Chinese socialist project have diverged again, The specter of genocide and human rights violations and all this is used pretty regularly to beat on China. But the fact that that is utilized in one historical moment and totally overwritten in another historical moment certainly suggests the politically convenient and politically motivated nature of these kinds of accusations. The use of the genocide label, as you noticed, is completely unsupported and really shameful for the politicians, not just Americans, but the politicians in the West who've been mouthing this. Yes, and in our last segment in this series on the foreign policy of the People's Republic of China, we'll go a little bit more into what's happening in the western part of China in Xinjiang and with the Uyghurs. We'll talk more about that. But again, during this time period, In 2001, 2002, the U.S. government labeled these organizations like the East Turkestan Liberation Organization and East Turkestan Islamic Movement officially as terrorist organizations. Those labels have been removed now as the U.S. makes the argument that the only thing that's happening in Western China is a systematic discrimination and racism by the majority Han government of the People's Republic of China against minority peoples, Muslim peoples, the Uyghurs, and that, in fact, the Chinese government is committing genocide. And this is, without evidence being provided, accepted, again, because now, while there is still some degree and some level of cooperation between the U.S. and China, the atmosphere has turned sharply in a different direction towards great power conflict, preparing the population here in the United States for eventual war and certainly with confrontation with China. So the whole way the struggle in Western China with the Uyghurs is framed is so fundamentally different than it was just 19 years ago. 
Ken, I want to close this segment though, because we've gotten to 2001. China is allowed admission into the World Trade Organization. Robert O'Brien, the national security advisor, the second final or third final national security advisor for Donald Trump, one of his last speeches, working in tandem with Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State for Trump, they both unleashed this like huge attack against China as they were going out the door following the their loss in the November 2020 election. But Robert O'Brien said, admitting China to the World Trade Organization was a mistake. What we, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have a speech in front of me, but what he's saying is that we assumed that China would become more like us, that China would become more liberal, that it would adopt our democratic values. All of this euphemistic language, meaning we anticipated that the Chinese Communist Party, if it was fully integrated into a world capitalist economy, would either leave the path of socialism or be overthrown by those who insisted on leaving the path of socialism. And instead, China having access to the world economy, having some degree of free trade, has been able to use its access to markets and to technology to grow and to develop, to alleviate poverty. And if anything, the government in China, the communist-led government, is stronger now, more popular now than it would have been in 2001. So the problem, the fundamental mistake, was the United States should never, ever, ever have let China into the WTO, meaning we should have just continued to try to economically isolate China, sanction China, deprive China of access. And now as the U.S. government is pursuing a policy of decoupling or trying to remove U.S. connection to China in supply lines, it's a policy being pursued by the Democrats and the Republicans. But we'll talk about all of that in our next and final segment in this series. But I just want to have you, if you would, take us in broad strokes from 2001, China's admitted into the World Trade Organization, up to 2010, 2011, when Barack Obama announces a pivot to Asia. And just again, for our audience, the U.S. has pivoted to Asia multiple times in the past. It did so in 1899, and a million Filipinos died. It pivoted towards Asia at the end of World War II, and the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Japanese cities. It pivoted to Asia in 1950 with the war against Korea. It pivoted to Asia again with the war in Vietnam. America's pivots to Asia have been pretty bad for Asians. And we have Barack Obama announcing the pivot to Asia in 2011. And in our final episode, Ken, we're going to focus on the years from 2011 to 2021, that last decade. But let's talk about the remaining part of the first decade of the 2000s from 2001 to 2010. China continues to grow economically. There's indications that America is becoming uncomfortable. The attacks on China are growing, but they haven't congealed into this new doctrine of major power conflict is inevitable. I certainly thought during that entire period, what China was basically trying to do was not poke the bear, not create a confrontation with the U.S., not challenge U.S. hegemony in other areas. It didn't really challenge in a strong way the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Even in 2011, when the U.N. passed the resolution authorizing force against the independent government in Libya, the Gaddafi government, China and Russia, who could have vetoed it because they have veto power at the Security Council, they didn't veto. They didn't vote yes. They abstained, but they refused to use their veto. So it seemed to me that China was more or less trying to just at least delay the confrontation with the United States by not challenging the tenets of American hegemonic rule, global rule, except for perhaps right in China's own backyard. Anyway, do you agree with that? Yes, I think that to understand that decade in particular, we need to reflect back just slightly to Deng Xiaoping, who died in 1997. Deng Xiaoping, earlier in the 1990s, had advised the then leader of the party, Jiang Zemin, 
And again, I don't have the quote right in front of me, but basically he had advised that China going forward from that point should kind of take a low profile, not really push its agenda, but use the opportunities which were emerging to develop the economy. Use this period as a time to sort of build domestic capabilities, economically, politically, militarily, but keep a low profile Get along and go along and as you exactly as you say, don't poke the bear, don't rock the boat. Because there was an understanding that this was a, an experiment, it was a venture, and in order for it to succeed, China needed to be able to continue to have access to the global economy, continue to be able to attract foreign investment, continue to be able to accumulate foreign reserves, to operate even its state-owned enterprises in profitable ways. It needed to continue pursuing its course of accumulation in order to enrich the country, in order to raise people's livelihoods, all of that, but that they wanted to do that in a way that didn't provoke confrontation with or even particularly anxiety on the part of the Western powers. And of course, that decade from 2001 to 2011, the United States in particular was pretty focused on this war on terror, you know, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the problems with Libya, the emerging situation in Syria, all of those things. That's really what the sort of neoliberal, neoconservative, those funny sort of interchangeable terms, leadership in Washington was focused on. And they kept an eye on China. They were certainly paying attention to what was developing there. But China was on the back burner. China wasn't the main concern. China had joined the WTO. They had done so. They had jumped through the appropriate hoops to do so. And so this was the decade when the Western powers, especially the United States, the capitalist elite in the West, they kind of hoped and told themselves that the magic was just going to work itself out in China. It might take some time, but they needed to be a little patient with it. They had other fish to fry right then. But eventually, China would, as you were just saying, would sort of automatically be transformed, either by the leadership changing its orientation or by some sort of color revolution or dramatic regime change event, but that the growth of the economy, the growth of markets in China would inevitably lead to its transformation. And really the pivot, when the pivot comes along in 2011, it's kind of a reflection of American elites realizing that that wasn't what was happening. That isn't the path that China was taking. And of course, the pivot takes place in 2011. The new leadership under Xi Jinping comes into place in 2012. And that ushers in a new era, a new phase in China. And I know that that's what we want to talk about in our final session, the period since 2011-2012, in which China has taken a little more proactive, a little more assertive position in the world. But I think understanding that first decade of the 20th century, really it was a conscious choice on the part of the Chinese leadership to play it low key, to take it in under the radar, let the process go forward, achieve some of the objectives of the reform period, and allow China to become strong enough, self-reliant enough that when the time came, they would be able to stand up to the bullying of the West on a much more solid basis. When one studies history, you can't but notice that history is filled, even though there are strong identifiable patterns, that it's filled with unexpected twists and turns. There is, in fact, what might be called the law of unintended consequences. And so history is filled with all kinds of ironies. One of the ironies here that we've been summarizing is that the United States, after the collapse of the socialist camp, partly brought about by the U.S. machinations that divided China and the Soviet Union from each other, but after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the socialist camp, the United States was indeed the unipolar power of the world. No one contested with American hegemony, really. And as a consequence, the U.S. grew very, very arrogant. Its hubris was, in a way, untethered. And so as the neocons came into office, especially 
I mean, Clinton, he wasn't a neocon, but they destroyed the last remaining socialist government in Europe, the Yugoslav government and the NATO war in 1999. Then Bush comes in and the neocons and they're like, no, we're going to remake the whole Middle East. We're going to invade Iraq and then we're going to take down Libya and we're going to take down Syria and we're going to take down Hezbollah in Lebanon and we're going to reshape Somalia. And finally, the big prize, we're going to we're going to take down Iran, too. We're going to take down all the governments of the resource rich Middle East that were independent and born out of the anti-colonial struggles earlier. We're going to do that because we can. That's how strong they felt. And so they went to war in the Middle East and into South Asia. They got bogged down in that war. They didn't or couldn't really respond to the rise of China peacefully sort of under the radar And during that entire decade, while they were bogged down in wars that they could not win, wars that were not necessary, wars that were really motivated by this unipolar imperial arrogance and hubris, China China grew. And today, Ken, it's not a unipolar world. It's not a unipolar world at all. China took advantage and grew strong because it wasn't under ferocious attack. Russia got back on its feet. It is one of those ironies of history that American arrogance after the collapse of the socialist camp, its preoccupation with being the unipolar power has in fact facilitated the development of a multipolar world. I'll give you the final word. Well, I think the final word, I'm not sure exactly the locus classicus, I think it might even be biblical, is that pride goeth before a fall. It is becoming increasingly clear that in the 21st century, the world's strategic and economic center of gravity will be the Asia Pacific, from the Indian subcontinent to the western shores of the Americas. And one of the most important tasks of American statecraft over the next decades will be to lock in a substantially increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic, and otherwise in this region. We're going to talk about 2011 to 2021. This is the last decade in this multi-part series on China's foreign policy. We began the series looking at the first decade, 1949 to 1959. That was the period where the Chinese government was in close alliance with the Soviet Union, The two countries together, along with their socialist allies in Eastern and Central Europe and North Vietnam and North Korea, constituted two-fifths of the world's population. And then that alliance began to fray, and it frayed throughout the 1960s. It broke apart. China was no longer in and perhaps an adversary with the socialist camp. Then the Soviet Union collapses in the late While the Eastern European governments in the late 1980s, the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, we begin and began in our last discussion, China's foreign policy under these new world situation, the new world environment, where the US had basically proclaimed itself the unipolar power in the world. It went on the war path immediately. It began to take down independent anti-colonial governments or governments that had their origin in the anti-colonial project that included attacks on Iraq, of course, the invasion of Afghanistan right before that, the war directed against Yugoslavia in 1999. And then finally, the U.S. is following the invasion of Iraq, bogged down in the Middle East. Then in 2011, the Arab Spring begins, a new a really new moment in politics in the Middle East. It begins as a people's rebellion against the government, the anti-democratic governments in Tunisia. It spreads to Egypt. It leads to this phenomenal events in the middle of Cairo that brings down the Mubarak government. But then on March 19th, 2011, the U.S. uses protests in Libya as a pretext to begin or to launch a NATO war against Libya. Now, 2011, Ken, is a very eventful year. We have the Arab Spring. Then there is, as I mentioned, the NATO attack against Libya. Later, the Obama administration in Australia, in Hawaii, in multiple places, 
announces that the U.S. is going to engage in what was called a pivot to Asia. Let's start and talk about that year. When the year started, or in the early part of the year, the U.S. and its NATO partners, Britain and France in particular, went to war against Libya. They destroyed the Libyan government, massive daily bombings of the country. And they went there with UN authorization. Resolution 1783 authorized the use of force. And the US and Britain and France said they were going to Libya. They began the bombing of Libya to protect civilians. Now, that was a ruse. What they were really trying to do was carry out regime change. The reason they could use a UN authorization is that Russia and China decided not to veto the resolution authorizing the use of force, but rather abstained. And that allowed the U.S. to have the the fig leaf of legitimacy, the U.N. mantle. Let's start there because um, things change dramatically over the next few years. But let's start with the decision by the Chinese government to abstain rather than to veto the bombing of Libya. Well, I think that that reflects what had been China's sort of international posture over the previous decade and more, which, as we talked about a little bit last time, this period of of kind of keeping a low profile, being non-confrontational with the Western powers, especially with the United States. This was the era, the first decade of the 21st century, carrying on from you know the 1990s of the Chinese emphasizing these phrases such as peaceful rise, that they wanted to very much present an international attitude of, uh, you know, we're not going to rock the boat. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to shake things up. We just want to go about our business in developing our economy and pursuing our own domestic agendas. And of course, fundamental to that was the continuing role that China was playing of being a major exporter in the global economy, becoming increasingly integrated in the global economy, but primarily as an exporter to Western markets and markets in other parts of the world as well. And I think that that whole period under the leadership of Jiang Zemin and then under Hu Jintao was one where China very self-consciously kept this kind of low profile, this kind of turning a kind of inoffensive face towards the international community. As you say, that was just about to change kind of in, in two different ways in response to the more aggressive posture, which the United States was just about to assume, but also with changes of leadership within China itself, with the election of Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang in 2012 to the leading positions in the party and the government. But that in 2011, that that was still in the future. And I think that those kind of abstentions at the United Nations in the Security Council were really, really indicative of this, you know, more low key, this low profile approach that China had been pursuing. In the case of Russia, Putin was not the head of state at that time. The head of state was Medvedev. And Putin decided to run again in the next election after that. And part of the, at least the scuttlebutt, was that he was angry that the Russian government at that time had also abstained, that he felt it was a geostrategic error outside of morality and ethics and all that, just from a geostrategic premise, that it weakened Russia, it strengthened the United States. Certainly, from the point of view of what happened in the Middle East after that, when the U.S. was able to destroy the government of Libya after relentless bombing and then the lynching, basically, of Muammar Gaddafi, the 70-year-old head of state, in the streets, Hillary Clinton you know, had that famous video that day. She was smiling giddy, laughing. And she said, we came, we saw, he died. That was about a lynching of a head of state. And immediately the U.S. turned its guns, its attention to Syria. And there was a similar uprising going on in Syria against the Ba'athist government led by Bashar al-Assad. And the U.S. felt, I think, the Obama administration, which had been somewhat, Obama himself had been somewhat hesitant about going to war against NATO. It was really Hillary Clinton and the Washington Post and, you know, the usual suspects in Washington in the military industrial complex who were demanding 
a war. He went along finally, but it was so successful that immediately the U.S. turned towards Syria and Obama's new mantra was Assad must go, Gaddafi must go. Earlier, Saddam Hussein had to go and he was executed. Gaddafi executed in the streets. Now Assad must go. So it created this amazing momentum for additional imperialist intervention in the Middle East. Do you think that the Chinese were alarmed? I I know that in Russia, the foreign policy grouping was alarmed. Putin came back into power. He won the election for presidency. And in 2013, moved decisively to intervene militarily to prevent the overthrow of another government similar to the Libyan government. And that turned out to be decisive. But do you think it had an impact on the foreign policy calculations of the Chinese that the Americans were so aggressive and that abstaining or appeasing American imperialism was having perhaps the opposite impact? Yes, I think it did. I think that it's a combination, of course, of both the actions that the United States was taking in the Middle East and in North Africa. And of course, you know, these high profile events such as the regime change campaign in Libya and then the increasing interventions in Syria, those are kind of the headline grabbers. But of course, you know, American forces have been operative in West Africa, in places like Mali, down, of course, continuing in Somalia and elsewhere in Africa and other parts of the world as well, that American interventionism in under the Obama administration was, oddly enough, actually on the rise. And I think that in tandem with then the things like the announcements of the pivot to Asia, that seemed to be in some ways a, a statement that, you know, well, we've kind of got the situation in the Middle East under control. We've kind of got this, this situation with the challenge of Islamic fundamentalism under control. So now we're going to start turning our attention to China. And I think that the foreign policy formulators in China heard that loud and clear and understood that the Obama administration certainly felt that they were on a roll, they were gaining control over the situation, and that you know China was going to be next to sort of be brought in line. And I think that the realization of that contributes directly to the kind of reorientation of China's self-presentation, if nothing else, that comes along with the ascendancy of Xi Jinping. The next year, after the events of 2011, the Philippines, this was before Duterte, the Philippines, under really the direction, the guidance of the Obama administration, the U.S. State Department, at that time led by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, files a claim against the People's Republic of China over its claimed territorial sovereignty in the South and East China Sea and marine rights. And they filed this claim, not in an Asian court, but in The Hague. Talk about that. And I believe that must have been a real shocker for China, especially given the fact that this international tribunal ruled against China in the Netherlands about whether China had sovereignty in the South and East China Sea. Well, that whole case, of course, was a fascinating exercise because China's not a member of that body. It has never acknowledged the legitimacy of that legal authority. So for the Philippines to, you know, bring litigation in that context, you know, was clearly a move in which it was kind of a slap in the face to China to begin with. And the idea, yes, that a court based in Europe, one which, of course, the United States itself also does not recognize the authority of, although it counseled, as you say, the Philippines in initiating this effort. So it's clearly pretty much a public relations exercise to try to get a ruling that would bolster the position of the Philippines. And of course, that's, you know, the court, the panel ruled that the Chinese claims had no legitimate basis, no grounds. And that has become a reference point. You see that decision cited quite regularly in every discussion of the South China Sea that takes place now. Of course, the issue in the South China Sea 
interestingly enough, is not one that was actually initiated by the government of the People's Republic. The claims, the territorial claims that China has in the South China Sea predate the establishment of the People's Republic. They go back to the period of the Republic and in some ways even earlier than that. But both the government of the People's Republic of China and the local authorities in Taiwan maintain these claims. The idea somehow that this is associated solely with China's expansionism in the present moment is just not grounded in reality. The control over these islands, the use of these islands by Chinese merchants and by Chinese navigators goes back, well, goes back many centuries, but the claims to them in terms of modern legal standing go back well into the earlier part of the 20th century. So the Philippines, you know, the Philippines have navigated a kind of tortuous route in their relation with China, sometimes tacking towards China, sometimes tacking towards the United States, trying to sort of, you know, maximize their own positions, but increasingly recognizing the sort of realities, I don't know if you say on the ground, but in the region that really reflect the relative positions within the South China Sea. It's ironic, too, when you think about it, Ken, that the U.S. is helping the Philippines file claims at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, in the Netherlands, not in Asia, to defend Philippine sovereignty over these areas when the United States invaded the Philippines in 1899. I mean, that was the first real pivot to Asia. Very, very bad for the Filipinos. A million Filipinos died. Aquinaldo was taken prisoner, died, murdered. The assertions and claims of independence for the Filipino people snuffed out. The Philippines made into a colony by the United States and only formally becoming independent after World War II in 1946. And here you have the Obama administration with a straight face telling China, look, we're standing with the Philippines in defense of its sovereignty over its territories, which, by the way, just happen to be the islands and the area, the maritime areas that you, China, have asserted historic rights to. And the court, the court in the Netherlands ruled, quote, although Chinese navigators and fishermen, as well as those of other states, had historically made use of the islands in the South China Sea, there was no evidence that China had historically exercised exclusive control over the waters or their resources. You have the the Europeans and the Americans who have pivoted to China and to Vietnam and to Asia writ large in such a colossally devastating way, colonizing, invading, killing, murdering, robbing the peoples of Asia, and then to become the great sort of podium at which the great mantra about the rules of sovereignty and the rule of law is dictated. I mean, it's hard to beat in terms of a double standard. Well, it reflects, of course, we're hearing echoes of this a lot right now with all this rhetoric about an international rules-based order and all these accusations by American diplomats, Secretary of State Blinken and others, that China is somehow challenging the international rules-based order, when in fact, it's a rules-based order that's been entirely made up by the West, by the United States, most preeminently since World War II. And so, you know, what China's actually being accused of is, you know, not playing by our rules, you know, by the American rules. There's a high degree of irony involved in all of that. You know, you mentioned just a moment ago talking about the region around the South China Sea. Vietnam, of course, is another country that has some concerns, some issues in the South China Sea, some issues about some of these territorial claims. But the contrast between Vietnam and the Philippines is fascinating that, you know, Vietnam, which has its own long and very complex historical relationship with China, Vietnam chooses to pursue these issues, these concerns bilaterally, by negotiation, by discussion, you know, not to become a kind of pawn of American interests in the area, although the Americans have certainly tried to get Vietnam on board. They've made a number of offers of particular kinds of aid. They even wanted recently to try to get the Vietnamese to allow them to station coastal naval forces in southern Vietnam 
because that would be useful in case there is a conflict in the South China Sea. And Vietnam steadfastly has declined to do that. The Americans conduct themselves in Southeast Asia as if no one there has any historical memory of how, you know, the United States colonized the Philippines. The United States, you know, waged a war for 20 years to try to dominate Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. They act as though all of that is simply in the past and therefore forgotten. And no one remembers what America's real imperialist conduct was like. But certainly, you know, the people in the region, especially China, Vietnam, those folks who had pretty direct experience, uh, have a pretty clear understanding. One of the parts of the Asia pivot or one of the features you could see, especially with the U.S. championing Philippine rights purportedly at The Hague, is the U.S. was trying to create a network of exclusion, and this was part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well, that the U.S. would weld together the other ASEAN nations, the other Asian nations into a U.S.-sponsored or a U.S.-backed campaign or network against China That seems to me to be fanciful. I mean, not only do the Vietnamese and the Chinese still, in spite of all of the differences, including, as we said, the 1979 military conflict, the two parties, the communist parties in China and Vietnam have close ties. The governments have close ties. They have diplomatic ties. But if you're a smaller country, and Vietnam's not small, it's 90 million people, but smaller than China, but no matter how big or small you are, if you're not China, but living nearby China, for the most part, you're going to want to have good relations with China. Absolutely. And I think ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has done a very fine job of sort of creating a regional identity for itself. You know, back after World War II, in the period where decolonization struggles were underway in the Netherlands, East Indies, in British Malaya, in French Indochina, the United States tried to replicate the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization system. And they actually went in and sort of created what they called CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, I guess it was, with an effort to make that into an anti-communist front that would facilitate American dominance in the region. You know, as the French, the British, and the Dutch departed, the Americans, even though granting formal independence to the Philippines, they nonetheless maintained a major military presence in the Philippines. And they wanted to become, you know, sort of the region hegemon. But CETO faded away after the United States rather ignominiously was forced to withdraw from Indochina. And the countries of Southeast Asia, although they certainly have their differences, they have different systems, they have different traditions, they have different interests, have managed to create this association which interestingly enough has been internally sort of self-critical. You know, the ASEAN is dealing with its relationship, for example, with Myanmar right now. They were critical of the situation, the relationship between Vietnam and Cambodia for a while. You know, so it isn't as though they're just a sort of big group hug. They're a very sophisticated set of countries. And ASEAN as a whole has taken a very, very positive stand towards China. They're participating in regional trade agreements agreements. And I think that the American attempts to manufacture a geopolitical crisis in the South China Sea is getting a lot of traction in places like Australia, but not really much in the region itself. The people who surround the South China Sea are interested in having it be a realm of peace rather than a realm of conflict, which is the objective of the United States. Ken, I want to go a little bit to the actual announcement, the shift in U.S. policy that is known as the Asia pivot or the American pivot to Asia. I'm looking at Brookings Institute. Brookings, of course, a leading Washington ruling class think tank. It's a picture of President Obama standing next to the Chinese leadership in India and Japan and Russia at what was the East Asia Summit Indonesia 2011. And this article is written on December 21st, 2011. Here's, I'm going to read a couple of sentences and then I want to talk to you about the Asia pivot and what Obama meant then and what, you know, before we talk about how it's evolved or devolved. Here it goes. 
The sudden death of North Korean leader Kim Jong-il, again, this is 2011, drives home the importance of being able to work not only with U.S. allies, but with China in managing Asia's key threats. This is what makes striking the right balance in America's overall strategy towards Asia so vital. Okay, that sounds not that aggressive. Next paragraph. The Obama administration's overall posture towards Asia has, in fact, evolved considerably over the course of the past couple of years. President Obama laid out the results in fullest form last month as he traveled to Honolulu, Australia, and Indonesia for a series of major meetings. The message of this remarkable trip warrants careful examination as it articulated an integrated diplomatic, military, and economic strategy that stretches from the Indian subcontinent through Northeast Asia and one that can profoundly shape the U.S.-China relationship. The core message, America is going to play a leadership role in Asia for decades to come. Now, that sounds so, like, benign. The other thing that the article doesn't highlight is that part of the Asia pivot was a military plan to redeploy U.S. military forces largely from wars in the Middle East where the U.S. was bogged down and not succeeding while China was rising peacefully in the Asia-Pacific region and redeploying the plan was by 2020, a year ago, to have 60% of all U.S. naval and Air Force assets in the Pacific. Again, when you think about Trans-Pacific Partnership, there was an economic component, the attempt to sort of become the guarantor of Philippines or other non-Chinese Asian republics, that was had a diplomatic element to it. But at the bottom of all of it, when you redeploy 60% of your Air Force and Navy or have 60% of it deployed into the Pacific at a time when the United States is not at war, it's not at war in Vietnam, not at war in Korea, not at war with China, the Chinese must have, in a hard-headed sort of way, looked at this, perceived of this as something other than benign. Absolutely. I think that the military foundation of the pivot is really the key to it. You know, diplomatic talk and, you know, let's facilitate some trade, uh, you know, that's all very nice. But what you're really talking about is ramping up the military presence of the United States in a ring, really, to the extent that they can, leaving out, of course, the Russian border, but surrounding China, confronting China as much as possible with American military force. And, you know, this this came in tandem, not only the announcement of the pivot to Asia, but Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had also published some articles in foreign policy journals talking about sort of the necessity to launch another American century, you know, another period of American dominance in the world. And I think that 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 gets down to the real bottom line here, which is this idea that for a while the United States felt like maybe it was going to be this, you know, unipolar sole superpower in the years after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the end of the Cold War. But then there were the challenges that came from the Middle East and from the war in Iraq and everything that stemmed from that. But then by the time of the Obama administration, the American elites, you know, as, as we were talking about earlier, kind of began to feel like, well, maybe they had that under control. And as they then turn their attention back to China, this is when they began to feel like, well, wait, China's becoming this major economic power. They're having greater political influence in the region. They're developing their military capabilities, but they're not turning into a liberal bourgeois democracy. There's no color revolution. There's no regime change there. We thought that they were going to become our happy little junior partners in in a global order that the United States could dominate. And I think that American policymaking elites began to really kind of wake up to that their dream of China becoming just like us wasn't going to happen and was never really on the Chinese agenda at all. And so you get this new assertiveness, this new aggressiveness, whether it's the the rather remarkable declaration that we're going to have another century of American domination. I mean, how the chutzpah involved in that is just astonishing. But the much more 
pragmatic or the much more effective message of we're going to deploy 60% of our military force with the pretty obvious objective of containing China. Sure, the Chinese leadership looked at that and saw a new containment policy, a new version of George Kennan's old line about the Soviet Union, now focused on the People's Republic. And nothing since then, nothing since 2011, nothing in the last 10 years, has been anything other than a continued assertion and indeed an extension, an enhancement, a buildup of that confrontational containment type policy towards China. But the military redeployment and all these war game scenarios and all these reconfigurations of the kinds of forces that are going to be deployed, all of that has been oriented towards the possibility, if not from certain elite perspectives, the desirability of military confrontation with China. I'm looking at the magazine Defense One. It's a, one of these multiple industry, military industrial complex industry magazines, very popular with the big war contractors, and of course, you know, a voice of the Pentagon. The headline of this article, which was written a year ago, but it goes, it's like, here we are, that was nine years after the announced pivot to Asia, or about really almost eight years, because Hillary Clinton had been announcing it a little bit, but then Obama put the final official announcement in December 2011. Here's the article. The U.S. wants to intimidate China with hypersonics, comma, once it solves the physics. This is the headline. The U.S. is pressing ahead with new missiles, but questions remain about engineering tactics and even geopolitics. A small set of uninhabited Pacific islands very close to China may be the destination of some of America's most sophisticated and controversial future weapons, hypersonic missiles that remain nimble, even at five times the speed of sound, meaning these missiles that can you know, carry a nuclear payload or a conventional payload are moving that fast. On Friday, U.S. Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy said the still in development weapons would likely change the future of war. Speaking at Brookings Institute, McCarthy said hypersonics would be a new kind of multi-domain task force that the Army was rolling out. These highly mobile units will be deployed to attack enemies at long ranges with electronic warfare, cyber attacks, and long-range munitions such as hypersonic missiles. And then he said the new units can be or will be deployed to what he calls the Senkaku or other nearby island chains. What they're saying, Ken, is the Pentagon is planning a confrontation with China At these islands, some of these disputed islands, the U.S. wants to put in these hypersonic missiles that travel five times the speed of sound. That would mean that China would have to be on constant alert because that means those weapons could hit their targets literally within, if not seconds, certainly minutes. That was partly the strategy that the Reagan White House and the Pentagon pursued in the early 1980s when it ringed the Soviet Union with intermediate and short-range tactical nuclear weapons that had a flight time of six minutes to their target. And the U.S. targeted every Soviet political office in the whole country with these nuclear missiles. And so the Soviet Union became very alarmed. The Soviet Union felt, especially in the early years of the Reagan administration, that they had to prepare for war. They had to divert lots of resources away from other industries and away from consumer products to get ready. It created immense tension. And then Reagan could say later to Gorbachev, hey, let's relax things. You give us Eastern Europe and, you know, we'll integrate you into the world economy and we can, you know, limit the level of tension. It had a profound impact on Soviet thinking. The other part of this that I think if this all sounds crazy to people, the U.S. nuclear war strategy and the U.S. is modernizing to the tune of about 2 to $3 trillion its nuclear weapons capability to use nuclear weapons that are more usable, meaning more mobile, maybe have adjustable yields, something that could be used in battlefield situations. The U.S. is modernizing its nuclear weapons systems, but the U.S. nuclear weapons program was always premised on the first strike, not first use, but first strike, meaning the goal of the U.S.' 
nuclear planners, contrary to everything that we're told in the public, was to strike the enemy first with nuclear weapons, and then the rest of the nuclear weapon or missile defense shield capability would be able to mop up and capture or catch or mitigate a retaliatory strike from the enemy. It was always an aggressive first strike policy. And the calculation in this weird, bizarre, Dr. Strangelove-like thinking, which is actually U.S. military doctrine, the official doctrine, is that if the U.S. were to engage earlier the Soviets or today China in a real fierce military battle close to their countries, the U.S. would have the first strike capability such that the Chinese wouldn't play chicken. In other words, that the U.S. would be able to limit the conflict to the regional area where these new weapon systems would be deployed, betting that China wouldn't take the step up the escalation ladder such that it would risk having thermonuclear war with the United States when the U.S. is fully prepared for such an event. Now, that all seems crazy, but actually that's how the Pentagon is thinking right now. Yeah, it's not a reassuring moment. There's been so much talk just in the last few months around the situation with Taiwan. The United States has been, and including especially the new Biden administration, has been very provocative towards China around the issues of Taiwan, not just with new arms sales, but the Biden administration has undertaken kind of diplomatic moves, which are unprecedented since the 1970s, inviting representatives from the Taiwanese local government to the inauguration in January, suggesting that new policies about official relations between the local authorities in Taiwan and the American government should be considered. Those are very provocative diplomatic moves. And of course, not just the Biden administration, but congressional voices, which are always much more provocative, overtly call for American military intervention to support Taiwanese independence and all this kind of rhetoric. And the United States, you know, sending naval forces through the Taiwan Straits, through what are really China's domestic waters, you know, and then, of course, American politicians turning around and American military spokesmen turning around and saying, oh, China's becoming so much more aggressive about Taiwan. When in fact, all China is doing is taking defensive measures in response to these aggressive moves by the Americans. The Chinese are not unaware of these planned deployments of new weapon systems and things like that. They're not unaware. They can read these you know, publications <laughs> as well as anybody else. They're not unaware of this much more aggressive mentality that has emerged in both political and military circles towards China. So it's a frightening period in terms of these relationships. I think that you know the Chinese understand very, very clearly that it's not in anybody's interest to have open military conflict about Taiwan or about the South China Sea or about anything else. But you know, should the United States intervene directly in Taiwan, in the Taiwan Straits, there are national interests that get involved and, you know, one doesn't like to contemplate the way that those things might play out. But I think it's a very, very dangerous moment. And it's a moment when we really, all of us need to be speaking out about de-escalating these tensions, about the need to stop the aggressive actions of American military and political figures and the anti-China rhetoric that's so prevalent in the American media. This is a time when the voices for peace between China and the United States really need to be speaking out as loudly and clearly as possible. China integrated into the world capitalist economy. It was allowed access to it after the opening up in 1978, 79. And the deal was basically U.S. corporations got to invest in China. They got to make a lot of money. They could employ Chinese labor at wages that were far lower than the wages that they would have to pay U.S. workers in Michigan or Ohio or Pennsylvania. And because of new technologies, they could ship those products anywhere else, including back to the United States, and it would still be a lower cost of production. That was the deal. And China got access to technology. Many people, millions, hundreds of millions became employed wage workers as opposed to living in the countryside. 
It helped alleviate poverty. New cities were built in sometime in a matter of a few years. The face of China shifted dramatically in those 40 years. The American government at that time thought, one, it's going to be good for our corporations. Two, it fastens China to us as a sort of a political ally, and it makes China in some way subservient because it can't break free from the world economy. And we, the capitalists in the West, still dominate the world economy. The dollar is the world's reserve currency. There's the SWIFT payment systems. There's all kinds of methods whereby the U.S. in particular dominates the global economy. So that seemed to be okay. And here we are now with a complete reorientation of the U.S. towards major power conflict with China, preparing for conflict in the South or East China Sea, the military preparing for perhaps even a larger war. And at the same time, even the U.S. technology companies and the U.S., in many cases, thus the U.S. military companies, are reliant on, partly on, reliant on products that come from China. So there's this weird, odd contradiction that has developed as a consequence of U.S. policy, China has integrated into the world economy, but now having identified China as the main enemy that must be fought sometime in the future, the U.S. is also making the argument that the U.S. military and U.S. technology companies have to be self-reliant and can't be dependent on Chinese manufacture. And so there's this effort underway to what's called decoupling. And you also see that U.S. technology companies that were not faring well in comparison to their Chinese competitors like Huawei and the introduction of 5G technology used, and the government used national security as a pretext to sanction Chinese companies, to prevent or prohibit American companies or U.S. or Western companies from buying important strategic parts from Chinese companies. The CFO, the chief financial officer of Huawei was arrested when she got off a plane in Canada. She's still not free. Let's just talk about this phenomena, the irony, the contradictoriness of decoupling and whether the U.S. at this stage could actually decouple from the Chinese economy. Well, I think the term contradiction is exactly the applicable terminology here because China's integration into the global system, the global economic system, which is largely the global capitalist economic system, has been underway, as you say, for 40 some years now. And they have been very successful in that endeavor, both in terms of achieving the kind of initial objectives of that opening, which was to gain access to capital and to technologies to help develop the domestic economy, develop the productive capacities of the Chinese economy. That has obviously been a successful endeavor. But it has also meant, as you say, that China has become intimately bound up with these global relationships. China, though, has, I think, done a reasonably good job of understanding the contradictory qualities of that relationship and has taken some steps. They haven't gone too far down this road yet, but they've taken some steps to sort of insulate themselves to a certain degree. They have been making moves towards having the domestic currency, the renminbi, be more internationally utilized, be more you know traded, not as a speculative commodity in the international monetary markets, but as a medium of international settlement of payments. They've also of course, been developing alternative financial structures, the Asian Development Bank that is centered in Asia, not as a subordinate of the Western, like the World Bank and the IMF and all that, but new instruments for financial arrangements, largely in conjunction with the Belt and Road Initiative. So they've taken some measures to kind of create at least incipient forms of autonomy. But there's no question that the Chinese and American economies and the Chinese and European economies are highly integrated with one another and certainly remain, I suppose one would say, vulnerable to developments on both sides. It should never be forgotten that China holds 
trillions of dollars in U.S. government debt. China is the biggest purchaser of treasury bonds and other kinds of debt obligations from the United States. Now, obviously, they can't just at one turn dump those back into the market. That would be devastating for China as well as for the United States. But it's an indicator of the degree to which these economic systems have become interdependent. And so, you know, the whole confrontational, aggressive posture that the United States has assumed towards China is in some ways self-defeating. What would happen to American consumers if there was a serious rupture in the relationship between China and the United States? What would happen to American corporations that have investments in China, that have great productive facilities in China? What would happen if China began to reduce its investment? And in fact, it has been reducing its investment because of this more aggressive posture by the American government, its direct investments in American business. Businesses. These are very, very complex relationships. And in many ways, to some extent at least, the problem is that American policy sometimes gets caught up in the rhetorical posturing of politicians from both parties kind of competing with one another to see who's toughest, who's going to take the hardest line towards China. And that unfortunately can find its manifestation in actual behavior, in actual policy formulation. The idea that the Biden administration, you know, supposedly this great fresh breath of liberal democratic policy, but the Biden administration is steadily positioning itself as more aggressive, more hostile towards China than even the sort of craziness of the Trump period. And that just, it's counterproductive. It's not in the best interests of the American people. It's not in the best interests of even of American business, really. And things like the Chamber of Commerce, organizations like that, and other spokesmen from within the business community are pretty critical often of these anti-China postures. But they're driven by the peculiarities of the American political system to a significant degree. And that only reinforces, once again, This contradiction within which the United States seems to have become enmeshed. Right. As Chairman Mao said, politics is in command. I mean, it's against the economic interests of American capitalists to go down this road. The deal with China has been quite good for American capital, and they're dependent on it. And yet the politics of the Cold War or major power conflict, that's in command. It is indeed. And of course, we know that the interests of you know what president eisenhower called the military industrial complex can be quite compelling the power of the military production corporations the aerospace industry all of that these are not forces to be discounted they have their own particular niche within the american economy but Not to go too theoretical on this, but the government, the bourgeois state, is supposed to balance the various interests of the different sectors of capital. It's not supposed to become subordinate to one particular wing of capital, such as the military and aerospace industries. But unfortunately, they have a perhaps disproportionate influence in Washington, both in Congress and within the executive branch. So it's a troubling time to say the least, in terms of America's relationship with China. And it's one which for the Chinese is quite challenging. And you can see that in the frustration that has been articulated recently by prominent Chinese diplomats, especially in that recent farcical meeting in Alaska, where, you know, Secretary of State Blinken tried to sort of wag his finger and lecture the Chinese once again about how they need to get with the program, meaning the American program. And the Chinese, you know, were finally sort of reached the point where they were like, what are you talking about? You know, you can't be serious about this anymore. This is not the way that sovereign states respect and deal with each other. But the American political mentality is so strongly shaped by these particular interests that it makes for a very challenging time for the Chinese as they're trying to navigate their way through this new era. Indeed. And the other irony is that in the first Cold War, the Cold War with the Soviet Union, the Soviets were 
you know, not integrated into the world economy. It was against the law to sell even one computer to the Soviet Union. And the Jackson Varnick Amendment in 1974 in the U.S. Congress made that official. That was the law of the land. People would go to jail if you gave the Soviet Union anything. The Soviet Union was the most sanctioned country in the world. It developed a self-reliant economy or an economy that was self-reliant within the zone of the socialist bloc, a second world economy, a second kind of globalization, so to speak. But in the case of China, having been fully integrated into the world economy and partly as a measure against the Soviet Union and the socialist bloc when it was first undertaken in 1978, 79, the tremendous irony, I mean, we've talked about irony in this series, but historical ironies are plentiful, or you might call it dialectics, the unity of opposites in the opposite within itself. It plays out in the case of U.S.-China relations. The U.S. integrated China into the world economy to help undo a communist-led government, the Soviet Union, and by so doing, allowed China to grow economically. And then China, having grown economically, while the U.S. taking all of its unipolar power and wasting it, squandering it by going to war after war after war, invading Afghanistan, invading Iraq, you know, bombing Libya, getting hunkered down in a war in Syria, this arrogance and hubris of imperialism, the dialectic comes roaring back and the same economy that was integrated as part of a U.S. anti-socialist bloc tactic is now strong enough that the U.S. feels, oh, we must destroy it. And so how will we destroy it? The same way we deal with every other issue by ramping up the military budget, by trying to have a full spectrum dominant strategy reliant first and foremost on the military. And meanwhile, China's priorities are things like the Belt and Road Initiative, not building military bases in 800 places in 130 countries, but emphasizing how to build investment and economic integration with other countries. And it's becoming more popular. Again, you would think in each and every case, the US is doing something that doesn't make sense. Doesn't even make sense from the point of view of imperialism. But imperialism or American imperialism under the domination of the Pentagon, under the domination of the military industrial complex, does these irrational things and is addicted to them because it's addicted to war. Anyway, Ken, in our last couple minutes, I actually want to talk and help our audience understand this difference, the difference between a US foreign policy, which is based on getting maximum profits everywhere where the U.S. corporations and banks set up shop and subjugating other countries to U.S. neo-colonial domination, or if they don't, they sanction them. And you counterpose that to what China's foreign policy when it comes to economic issues as the centerpiece. And the Belt and Road Initiative was actually incorporated into the Chinese constitution in 2017, meaning it's an inviolable principle right now of Chinese policy towards the rest of the world? Well, I think, yeah, that's a good place to sort of end our journey through the history of Chinese foreign policy, because the Belt and Road Initiative is, at this point, is really China's principal way of looking to the future, to the global future. You know, China is certainly obviously concerned about its relationship with the United States. It's deeply integrated into that American-dominated existing global system. But the Chinese also have a long historical perspective, and they're looking to the future, and they're pursuing policies with the objective of developing a global infrastructure of trade and communication, which will be not necessarily totally separate from, but will be an alternative to the existing order of things focused on you know, the North Atlantic capitalist core. And I think that that's really fundamental to to understanding what you know what what China is up to in the world. We were talking about irony, and China faces its own ironies in this because, of course, their choice to open up to the outside world, their choice to embrace the capitalist global system, 
was also one that was predicated on their objectives, their goals, their hopes to develop their economy, improve the material conditions in the country. And that has been very successful, but it has also embedded them in these contradictory situations. But I think that when we look at in terms of their relationship with you know America and the West, but I think that when we look at the Belt and Road Initiative and we look at China's efforts to invest in developing countries, in building infrastructure, in developing trading relationships. We need to see that in a very real world kind of way. This isn't a charity program. It's not a welfare program. It's not China going out and just trying to be a benevolent philanthropist in the world. These are policies that are designed to promote a world in which countries which today are marginalized, are less developed, have been exploited exploited historically by European and American colonialism and imperialism and are seeking to find their own paths in the world. China is assisting them, as I say, not out of some selfless motivation. It's in China's self-interest to develop these relationships, to develop this infrastructure. But it's an interest of mutual benefit. It's an interest in developing these other countries, aiding these other countries on their own path to their self-development in a way that's going to be exactly using the term you were just invoking, it's going to be a dialectically positive interrelationship. It's going to be one in which the investments of China, the development of these infrastructure networks, the expansion of these trading relationships, the enhancement of the capabilities of the recipient countries are all going to be mutually interactive. They're going to be mutually beneficial in ways that that will be beneficial to China. It, as I say, it's not disinterested, but it's not exploitative. You know, the United States, the Western powers, the anti-China forces all want to say, oh, China's just the new colonialists. Oh, China's just, you know, pursuing debt imperialism and all this. But when you get down and you look at these relationships and you look at what is happening and you look at how China has been either forgiving debt or, you know, extending payment periods in response to the COVID crisis, the global pandemic, you see that it's not a relationship of exploitation. It's not a relationship that's just purely philanthropic and beneficial, but it's one of mutual self-interest, mutual development between China and a whole host of countries, not only you know, developing countries like Myanmar or Bangladesh, but even you know, Italy, Serbia, countries in Europe that are trying to take advantage of this opportunity. So you know, I think that the situation right now is one in which you know, China finds itself in a number of complex relationships between itself and the West, between itself and the developing world, and it's trying to navigate a path that will allow it to, as Xi Jinping likes to say, to achieve its initial objectives of socialist development, but which will also allow it to, you know, to find a viable way of surviving in the world, even in the face of these aggressive postures by Western and especially American imperialism. I want to ask one final question. I mean, you're right. I mean, Italy now, which is part of the G7, a leading economy in Europe, is now a partner in the development of the Belt and Road. The Belt and Road has a land route and a maritime route, and it's the creation of these integrated trade routes, the building of infrastructure, massive infrastructure. In fact, the estimates are that Asia's infrastructure development needs are in the range of a trillion dollars, US dollars per year over the next 15 to 20 years. So we're talking about a massive sort of shift in the center of economic gravity continuing to shift away from the West, away from simply the capitalist industrialized West, where capitalism or advanced capitalism took root in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. It's moving East and it's moving South. And China is the locomotive for that through the Belt and Road Initiative. This was an initiative of Xi Jinping when he became the leader of the People's Republic of China in 2013. His leadership in particular, Ken, has been the target of U.S. anti-China propaganda. Xi Jinping is routinely referred to as an autocrat. He is now the bad guy. He's being talked about in a way far different than the Chinese leaders who preceded him, 
following the death of Mao Zedong in the mid 1970s. And of course, inside of China, Xi Jinping has been the champion of a very large scale anti corruption campaign. I think thousands, perhaps tens of thousands or even more officials have been replaced because they were involved in corruption, also associated with the development of a market economy or the integration of China into the world economy. Xi Jinping is emphasizing Marxism and Maoism and Chinese history and the legacy of the Chinese revolution. I mean, the emphasis is about China's historic struggle in the direction of socialism. The propaganda or the agitational emphasis of the Chinese government and its emphasis in education has shifted under Xi Jinping. From your point of view, and recognizing that the Belt and Road Initiative and China's more assertive position in world politics has taken place in these last eight years since Xi Jinping became the leader of China, how critically important is his leadership? And if he were to go, which eventually he will go, Will there be a continuity? Of course, we can see in China, as we can see in other countries, especially emerging and developing countries, that you know, when one leadership group leaves, the struggle, the transition is frequently a point of contention. Anyway, it's really a matter of the institutionalization of the power of the Communist Party and of institutions like Belt and Road. Let's just talk in our final minutes, your own projections as someone who has been in China who is a scholar on China, who is fluent in the language. What's your own projections? Well, I think that it's certainly true that Xi Jinping, the era of Xi Jinping since 2012, has seen the sort of re-emergence of the emphasis on Marxism, on socialism, on completing the original mission of the revolution. It has seen China adopt a more, what I like to call a kind of no-nonsense policy in its relationship, particularly with the United States. That period that we talked about at the beginning today of kind of keeping a low profile, emphasizing the peaceful rise, emphasizing these, you know, we're not going to rock the boat kinds of positions, that has come to an end. And China has achieved a sufficient degree of success in its reform programs, in its economic development. They feel stronger, they feel confident, and they feel that, pardon my French here, but you know, they don't have to take a lot of crap from the West anymore. And I think that that's been a clear change and a clear transition. But I don't think that that reflects any kind of a rupture in terms of the Chinese project. I think that Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, who kept that sort of low profile approach, did so in a very self-conscious way. That had been, after all, Deng Xiaoping's advice was to sort of don't push it, don't show off, you know. But that age has passed. The necessity for that posture has passed. We Chinese are the people who uphold justice and are not intimidated by threats of force. As a nation, we have a strong sense of pride and confidence. We have never bullied, oppressed, or subjugated the people of any other country. And we never will. By the same token, we will never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress, or subjugate anyone who would attempt to do so will find themselves on a collision course with a great wall of steel forged by over 1.4 billion Chinese people.
One of the things that I think has driven the intensification of American hostility towards China, the hostility of the American political and media elites, has been that Xi Jinping has been so much more overtly and avowedly and recognizably a Marxist. It's as if, you know, for 20 or 30 years, the Americans had been telling themselves, oh, China will become just like us. They're going to take the capitalist road. They're going to become, they're going to reform their economy and all this. And then along comes Xi Jinping and suddenly they're shocked and they're like, holy cow, this guy's actually a communist. Marxism is the fundamental guiding ideology upon which our party and country are founded. It is the very soul of our party and the banner which it strives. We have thus been able to keep adapting Marxism to the Chinese context and the needs of our times, and to guide the Chinese people in advancing our great social revolution. My sense is that Xi Jinping is simply the latest expression, the newest expression of this, but that the social forces that he represents, the nature of the Communist Party, the leadership role that the Communist Party plays in the country, that's a fixture. That's going to be continuous. I think, as you say, I mean, he's not going to be around forever. He may do a third term. Who knows? The constitutional revisions that were made allow for that, and it may be that they feel that that personal continuity is critical at this very, very difficult period for China. That's up to the Chinese. That's something about which, you know, I think it's not incumbent upon us to tell the Chinese what to do. But at some point, Xi Jinping will fade from the scene and other leaders will emerge. And I suspect that they will continue to try to seek the best ways for China to move forward, both with its project of trying to build socialism at home and with its role in the wider world. I expect that there will be twists and turns along the way. And of course, it is incumbent upon those of us who support China, who encourage China, who believe in socialism and building a better world more broadly to be critical of China when they make missteps and to be supportive of them when you know we see them doing what we see as the right thing. But I think that I don't envision a post-Xi Jinping transformation as you know, some sort of major shift. History may prove that that's an erroneous assessment, but I think that Xi Jinping is simply the current stronger, more outspoken version of the leadership which has been guiding the party and China for the last 40 years. That was the voice of Dr. Ken Hammond. He is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University, founding director of the Confucius Institute at the New Mexico State University, and activist with Pivot to Peace. This concludes our multi-part series in the Socialist Program on the history of China's foreign policy starting in 1949 when the government of China led by the Communist Party took power after a 27 year long civil war. China has reshaped global politics and we believe it will continue to do so. We look forward to continuing our presentation, our analysis, our assessment on China and China's place in the world. And of course, as Dr. Hammond has recommended. We also organize for peace and against the U.S. war drive that right now continues with intensity to target the People's Republic of China, the Chinese people, and the collateral damage to that war drive is Chinese Americans and Asian Americans who are the victims right here at home of a growing wave of hate crimes and racism. So stay with the socialist program if you support our work Go to patreon.com forward slash the socialist program and subscribe to the show. You've been listening to the socialist program with Brian Becker, where we bring you news and views about the world for those who want to change it. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We can only continue our work bringing you high-quality news, analysis, and history with the support of our listeners. Connect with us and become a patron at patreon.com slash the socialist program and receive an invitation to participate in an exclusive monthly seminar with Brian Becker.